Thank you for coming to Then Radio. Please like, subscribe, or click the link below to join our Patreon. Thanks again. This is Scotland Yard. For the first time, Scotland Yard opens its secret files to bring you the authentic, true stories of some of its most celebrated cases. These are accurate records drawn from these files by special permission of Sir Harold Scott, Commissioner of Scotland Yard. They're true in every respect, except for the names of the participants, which, for obvious reasons, have been changed. The research has been done by Mr. Percy Hoskins, chief crime reporter for the London Daily Express. And the stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper. New Scotland Yard, the London headquarters of the Metropolitan Police, is situate near the embankment on Whitehall, hard by 10 Downing Street and almost in the shadow of Big Ben. Here also is the headquarters of the CID, the Criminal Investigation Department, the body of men whose exploits for more than 100 years have made the name Scotland Yard synonymous with the brilliant detection of crime and unrelenting pursuit of the criminal, and the presentation of the painstakingly acquired evidence that assures his eventual punishment. On the lower ground floor of New Scotland Yard is the famous Black Museum, where whose present custodian is Chief Superintendent James Davidson, a Scotland Yard veteran. Behind this door... Good afternoon. This Black Museum of ours is rather unique. Everything in it was at one time connected with the successful solution of a crime or was closely involved in the crime itself. We possess an imposing collection of lethal weapons here, each carefully docketed to indicate its origin. Here are half-empty bottles of almost every poison known to man, together with a statement of particulars concerning its use. Here are the bloodstained garments on which the solution of a crime of violence depended. Among the Black Museum's relics are disguises used by famous criminals, death masks of notorious men and women whose ends Scotland Yard encompassed, and a great many other more gruesome mementos of man's inhumanity to man. Among the exhibits are others seemingly incongruous objects that in their time served well in the undoing of desperate criminals. Such an exhibit is this one, the fragments of a set of teacups. This collection of shards was the first step in the solution of a frightful crime which occurred during the Blitz of July 1940. Yes, sir? Would you please bring me file number 302MR651, Constable? Uh, 302MR651, sir? Yes, sir. One, sir. In July 1940, the Battle of Britain was at its height. The Luftwaffe hits us at all hours, and from advanced defense fields of the RAF, the weary spitfires rose day and night to do battle. Thousands of British people died in Britain as a result of enemy action. But in the midst of the very present war, murder went on as usual. Chief Superintendent Peter Carruth received a telephone call at Scotland Yard on the morning of the 3rd of July, a Wednesday. Now 302MR651, sir. Thank you. The call was from Chief Constable at Matfield, a Kentish village near Tunbridge. The Chief Constable reported the finding of the bodies of three women shot to death and requested the assistance of the CID. The services of Scotland Yard are available to the provincial police at all times if requested. The Home Office, assuming all expenses, if the request is made within 24 hours of the discovery of the crime, at their own expense, if we're called in after that. Chief Superintendent Carruth was gratified that the request came at the very beginning of the case, and he drove to Matfield at once with a medical examiner from the Home Office and Detective Sergeant Small, also Scotland Yard. They were met at the scene of the crime by Matfield Chief Constable Thomas Bennett. 
It's good of you to come so quickly, all of you. It's all quite beyond us here, sir. What with the blitz and all? I'm sure. I had a bad time. Having it, sir. Yes, I've no doubt. Those out with the bullet. Spitfires. Jerry must be up again. Well, here's what happened. In the house, there's Miss Evans, the servant. Uh, is she dead? Two holes in her head. Yes. Play, place all ransacked. All tore up. Where are the others? Mrs. Ames and her daughter Jessica's lying down there in the orchard. Also shot. Yes, I, I see. Where do you want to start, sir? Um, a house, I think, first. Yes. Uh, come in, then, sir. Uh, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. They've lived here in Matfield a long time, have they, Dennis? And Miss Evans, the servant, has always lived here. Mrs. Ames and her daughter moved here a year ago. Mrs. Ames a widow? No. Estranged from her husband, though they're quite friendly. He lives at Piddington. Oh, yes, I know. I've been there. Owns a farm. Does he know about this? My station sergeant telephoned him this morning, sir. He was in London, but he'll be home this evening. Shall I uh, go first, sir? She's... Lying right by the door, and you might trip over her. By all means. You might arrive there. Uh, these oh, is the not gentleman not from Scotland Yard, Constable. Yes, sir. Uh, this is her. Miss Margaret Evans, sir. Age 61. Servant. Living in. Ah. Oh. See what you can find out, Bernard. Right, you are. Small, get started looking for fingerprints. Yes, sir. The place has really been ransacked, hasn't it? Mm -hmm. What's missing? Haven't checked yet, sir. Haven't touched anything. Good. Well, not much chance of finding out if anything is gone, though. Everybody that lived here is dead. I'd like to see the others. Right, sir. If you'll come with me. Oh, uh, what's that over there? Mm -hmm. Tea things? Yes, sir. Looks as if she dropped the tray when she saw the murderer. Have a look at them, too, Small. All right, sir. Uh, down this part, sir. The orchard, uh, that's where they are. Mrs. Ames? And her daughter, Jessica. Mm. They have many visitors? Very few, sir. And the place is back from the road, isn't a bit by the roses. Hard to tell they do have. Here she is. This is the daughter, I suppose. Right, sir. Her mother's over there, off the path. Daughter was running away toward the house. Mother was facing the other way. Shot in the back, too. Aye, Found anything here in the grass? Cartridge cases, anything? Well, no, sir. Uh, oh, we, we did find this glove, though, sir. Uh, sorry, I had it in my pocket. Almost forgot it. Oh, woman's glove. Size six, I'd say. Hogskin. Shop sells thousands a week. Left hand. Whose is it? Isn't Mrs. Ames, sir, too small? Or Miss Jessica's either. Uh, too large, I'd say, wouldn't you? Yeah. Yes, I think so. Uh, maybe the murderer, sir. We'll see. All you found? All so far, sir. Mm. Where was the glove? Oh, over there, sir. I, I marked the spot with those uh, two sticks. Uh-huh. Alongside the mother's body. Yes, sir. Well, as soon as Bernard's examined the bodies, I think you'd better have all this grass scythed down and see if you can find anything else. Cartridge case or anything. Uh, right, sir. Shall we walk back to the house? Yes, sir. Good hunting, lad. Beg your pardon? Walk the fighter chap up there. Oh, oh, oh. Hope he shoots some Jerry's bloody ears off. He probably will. I've got a son in the raft. Flight sergeant of the Coastal Command. Good man. Nineteen years old. When I was nineteen, I was a farm man for good old Uncle Tom Cobbley. Hey, I wonder if they found anything yet in there, sir. We'll see. Ah, oh, here's Bernard. Anything yet? Well, I, uh, I want to see the other bodies first. Discovered a little so far. Uh, where are the, um... Uh... Down the path back there, sir. We've touched nothing. Except this glove. Oh, is this one of theirs? Wrong size. All right. Uh, you can remove the bodies as soon as I finish, Chief Constable. Yes, sir. I'll have the van here at once. Will you see to it, please? Yes, sir. What are you doing, Small... I'm trying to fit these cups together, sir. Well, what about fingerprints? I wanted you... Oh, I found a good many, sir. They all checked with hers. Oh, how did you know they were hers? Oh, I took hers. I wish live people's were as easy to take. No others? 
Well, I'm not sure yet, sir. As soon as I get the others down there, I'll make a very thorough check. These cups and saucers. She dropped them when she saw the murderer, probably. Uh, quite. But why should there be four cups, sir? Four? One for the mother, one for the daughter, one for the maid, for her. Miss Evans was more a companion than a servant, sir. Here in Matfield, we. Ah, uh, ah, uh, yes. And one for the murderer. I then must have known the murderer. People don't usually offer a cup of tea to a perfect stranger. You could make up a list of their friends, Chief Constable, uh, and then... Very few friends, sir. Kind of standoffish like they was, and... But the parson, the grocer, postmistress, not any real close friend, so to speak. Make up a list and check where they all were yesterday. Yes, sir. What about this estranged husband of Mrs. Ames? Would he have a motive? Oh, I don't think so, sir. He used to come visit her, I know, but... Oh, he did, eh? And he's in London now, you said. I went down yesterday morning, they said, sir. Where does he live, do you say? Piddington, sir, near Oxford. Uh, you take over, Sergeant Small, you and Mr. Bernard. I'll call you from Piddington. Piddington, sir? Do you think... I that... think I'd like to know whether our friendly ex-husband was really in London yesterday or elsewhere. <laughs> Piddington, that afternoon, 70 miles away from Matfield, Jem Davies, the man of all work, explained to Chief Superintendent Carruth that John Ames had not yet returned from London. Miss Viola Masterson, the manager of the Ames farm, however, was at home, recovering from an accident. Carruth spoke to her in her sitting room. Her left arm was in bandages, and she was obviously in slight pain. Carruth sympathized with her. I'm so sorry to disturb you, Miss Masterson. It's quite all right. I'll be up and about in a day or so. It pains a little, though, now. I suppose you've heard about the former Mrs. Ames and her daughter. I'm so dreadfully sorry. I knew them slightly, you know. Oh, did you? I'd have gone over to Matfield if I hadn't been so stupid as to fall off my bicycle and injure my arm. I'm afraid I'm not a very good cyclist. Oh, do you have any clues as to the... the... Murderer? And very few at the moment. Very few, I'm afraid. Oh, what a pity. Miss Graves went to London yesterday. Hmm? Yes. He was probably in London while his former wife and daughter were murdered. He often stops in to see them on his way. If he'd stopped there yesterday, he might have prevented it. Yes, yes. I suppose he can account for his movements yesterday. I'm quite sure he can, Superintendent. I expect him at any moment. You were here at the farm all day. I rode about the farm all day on my bicycle until I had the accident. Ah. I'm sure Jemmy Davis can confirm that. And the bicycle is still where I left it, where I fell off, unless Jemmy's brought it back. I see. Uh, by the way, have you ever seen this glove before? Oh, let me see it. No, I'm afraid not. Did it belong to... We're not quite sure. Well, it's not mine. But it's too big for me, I'm sure, Superintendent. You've never seen it before? Never. Thank you, Miss Masterson. Uh, is that all you wanted? Uh, aren't you going to wait for Mr. Ames? Oh, I don't like to disturb you, Miss Masterson. I'll wait out there with Jemmy. It is Jemmy, isn't it? Uh, by all means, talk to Jemmy. I'm sure he'll confirm everything I've said. Good day, Miss Masterson. You know where to find Jemmy. <laughs> he was sitting alongside the stable door cleaning a shotgun when I last saw him. Jemmy Davis was a simple-minded man. He didn't realize that he was talking much too freely to the friendly Scotland Yard man. Well, it'd, it'd be a terrible thing, I expect, but I don't shed no tears for him. I didn't like her nor her daughter neither. Hated them? It'd be none of my business, sir. But now Mr. Ames, uh, he'd be a real fine man. And she... He, well, uh, she treated him awful bad. How? Dug in the manger. Kicks him out, she does. And then when he finally meets a woman he loves, and that woman loving him, she won't give him no divorce. You seem to know a lot about Mr. Ames' affairs, Jemmy. Yeah. Him and me, we be just like that. I do anything for that man. Her too, for that matter. Who? Miss Masterson. There. 
Well, that's pretty clean, ain't it? Let's see. Hmm. Clean as I'd ever want a gun to be. <laughs> Had it for years. Old-fashioned, like me. <laughs> ah, but she'd be a good shotgun. He uses it all the time for rabbits. Mr. Ames? Well, he buys his own shells, too. Hmm. Uh, Miss Masterson, she's scared of it. Tried to teach her how to shoot it. But she was scared. <laughs> well, you couldn't kill a person with this here gun, I says to her. Not unless you got up real close. Funny thing, though. She shot a rabbit with it yesterday. <laughs> you know, it made her so sick at her stomach when she shot the poor little fella. Never again, she says to me. <laughs> Did you see the rabbit, Jemmy? <laughs> well, what were left of it, she were too close. Well, not worth bringing back to cook. <laughs> you know, I think that's why she fell off her bicycle thinking about it. Where did she fall? Well, she was in the meadow yonder. The wheel slipped on the grass. Jemmy... Did you ever see this glove before? Huh? No, sir. Well, can't say as how I have. Sure? No, sir. Whose is it? I found it. Well, finders, keepers. Uh, that's what they say. So you don't think Mr. Ames and Miss Masterson will be upset by Mrs. Ames' death? Lord bless you, no, sir. Now they can get married. Well, that dog in the manger wife of his. Well, he must have been the last one to see her alive. Oh? How's that? When he stopped us here on the way to London yesterday. Why, I thought you was going to wait for him to come back, sir. Chief Superintendent Carew hurried to the local police station where he put through a trunk telephone call to Matfield. Detective Sergeant Small, the Scotland Yard man, answered the telephone at the murder house. Small here. Small, I want you to check at once on something. Yes, sir. I want you to make the most diligent inquiries. Get that chief constable there to inquire of every person in Matfield, if necessary, at once, to discover if this man Ames was seen in Matfield yesterday. You got that? He was seen, sir. He was? The postman, sir. We've been making inquiries all over the village of Mrs. Ames' known friends, and we've come across several curious things, sir. Well? Well, the, the postman observed Mr. Ames walking toward this house yesterday afternoon. He's sure? He positively identified him, sir. Known him for years. Spoke to him, called him by name, and Ames replied. What else? He was carrying a shotgun, sir. Oh. I discovered here that he intended to visit them, but the gun... Well, looks as if he's our man, doesn't it? What else did you discover? Well, there's a bicycle belonging to Mrs. Ames is missing. Oh, and the porter at the railway station reports a strange woman carrying a parcel arrived in town yesterday, but so far we have been unable to trace her. Now, the local police have picked up a deserter from an army camp near here. He's being questioned now. Uh. And a lorry driver for the gas company at Oxford reports picking up a woman on the highway near here yesterday afternoon. She was wearing one glove. Oh? Now, he thinks her bare hand was scratched and bleeding. Yes? She explained she'd fallen off her bicycle and was trying to catch a train. He took it to the railway station. And then... Oh, what did you say, sir? I didn't say anything. Oh, I was speaking to Dr. Bernard, sir. I'll put him on. He wants to speak to you. Uh, thank you. You there, Carruth? Yes, Bernard. I've discovered why you didn't find any spent cartridges, Superintendent. Yes? The women were killed with a shotgun. Probably a 410 shotgun. Yes, yes, sir. The uh, murderer had to pick the discharged shells out of the breech of the gun by hand. Yes, but... It... And probably carried them away and disposed of them elsewhere. Did you recover any of the shots from the bodies? Yes, quite small pellets. Uh, bird shot. Mark it in evidence and hold it for me. I think those little lead pellets are going to hang someone, Bernard. <laughs> Back at the Piddington farm, Chief Inspector Carew found that Ames had returned in his absence. Jemmy, the garrulous man of all work, was just leaving. He was going to fetch Miss Masterson's abandoned bicycle, he Why said. Why is he going out to fetch Miss Masterson's bicycle, sir? Look here, Jemmy. Would you like a half a crown? What for? That rabbit Miss Masterson shot. Is it near where she left the bicycle? Oh, fur long or two, sir. Fetch it back for me. What for, sir? Well, he's been fit to eat. She were too close. Oh. I've a fancy to see how that gun of yours works, Jim. Oh, 
That old gun of mine, uh, she be a very good gun, sir. Show me. Here. Well. Good man. Now, is Mr. Ames in the house? All right, sir. Now, I'll, I'll fetch the rabbit and show you. But the poor thing will be all full of bird shot, sir. That'll be all right, Jimmy. I'm very interested in birds. Yes? I'm Chief Superintendent Carruth of Scotland Yard. You're John Ames, hmm? Yes. Now, you're the gentleman who was here this afternoon. Yes. May I come in? Do. You've come about the murder of my wife and daughter? Yes. I'm sorry, Mr. Carruth, you said? Yes. I cannot pretend any great grief, although I am shocked at the tragic. May I sit down? I, um, I spoke to Miss Masterson, your manager, this afternoon. She said you were here. Perhaps if Miss Masterson is strong enough... Here I am. Oh, sit down, my dear. Please, sit down. Don't hurt my hand, John. I'm all right. Well, sir? Am I correct in assuming that, uh, with the death of Mr. Ames and strange wife, you and he... Uh... We can be married, yes. Mr. Ames? That's true. My wife has consistently refused to give me a divorce. Although we were on fairly good terms... She and I weren't. I'm glad she's dead. Violet, And that horrid daughter of hers, too. Now we're rid of them once and for all. Violet. Do you share Miss Masterson's views, Mr. Ames? I'm afraid... Perhaps he's not as ferocious as I am, but he shares my views all right. Don't you, John? Uh... Yes. And what were you doing with a shotgun on the way to our home yesterday, Mr. Ames? John, you didn't. You didn't. Mr. Ames. You, you didn't tell me. Oh, John. John, now you've spoiled everything. Your wife and your daughter were murdered with a shotgun, Mr. Ames. I didn't do he it. He didn't, he didn't, I say. What gauge is your shotgun, Mr. Ames? This is absurd, Mr. Ames. Yes, of Why do you... Why do you think it's absurd? My dear sir, my gun, which incidentally is an American-made Remington over and under 12 gauge, has been broken for four weeks. You see? Broken? The sear spring is broken. It's quite impossible to fire the gun. You can examine the gun at your leisure at Henny McGovern's The Gunsmiths on High Horburn in London, where I took it yesterday. We'll check that. Why did you visit your wife yesterday, carrying your broken gun? I dropped off in Matfield on my way to London to have the gun repaired. I begged her again to give me a divorce. She refused? She refused again. <laughs> for the last time. And we're going to be married now at last. Don't expect us to weep for her. Whoever killed her should be given a medal. Viola. Oh, stop it. You're just as glad as I am. Aren't you? Excuse me. The telephone. Yes? Yes, he's here. One moment. It's for you, Mr. Carew. Thank you. Chief Superintendent Carruth here. Small here, sir. We found Mrs. Ames' missing bicycle. Oh. Yes, sir. We discovered it in a ditch close to the place where the lorry driver picked up the woman with one glove. Oh, good. And there are numerous fingerprints on the handlebar, sir, but of the right hand only. Most interesting. And the strange woman whom the railway reporter observed was uh, carrying a parcel, you remember? Yes, yes, of course. Well, it was a, a long parcel about the length of a gun, he says, wrapped in brown paper. I see. Have you taken the things you spoke about? Things, sir? Yes. Oh, oh the, the fingerprints on the bicycle? Yes, quite. Yes, sir, I've taken them. How soon could I see them and the people you spoke of? Up there, sir? Yes. Well, there's an up train that we can have stop at Pittington, leaving here in half an hour, sir. I think you'd better come, then, if you can find the others you mentioned. I'll meet you at the Pittington station. Right, sir. Goodbye. I'm very sorry. Could I ask? You have uncovered some other evidence, sir? You're not going to arrest John, then? He won't be charged with murder? I think I can almost assure you that you will not be charged with murder, Mr. Ames. I'm sorry, I, I, I must go and meet my colleagues. This is quite important. Will you be coming back? I probably shall. I, I shall want 
to be able to assure Mr. Ames that he will not be held. Oh, Joe. Right. <laughs> Is the Scotland Yard man still here, Mr. Ames? Why, uh, I'm here, Jenny. Well, I, I fetch you the dead rabbit, sir, with your half crown's worth of birdshot. <laughs> station two hours later. Detective Sergeant Small, Chief Constable Bennett, the lorry driver who had picked up the woman with the bloody hand and the one glove, and the railway porter who had observed the woman carrying the brown paper parcel the size of a gun. Leaving Chief Constable Bennett at the station to make a telephone call, the party proceeded to the Ames Farm. Good evening, Mr. Carew. May we come in, please? Why, this is quite a delegation. May we come in, please? Why, I suppose... <coughs> Do come in, although... Thank you. Where's Miss Masterson? Viola? Yes, dear. Why, what... Uh, Miss Masterson, do you recognize any of these people? Why? Why, no, of course not. Patterson, <laughs> do you recognize this woman? Hey. She's the lady in blue slacks I picked up my lorry on the road in Matfield yesterday. The lady that said she fell off a bike. Her hand was all bloody and she had one glove on. Like this one? Yes, sir. Exactly like that. O'Connor. Yes, sir? Have you ever seen this lady before? Oh, I've seen her yesterday, sir. Getting off the 1206 train that passes through Piddington before it gets to Batfield. She was wearing blue slacks and carried a brown paper parcel about the size of a gun, sir. Now, look here. What's the meaning of all this? Come in. Well, Bennett. Just like you thought, sir. I telephoned the doctor who treated Miss Masterson, and he informs me that he treated her left hand for multiple lacerations, removing the particles of road gravel and stains of tarvia from the palm. Miss Masterson... There is no gravel or tarvia at the meadow. Thank you. Mr. Ames, I'm extremely mm. sorry for you. John, now we won't get married. Viola Masterson, John. I arrest you on the charge of willful I murder. I wanted to get married and she stood in our And I must John. warn you that anything I... you say will be taken down and may be used in evidence against you. John, what have I done? The evidence adduced by Chief Superintendent Carew, the identifications by the lorry driver and the railway porter, the shotgun pellets which proved identical with those Miss Masterson had fired into the unfortunate rabbit, the glove which was identified as hers by the store which had sold it to her, the gravel from the road in her wounded hand, and the motive, which was all too plain, proved sufficient evidence to convict Viola Masterson of the murders of Mrs. Ames and her daughter and of the servant, Margaret Evans, who provided the first clue, the fourth cup. Miss Masterson had determined to murder the servant to eliminate the only witness to the murder of the others. In a trial marked with frequent air raid alarms caused by an enemy whose depredations could not prevent murder from going on as usual. She was found criminally insane and is now imprisoned in the asylum at Broadmoor. John Ames was tried as an accomplice but acquitted. He joined the 1st Battalion of the Baps and was reported missing in action in the Italian campaign. Constable, you may turn the file 302-MR-651, the Blitz murder case, to the records room. Good afternoon. (laughs) 
You've just heard the first case in the series Whitehall 1212, drawn from the official files of Scotland Yard by permission of Commissioner Sir Harold Scott. All names were changed in this story for obvious reasons, but everything else is true. It occurred. Whitehall 1212 is written and directed for radio by Willis Cooper. Next, listen for Tales of the Texas Rangers on NBC. Whitehall, one, two, one, two, quickly. This is Scotland Yard. For the first time, Scotland Yard opens its secret files to bring you the authentic, true stories of some of its most baffling cases. These accurate records are drawn from the Scotland Yard files by special permission of Commissioner Sir Harold Scott. They're true in every respect except for the names of the participants, which, for obvious reasons, have been changed. The research has been done by Mr. Percy Hoskins, chief crime reporter for the London Daily Express, and the stories for radio are written and directed by Mr. Willis Cooper. Here are the participants in case number 498MR381. Neville Hutchins, shopkeeper. Yes, I saw the man. Rafe Dibble, taxi driver. I drove him to Charing Cross. Arthur Cunningham, the estate agent. I never saw the woman before. Mrs. Veronica Fanshawe, housewife. The woman was a most unsatisfactory housekeeper. Mrs. Leonie Fournier, housekeeper. Inspector Harold Lowe of Scotland Yard. One of these persons is a murderer. Which one do you suspect? Incidentally, if you're looking for what the Americans call cops and robbers with the goods and the bad shooting it out, or... If you expect lean, pipe-smoking men in fore-and-aft hats saying, follow that cab, you may be disappointed. The job of a policeman, says Commander Rawlings of the Yard, is 95% perspiration, 3% inspiration, and 2% luck. But we have our moments. We have our moments. Now, having concluded my little sermon for today, and if you're still interested, come along with me. This is Scotland Yard's Black Museum. I'd like you to meet Chief Superintendent John Davidson, the caretaker. Yes? It's Inspector Lowe, sir, and a friend. Maybe come in. Oh, by all means. Come along. Chief Superintendent William Davidson. Well, how do you do? I expect Lowe has told you all about this place, has he not? Well, uh, frankly, no, sir. I yes, was hoping... Quite... Well, these cases you see around the walls contain articles of all sorts which were important to us in the solution of crimes. On the other room, there are our murder weapons. Now, here are bits of evidence, each of which has played its part in the conviction of a criminal. Here's a blood-stained jacket and a plaster cast of a dead man's hand. Well, what did you wish especially to see, Lowe? Case number 498MR381, sir, if you... Oh, the Fournier case. Right, sir. Oh, here in this corner. Come along. That's a trunk, rather large, old-fashioned black trunk with a heavy lid. It served its purpose admirably. Telephone call received by Inspector Harold Lowe at Scotland Yard, 2.55 p.m., Monday, 10th May, 1948. Inspector Lowe speaking. This is Bannerman in charge of the left luggage room at Charing Cross Station, sir. Yes? We've come across something queer here, sir. Something that I'm afraid wants investigating. What seems to be wrong, Bannerman? I think you ought to see it, sir, really. Well, what is it, it's man? It's a left luggage ticket, sir, that was left by one of the station boot, 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 boot blacks. He found a left it. luggage ticket? Yes, sir. Well, uh, don't you think... The ticket is for a large, heavy black trunk, which was left here several days ago, sir. Oh, well, that does alter matters, doesn't it? I'm afraid so, sir. Well, I'll be right over. Bannerman, is it? <laughs> Uh, you, Bannerman? Yes. Uh, Detective Inspector Lowe, you spoke to me on the telephone. Oh, yes, sir. Will you just step inside, sir? I'll be away for a few minutes, George. Well, hurry back. Will you come with me, sir? 
I'll have the ticket in my desk, sir. <clears throat> Here, sir. Oh. Well, what's wrong with it? It was found on the up platform by one of the boot blacks a few minutes after I'd issued it, sir. Well, the owner lost it. It's exactly the way it was found, sir. All crumpled up in a ball. Yeah. Yes, I see what you mean. A man could lose a ticket, sir, but he wouldn't throw it away just a few moments after he got it, sir. Do you remember the man? Oh, I don't remember him at all, sir. I don't remember if it was a man. What? It might have been a woman, sir. We handle so many people here. Well, is the trunk still here? You said it's for a trunk, didn't you? Yes, sir. It's right over in that bay, sir. Well, let's have a look at it, please. Follow me. There, sir. The black one. You know, the number's check. Ah. <clears throat> uh, it's, it's very heavy, sir. Let me give you an hand. Yeah. yeah. The lock doesn't look very strong. Well, I'll have it open. Hmm. Full of cloth. Cloth isn't that heavy. There's something else in here. Take the end of this piece. <gasps> the trunk and its contents were removed at once to Scotland Yard for examination. The contents were taken to the pathological laboratory. Detective Sergeant Sean Flannery and I examined the trunk itself. It seems to be very old. It's in good condition, though. Uh, they don't make goods like this nowadays. Uh, we shall have to have it tested for dabs, of course. Uh, fingerprints. We'll find millions of them, sir. Man of the left, luggage rooms, our own people. The late occupant. Uh, and from the age of it, we're likely to find Oliver Cromwell's. Half a talk. What's this? What? I'm afraid our French should have removed that. What? It's a label. Here, give us the magnifying glass, will you? Uh, answer it, will you, old boy? All right. Larry here. Oh, all oh, right. Well, send me down here at once, please. What is it? Report from the laboratory. They're sending it down. Report from the Pathological Laboratory, Scotland Yard, delivered to Inspector Lowe, Tuesday, 11th May, 1948. Reference 498-MR381. The body found in the trunk is that of a Caucasian female about 40 years of age. Black hair and eyes, perfect teeth, height 5 feet 1 inch, weight 104 pounds when alive. Bruise on back of head, not cause of death. Oh. Bruises and superficial abrasions caused by fingernails on neck. Choked, eh? Well, preliminary examination indicates death caused by manual strangulation. Uh. Outer garments missing. Body clad in undervest bearing laundry mark 316 ADFA. Black nylon stockings, new, size six and a half. Body wrapped in cotton duster, slightly stained with blood, same type, type OA as that found on neck. Body removed to mortuary. Please advise disposition of other articles. See schedule A attached. Huh. Pathology laboratory, please. Uh, excuse me, Inspector. Yes, Flannery. Hold it a sec, please. Inspector Lowe here. What is it, John? I finally made out the printing on that label. And? Neville Hutchins, second-hand articles, Brixton. Nip off and see the fellow. Does he remember the man who bought it and all that, you know? Best go at once. All right, sir. Hello? Hello? I'm sorry. Who is it? Gwyn? Look, Gwyn, suppose you take the fingerprints of the lady from the trunk and pass them onto the print file at once. Perhaps we can discover who she was. Oh, you have done that. Good, good. She might have been one of our former customers. After all, really nice girls aren't often found in trunks, are they? Thanks, Gwyn. Ask them to let me know, will you? Thanks. Oh, and get photographs of those laundry marks checked with our list, too, will you? You have done so. Well, I shall buy you a beer one of these days, Gwyn. Over and out. Ah, three irons turning a dull red in the fire. Fingerprints, label, laundry mark. Not bad, Inspector Lowe. Not too bad at all. Conversation between Detective Sergeant Sean Flannery and shopkeeper Neville Hutchins at the latter's shop in Brixton. I'm Detective Sergeant Flannery of Scotland Yard, Mr. Hutchins. Well, what do you want? You carry second-hand luggage in stock, sir? Well, what about you? Trunks, perhaps? If you're looking for stolen goods, I don't know anything about any. Anyway, I haven't got any trunks. I sold the last one I had something more than a week ago. Indeed. In bloody deed. Uh, so what? The ancient black leather one? Well, how do you know? Well, we found it. You, where? I should say that's none of your business at present. That's the one they found the body in at Charing Cross? How do you know? Well, I read the papers. Percy Hoskins had half a column about it in today's Express. Ah, uh, that's the one. Well, how do you know? It's your label. No. When did he sell it? 
Oh, let me look. Yeah, here we are, here we are. May the second. You got the buyer's name? Now, this ain't Seltridge's, mate. You remember what he looked like? Well, he was tall uh, and thin. Complexion? Dark hair, dark eyes. Dressed? Yeah, I don't remember that. What, did he do it, you think? Would you recognize him again? Well, of course I would. If he walked in here a year from today, tall, thin, dark. Well, we may ask you to identify him. Thank you. You're, of course, to say nothing whatever of this call. Now, oh, look here, Mr. Ray. If you do, we shall be very seriously annoyed with you, Hutchins. I've got nothing to conceal. I'm an honest man. And if your tall, thin, dark man hears of it, you might just find yourself inside a trunk one day. Yeah. Just mind your eye, Mr. Hutchins. <laughs> I shall be seeing you again. Yeah, yeah. Good day, sir. Report of the Fingerprint Division, Scotland Yard, to Inspector Lowe. Uh, no record at all, sir, of the prints. None at all, eh? Uh, none whatever, sir. Uh, shall we continue our search? Interpol, the provincial police, the American FBI? No, not until I ask you. That'll do for the present, thank you. The laundry marks on the dead woman's clothing were identified by a laundry in Shepherd's Bush as having been issued to a family named Fanshawe. Further inquiry disclosed the fact that Mrs. Veronica Fanshawe, the only woman member of the family, was alive and well. She was summoned to Scotland Yard by Inspector Lowe. These are your laundry marks, then? Oh, no doubt about it. But the clothing's not mine. That I'm quite certain of. Yes, I'm sure they wouldn't fit you. They're very small. They're very cheap, obviously. Vulgar. I should never wear things like those. Have you any idea how your laundry mark could... Oh, have no idea. Unless... Unless what, madam? We had a cook housekeeper a short time ago. She was one of those tiny women. And where is she? What was her name? Her name is Leonie Fournia. She's French. Is she still in your employ, Mrs. Fanshawe? She is not. I discharged her more than a week ago. I don't know where she is. Why did you discharge her? I did not approve of her. She'd been divorced and, well, you know, these French women. Besides, she was a most unsatisfactory housekeeper. I see. You disliked her a great deal. I, I disapproved of her. Will you come with me a moment, please, Mrs. Fanshawe? Well, whatever for. Will you come with me, please? Where are we going? If you'll follow me, please. What is this place? This table here, if you please. <coughs> is this awful smell? This is our mortuary, Mrs. Fanshawe. Did you ever see this woman before? <coughs> it's, it's Leone. Your former housekeeper? <coughs> I always knew she'd come to this. Thank you, Mrs. Fanshawe. Other visitors to Inspector Lowe's office, Scotland Yard, between 12th May and 15th May, 1948. Bus conductor Simon Norwich of Houndsditch. I was reading in the paper, sir, about this here black trunk the bloke murdered the woman in. All right, I did, sir. Well, see, you know, there was a fellow got on my bus at Brixton the afternoon about the 4th of the month. He had a large black trunk with him. Ah? Uh -huh. You know, I was half a mind not to leave him aboard, sir. But the bus was empty, and I says to myself, poor son... Oh, with that great big heavy thing, so I let him on. Though it is against the rules. Heavy, you said. Well, not heavy after all. Sam bulk is the word, but it was big and black and old-fashioned, like the paper says. Would you recognize him again, Norris? The only thing I remember about him is he had dark black hair, sir. Where did he get off your bus? Oh, I remember that, sir. Rochester Row in Westminster. I helped him off the trunk. The last I see was him staggering down Rochester Row with his great oak and black trunk on his up in the rain. Say, was he the murderer, sir? Rafe Dibble, taxi driver of Clarkenwell Road. The girl I sent me, sir. They said they had a notice from Scotland Yard asking about any driver that had a fare to Charing Cross Station on Monday the 10th who had a large trunk as luggage. Had you such a fare? Yes, sir, I did. Would that be the murder trunk locked in all the papers, sir? Where did you pick up this fare, uh, Dibble? It was a very heavy trunk, sir. The gentleman says it's full of books, sir. Books, I says, feels more like a dead body, sir, I says. And he just snickered. So I roped it onto the luggage rack and took it to Charing Cross. My books, he says. Dead body, I says. And that's what it was, wasn't it? Where did you pick him up? Oh, in the rain, sir. At Rochester Row, right across the street from Westminster Police Station. See? Here's my trip card. Rochester Row. If he's the murderer, sir, I'd know him in a minute. He was tall and thin and had black hair, like an Italian or an Irishman. Pracy of case number 498MR381, 13th May 1948, compiled by Inspector Lowe and Detective Sergeant Flannery, 14th May 1948. Mrs. Fanshawe number one. 
Her antipathy toward victim, highly suspicious, watching her closely. Two. Hutchins, the shopkeeper. Uncooperative, but possible suspect. Do this and pass, sir, please. All right. Description vaguely like that of unknown suspect. Tall, thin, dark-haired, under constant observation. Myself. Number three, bus conductor Norwich and taxi driver Dibble state they can identify suspect. Have they seen the shopkeeper Hutchins yet, Sean? Taking them over there tomorrow, sir. Good. Number four, now the victim. No apparent police record. No fingerprint record in our files. Meager reports on... uh, Yes, meager. Reports on her indicate she was quiet, industrious, and of comparatively good deportment, regardless of Mrs. Fanshawe's opinion of her. Well, how about the Rochester Row coincidence, sir? Yes, 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 of course. Number five. Bus conductor says man with trunk alighted at Rochester Row with empty trunk. Taxi driver says he picked up man with heavy trunk at Rochester Row. Detail of constables and detectives under Inspector North commencing search of all buildings in Rochester Row. Very short street. Better put down that Sybil tomorrow. Results will be reported. I think that's about all at the moment, isn't it? Uh, all I can think of, sir. Very well, Sybil. Finish typing it and I'll sign it. Yes, sir. At eight o'clock the next morning, Inspector North and his detail of 20 detectives and constables arrived in Rochester Row with a Scotland Yard lorry fetching the trunk, carefully covered with a tarpaulin so that it could be exhibited to the tenants for their identification. Followed by the lorry, they went from house to house questioning every inhabitant. At six in the evening, when operations were suspended, the trunk had not been recognised. The next morning at 10.15, Inspector North telephoned me, asking me to come at once to 9A Rochester Row on the fourth floor of a business building. I puffed my way up the four flights of ancient mouldy stairs 20 minutes later. Ah. Ah, hello. Ah. What's up, North? Uh, no, this is Mr. Henry Elphinstone, Inspector Lowe. How do you know? Good morning, Inspector. I was saying to Inspector North that I recognised the trunk at once. Good, good. I want to sit down. Before you fall down, old chap, well, well here you are, here you are. Now, uh, go on, go on. Uh, um, oh, um, I-, I saw it in the hall outside this room one day last week. Ah, uh, I was right. Whose room was this? Well, unfortunately, I've never seen him. My assistant rented this place to him on April the 11th. His name, Arthur Cunningham. Where is he? Skipped. What? He left without notice. The 6th. Thursday, that was. What was his business? Well, an estate agent, he said. Left this note on the table there. I got it out of our files. Uh, Sorry, gone broke. Paid up to 11th. Please let typewriter people have a machine. Arthur L. Cunningham. Who has been and gone and hopped it. You know, North, there must be another way of making a living. I can give you the name of his bank. You should be able to find him quite quickly through them, sir. Oh, most excellent man, Elphinstone. Now, who will carry me down four flights of stairs to a telephone? At the Camberwell address furnished by Cunningham's bank, the landlady reported to Inspector Lowe that Cunningham had left the place on the 5th, leaving no forwarding address. But she remembered a letter addressed to Cunningham had been delivered to the house two days after he had departed. She gave the unopened letter to the inspector, who opened it legally at Scotland Yard and read it eagerly. It was a form letter from the post office telegraphs department. We regret that your telegram dated 3rd of May to Mrs. Harriet Cunningham, Greyhound Hotel, Hammersmith, was undeliverable because... Aha! Inspector Lowe here. Put me through to Hammersmith, the Greyhound Hotel, Mrs. Harriet Cunningham at once. I'll wait, yes. The innocent Mrs. Cunningham was only too glad to tell the inquiring friend where her husband was to be found, of course. The Hammersmith police picked him up in a pub that night, and the next day he confronted Inspector Lowe at Scotland Yard. He was quite at ease. Uh, No, I'm sorry, I never saw the woman before. (laughs) You know, I'm that old-fashioned character faithful to my wife, Inspector. Well, that's very commendable, I'm sure. Well, I admit I've been about the country a bit since I was demobbed last year, but I assure you all my travels were in quest of that elusive thing, a job. I gather they're rather difficult to come by. I found it, sir. I I thought I had a good thing in this estate agent business, but I found myself possessed of nothing but my fare to Hammersmith to my wife. Fortunate she has a good job at the Greyhound there. Wonderful woman, Harriet. It was her ninepence I was buying my gin and it with at the pub where chaps found me. Um, You say you did see that trunk at the place in Rochester Row? Uh, Yes, I, I think I'd seen it. I didn't take any special notice of it. 
It's a horrible thing. Quite. Well, you've been quite open with me, and I appreciate it, Mr. Cunningham. You won't mind if I check up on the statements you've made? Oh, of course not, of course not. I have nothing at all to conceal. Sir. Just as a matter of formality, do you mind having those two chaps who said they'd remember the man with the trunk, the shopkeeper and the taxi driver? Do you mind having them look you over? Oh, of course not. I, I do think, though, that you should parade one or two others with me to see if they can vote for one. Uh, isn't that the proper procedure in detective circles? <laughs> of course, I'll see to that. If I get them now and bring in one or two others to stand inspection with you... Oh, well, let's get it over with, by all means. I'll get them all at once, then. All right, on with the show. Oh, excuse me, sir. Flannery, go on in. You can help me. I'm... Just, just a minute, sir. I was checking on relatives of the murdered woman. Yes, yes, in a moment. This is her former husband. Afternoon, sir. You were married to Leonie Fournier? Yes, sir. Have you been in the mortuary? We just came from there, sir. He recognized her. Bloody awful, sir. I... Tell the inspector why you divorced her. I didn't divorce her. I just left her. Tell the inspector why. Well, she was running around with another man. Tell the inspector his name. Arthur Cunningham, sir. I was very happy as I ushered Sergeant Flannery, Sergeant Anstruther, Inspector North and Constable Fletcher into my office. Stand along the wall there, I said, in the bright light with Mr. Cunningham. I picked up the telephone. Will you please send in those three men in the waiting room? Come in, gentlemen. Now, if you will look at this group of gentlemen very carefully, please, and tell me if you recognize one of them as the man you saw with the black trunk. Now, take your time. Yes, Mr. Hutchins, you sold a man the trunk. Is he present? I don't see him. Are you sure? Positive. Well, you assured me you could recognize him. Not one of these. Mr. Norwich, do you recognize the man who boarded your bus with the trunk? Well, that, that tall one with the glasses. That's Inspector North. Well, if it ain't had any idea, sir. You devil. Is the man who hailed your cab among these gentlemen? No, sir. He had a moustache. Nobody here's got a moustache. Yeah, that's right. You're certain that you do not identify any of these men? Well, then I take it, Inspector, that none of us are criminals, sir. Thank you, gentlemen. All of you. Inspector Lowe's office, 11.30 that night. Only one lonesome light burning. The two men silent, thinking. Oh, must you always be lighting that stinking pipe? Hmm? Oh, I'm sorry, sir. Sorry, Sean. I didn't mean to speak so sharply. I know. I'm just as upset as you are. I was so sure. Teach me a lesson, I hope. Yeah, those chaps were so certain they could identify him. They couldn't. The taxi driver. I talked to him afterwards. That tall chap, he says. He, he might have been the one, except he hadn't no moustache. I know. And his hair was the wrong color. A man can shave off a moustache. Yes, and dye his hair. Dye black hair? Well, you can make it lighter. I suppose. Well, I don't know whether Cunningham did it or not, but I'm definitely of the opinion that the murder was committed in that place in Rochester Row where the trunk was. An ideal setup for a murder. Tenant gone, place empty, the renting agent, that Elphinstone chap. Why, he didn't even miss Cunningham till the next morning. The woman's husband said that she'd been running around with Cunningham. Now, she might have gone there to see him and found him gone. Friend husband could have been following her, caught her and cracked her neck. Crikey. He was tall and thin. He had dark hair and a moustache. Well, uh, we're not in such bad shape after all. Yeah. Look, North and his crew are over there at Rochester Road taking the place apart, brick by brick. They're going to work all night and perhaps they'll find something. I devoutly hope so. Anyway, I'll have this husband fellow picked up and printed in case he left any marks of his paddies about over there. Well, we and start then... all over again. I'll... Go home and get a night's sleep and we'll have our little group of talented identifiers in here early in the morning to tell us that's our boy. You know, you're an extremely clever man, Sergeant Flannery. I'll have them all here first thing. Yes, Inspector Lowe? Who? Oh, yes, Mac. Well, we were just leaving, but... Oh, not really. Of course we'll wait. Come on down. Mac, up in the laboratory. Says he's been working on the contents of the trunk. Oh, not the late Mrs. Fournier, the other things. And he wants to show us something. Did he say what? Afraid I didn't give him a chance. He's 
fetching it down to us, whatever it is. Well, I hope he hurries. Come in. Hello, Mac. Glad I caught you. It's just enough chance, but I... What have you got? What have you got? Well, uh, this is the duster that was in the trunk where the late lamented. Hmm. It looks awfully clean. I just washed it. I wanted the blood stains. Uh, look here under the light. Here, you see it in the corner? The blood stains covered it up before, and it's uh, pretty faded. Yeah. Greyhound Hotel, Hammersmith. The hotel where Cunningham's wife works. Is it important, Inspector? It's rather small for a hangman's new smack, old boy, but I fancy it will serve. It will serve. Now, Sean, you get friend Cunningham out of his comfortable bed at about the time Dawn is mucking about with her rosy fingers. And you grasp Mr. Cunningham between the thumb and forefinger of the right hand and fetch him here to the waiting room. And watch him wait. Till I consent at last to see him. Yes, sir. And then watch her. And then you and I'll make a short visit to the mortuary. What for? To see if the unfortunate lady on the slab is in there is still smiling. Seven fifteen the next morning, a rather tousled, bleary eyed Cunningham arrived at Scotland Yard with Sergeant Flannery and was seated to wait for my arrival. When I arrived at nine thirty, he stopped me. What's up now, Inspector? Oh, just wanted to talk some things over with you. See you in a few minutes. Uh, but look, I've not had my breakfast. Well, I'll be with you in just a few moments. Oh, Inspector Lowe. Oh, yes, North. I've uh, I've something for you to look at at once. Just wait a bit, Cunningham. I'm sure you don't mind. Uh, but, Inspector, what, what do you want? Nice going, North, I said. <laughs> a very good act. But North looked at me quite seriously. Not an act, Bob, he said. We found something. He handed me a little bottle cap. What's this, I asked. Read it. We found it in the fireplace of Cunningham's place last night, alongside these hairpins. Now, you read what it says on the bottle cap. Madame du Maurier's golden hair rinse. Why, North, I think Mr. Cunningham will be delighted to see that after he's waited and sweated another hour or two. I let him in after two more hours. I'm afraid he was a rather pitiable sight. Flannery's cryptic remark to him as he passed by, something about new evidence, had ruined his sorely tried composure. And the waiting and speculating and wondering. I let him speak first. I... I decided I'd better tell you the truth, Inspector. I let him wait. What I would like to know is uh, this. I did kill her. Uh, but it, it was accidental. I, I didn't mean to do it. It, it. it was purely an accident. She came to my room. You did know her, then? Uh, I, I knew her slightly. Uh, she came to my rooms and, and she demanded money and, and she threatened me when I told her I had none. How did she threaten you? Hey? How did she threaten you? Uh, she, she struck at me and I automatically uh, struck back and, and she fell and hit her forehead on the fender of the fireplace and then... Wait, wait, wait. The bruise was on the back of her head. Uh, and I got, got panicky and I stuffed her body in a truck. When did you bleach your hair? What? What? I, I, but I tell you, I didn't murder her. I killed her accidentally, I tell you, accidentally. Listen to me, Cunningham, before you say any more. What, what? Arthur Cunningham, I arrest you on a charge of willful murder. I warn you that anything you say will be taken down in writing and used in evidence against you. Now, go on with your story, if you like. The Crime... Cunningham's admission at the trial that he had lured his former inamorata to his office to put an end to her threats of exposure, together with his eventual identification by the shopkeeper, the taxi driver and the bus conductor, the stolen duster from the Hammersmith Hotel in which the body was wrapped, and other evidence produced by Scotland Yard were of great importance at his trial. The verdict. <coughs> My lord, we the jury... Find the prisoner guilty of willful murder. The sentence. <coughs> to be hanged by the neck until you are dead. And may God have mercy on your soul. You have heard the true story of Scotland Yard case number 498. MR381. The names of all participants have been changed for obvious reasons. The research on Whitehall 1212 is done by Percy Hoskins, 
chief crime reporter of the London Daily Express, and the stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper. NBC. Whitehall, one, two, one, two. Quickly, please. This is Scotland Yard. For the first time, Scotland Yard opens its secret files to bring you the authentic, true stories of some of its most baffling cases. These accurate records are drawn from the Scotland Yard file by special permission of Commissioner Sir Harold Scott. They're true in every respect, except for the names of the participants, which, for obvious reasons, have been changed. The research has been done by Mr. Percy Hoskins, chief crime reporter for the London Daily Express, and the stories for radio are written and directed by Mr. Willis Cooper. Here are the principal participants in case number 201 MR340. Sidney Patterson, builder. Mr. Patterson is absent, sir. Detective Inspector Edmund Whitaker of Scotland Yard. It was quite obvious why Mr. Patterson was absent. There are other participants in our case number 201 MR340, but not of the same importance as Mr. Patterson. We shall run across them as we go on. We shall run across a great many interesting things as we reenact case 201 MR340. And I should like to warn you, if you have the slightest trace of murder in your heart, that a murdered person's teeth are almost impossible to destroy, and that nothing is ever lost and will certainly be found sometime, somewhere, by someone. Now, will you come with me? This is Scotland Yard's Black Museum. Yes? It's Inspector Whitaker, sir, with a friend. Oh, do come in, Whitaker. Thank you, sir. Come along. This is Chief Superintendent John Davidson, the curator of the Black Museum. Well, how do you do? I'm afraid this place is a little like a chamber of horrors, although our exhibits taken by themselves are not so startling. But they are souvenirs of the lawbreaker's art, particularly of the unlovely art of murder. Now, this human bone here brought one man to the hangman's expert hands. And these dried blood stains on this cloth are from a once loving husband's throat. And this revolver... Oh, but you wanted to see the exhibits in our case 201MR340, didn't you, Whitaker? Yes, if you please, sir. Well, these are the only ones we had. There's a man's tooth and this badly charred top of an ordinary office stool. That's all we have here of case 201MR340. The rest is elsewhere. Detective Sergeant Alexander McMurphy and I, we were the murder squad next on call, were sitting peacefully chatting in my office at Scotland Yard that evening of the 16th May, waiting for our relief, who were due in less than half an hour. Oh, you're early, answer the... No such luck, Mac. Oh, hello, Boots. <sighs> What's up, Boots? Investigation, sir. Why couldn't they wait another half hour? Sorry, sir, it just came in. Oh, uh, we don't live right. Camden Town, sir. Mm -hmm. There's a fire. What? They want someone from the yard. What are we, a bleeding auxiliary fire brigade, do they think? They seem to have come across someone sitting in the middle of it, sir. What? Sitting in it? Grilled to a turn. What? Hmm. Here's the address, sir. Your car's waiting. We hastened at once, of course, to the Camden Town location, about 20 miles away. The fire was a small one. It had partially destroyed an old shed which had been used as an office by a local builder, Mr. Sidney Patterson. It was only a smouldering ruin when we arrived and identified ourselves to the magnificently moustached section leader in charge. We followed him into the soggy ruins of the shed. Right here, gentlemen. We wetted him down with the fire hoses as soon as we saw him, but it was much too late. Hot fire? Oh, ruddy inferno. Mm -hmm. He had paints and oils stored in here. <laughs> Not my idea of a way to commit suicide. Suicide? Note on the table there. What was a table? Pinned to the top with a drawing pin. See? Yes. Hold up your torch here a sec, will you, section leader? Yeah. Uh, good, goodbye all. No work, no money. Sydney 
Ah, uh, Patterson. Hmm. That was the poor sod's name. See the sign? I'll telephone the laboratory to pick up the uh, remains, shall I, sir? Best use the two-way wireless on the car, I think. All right, sir. What's he, uh, what's he leaning against? Looks like a stool or something. Uh, that's what it is, sir. A hoffy stool. See these buckets all around him? He must have surrounded himself with buckets of paint and whatnot. And flipped a match into one of them. You ever hear of a chap committing suicide by setting himself on fire before? No, oh, I wouldn't want to. It hurt awful. Oh, uh, don't horrible. touch him. Well, I was only trying to pull him away from the stool here. Part of him ain't burned, see? Where he's don't, stuck to it. Don't. The laboratory chap will oh, see to it. Blimey. Hmm? Setting himself on fire didn't hurt him. What do you mean? He shot himself first. Did you see the bullet hole in his back where it ain't burned? When it was against the stool? In his back? Well, was the man a contortionist? No, sir. He was a builder, sir. <laughs> At the yard's pathological laboratories, the relatively small, unburned portion of the body was carefully examined, and it was established that the bullet wound was the probable cause of death. The bullet, which was recovered, proved to be a 38 calibre revolver bullet, which had been fired into the body from the back, entering just below the left shoulder blade and ranging downward, presumably through the heart. Experiments by all of us demonstrated to our satisfaction that such a wound could not possibly be self-inflicted. The improbable suicide was definitely murder. I sent two detective constables to search the ruins of the shed. It had been roped off at our request by the Camden Town Fire Brigade. You'll be looking primarily for a revolver, I told them, but fetch back anything you find that appears useful to us. Whilst they were shifting the ashes, Sergeant McMurphy sifted the affairs of Mr. Sidney Patterson. He reported to me what he had found. From the little I've been able to gather... Patterson wasn't much of a success as a builder, sir. He seems to have been a genius for getting into difficulty. What sort of difficulty? Money. Hmm, how strikingly unusual. Huh? Oh, he had one time been a ship's carpenter on one of the P&O liners, but was discharged when he was unable to account for tools to the value of eight pounds, eleven shillings. Mm -hmm. It was strongly suspected that he sold them, but the charges couldn't be proved. He served in the Royal Marine Light Infantry as a lance corporal. His record is, um, shall I say, dubious. How dubious? He was accused of a, num a number of times by his shipmates of cheating, specifically at the game of crown and anchor. <laughs> he was extremely unpopular in the Royal Marines, it seems, and was finally discharged. Mm -hmm. I shall have a more detailed report from his former commanding officer tomorrow. Hadn't he any friends at all? I've been able to discover only one with whom he could be said to be reasonably friendly, a man named Duncan Fraser, a rent collector in the city with whom he frequently played billiards. Mm, I hope he didn't make the mistake of trying to cheat a Scotsman. I'm not so sure, sir. Eh? Duncan Fraser has been missing since the night of the fire. The hue and cry was immediately set up throughout all Britain for the missing Duncan Fraser. It's extremely difficult for a British subject to leave our tight little island without record. But the search was to no avail whatever. It apparently dropped off the earth. The constables applied to the ash sifting at the scene of the fire found only one thing of note. The twisted remains of an ornate red and black fountain pen, which was identified by his wife as Sidney Patterson's property. Careful examination showed that it was the pen with which the farewell note had been written, and comparisons with other known samples of Patterson's handwriting demonstrated that it had been actually written by Patterson himself. Sergeant McMurphy and I were extremely glum as we discussed our progress in my office late one night. Progress, indeed. We've been progressing backwards, sir. Yeah, if we could find the revolver, it'd be quite simple to trace its owner. If the owner is Duncan Fraser, we'll still have to trace him. Mm hmm no luck yet? None at all, at all. You know, sir, one thing puzzles me. A great many things puzzle me, Mac. If this missing rent collector did murder Patterson, why did he first deposit half the money he'd, be co he'd collected? In the bank, I mean. Hmm? If he was going to kill someone and, and scram, why didn't he keep it all? He'd need it. How did he get Patterson to write his own suicide note? 
Had a gun on him, maybe. Well, the handwriting, Wallace, insists there's no indication of stress or strain or emotional upset or whatever. In the handwriting. It's normal, they say. Mm. I wonder... What? Ah, uh, I'm thinking. I have a filthy little hunch, Mac. What? What if Fraser's dead? Maybe he is. We can't find him. The teeth of that dead are weren't destroyed. Patterson's? I'm wondering if it was Patterson's. Or Duncan, Mac. Hmm. Patterson was a was a known crook. Could he have been playing games with us? Show me that telephone, old boy. Uh, good evening, Mrs. Patterson. A detective Inspector Whitaker, Scotland Yard here. I wonder, Mrs. Patterson, if you could tell us the name of your late husband's dentist. Thank you very much indeed. No, Mrs. Patterson, I'm afraid there's nothing to report yet. Get this tooth merchant in here first thing in the morning, will you, Mac? We'll meet him in the laboratory and let him look at our client's fangs. Well? Well, what, Doctor? I never saw these teeth in my life. What? Oh. I can assure you they are not Sidney Patterson. You can swear to that, Doctor? Well, I hope you're not impugning my professional judgment, sir. Well, not at all, Doctor. It's a, it's a matter of correct legal procedure. I have ample records in my office which you may consult. Charts, impressions. Sidney Patterson had lost three teeth a long time ago. I extracted the left upper canine and the adjacent incisor myself more than a year ago. Hmm. You'll observe that both teeth are intact in this jaw, sir. Then you're prepared to swear that these teeth are not Sidney Patterson, sir? I most assuredly am. And that this is not Sidney Patterson's body? Since the jaw containing the teeth is attached to the remainder of the body, I'm prepared so to swear, sir. It's often impossible to grow a new head on a body. My fee will be one guinea. I will indent for it at once, Doctor. Good day, sir. Now, what did I do with my hat? Oh, yeah, good day. Good, good day, day, Doctor. doctor. I am sincerely glad the teeth are not inflammable, Mac. If more people knew that, there'd be fewer left to be called for corpses around here, sir. Right. Now, have you found Duncan Fraser's dentist yet? I at once caused a thorough investigation to be made throughout London and the vicinity of Perth in Scotland, where Fraser came from, to discover a dentist who had been employed professionally by him. The search was most thorough, although the combined efforts of Scotland Yard and the provincial police were not efficient, sufficient to find the person. In the meantime, we were able to lay our hands on some uh, oh, 13 or 15 persons who had known either Patterson or Fraser. Each individually viewed the grisly remains in the Scotland Yard mortuary. And the results? Ivor Young, Esquire, former employer of Duncan Fraser. Oh, it's hard to say, but I believe this to be the body of Fraser. Michael Fish, a former neighbor of Fraser. No, that ain't him. I knowed him well. Edgar Stone, brother-in-law of Patterson. I'm quite sure this is Sidney Patterson's body. And besides, that's the fountain pen I gave him. Artificer Sergeant Rodney Smith, Royal Marine Light Infantry, a former service acquaintance of Patterson's. No, that ain't him at all. Oh, and I wish it was. Bleeding stinker he was. No, but this ain't him. Police Constable Mark Emerson, a former billiards companion of Fraser. It's Duncan, all right. He looks awful, but then he always did. Hamish Fraser, uncle of Duncan. Oh, no. No, that isn't my nephew, Duncan. Samuel Furness, labourer, sometime employee of Sidney Patterson. I oh, know it's him. What well, didn't I work for him? Confusion. Confusion confounded. Six said it was Furness, seven insisted it was Fraser. Patterson's widow herself was not sure, and she and her brother, Edgar Stone, Patterson's brother-in-law, had high words. Mac Murphy and I nipped round to the goat and compasses to refresh and sustain ourselves. 
I was finishing my gin and bitters, and Mac was deep into his second pint of mild and bitter, when the proprietor, one Dick Gillespie, came out of the saloon bar and accosted us. Oh, I say, Inspector Whitaker, I didn't know you were in here. Yeah, hello, Dick. There was a, a telephone call for you. Oh, who was it? Uh, Sergeant Kenneth at the yard. What do you want? Well, he said, he said they found the dentist. <coughs> oh, 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 what's the matter, Inspector? Your teeth hurt you? It was a dentist from Perth. The Scottish police had found him. We brought him at once to Scotland Yard, where he immediately identified the charred remains as those of Duncan Fraser. One of his molars was curiously malformed. It corresponded exactly with the one shown in a clinical photograph of Fraser's mouth the doctor had made a year ago. There was no mistaking it, he said. We returned to my office to marshal the facts that we had accumulated. The labourer, Samuel Furness, who had been so certain of his identification of the body as that of Patterson, was waiting. Mac and I listened. Oh, I knew that was Mr. Patterson what burned up to a skeleton, sir. Why are you so sure, Furness? Because I was the last man to see him alive, sir. When? Well, in the afternoon of the day he was burned up, sir. Go on. Well, it was like this here, you see, sir. Go on, go on. Well, I come into his office, sir. You know, the shed, what was all burned up. I was after the seven and six he'd owed me for two months. Oh, he was always putting me off, sir, but... Why? He... Well, he... he always seemed to be stony, sir. Never seemed to have a shilling. Ah, he was always putting go me on, off. Go on, go on. Did you get your money? Oh, that I did, sir. Before you could say knife, he had out his purse and he pulled out a great wad of notes. Then he counted me out, me seven and six. And then he handed me half a crown. And he says, here, buy yourself half a pint, Sammy. <laughs> Cool, I was fair took her back at old Sydney giving anybody anything for nothing. He seemed to have <laughs> plenty of money, did he? Well, his wallet was fair stuffed. <laughs> you know, it's the first time I ever known him to have more than threepence in my life. Oh. <laughs> well, I was so took back, I tried to get up and I fell right on me apple and plum. Yes. I kicked my foot against a couple of bags of cement he had under his desk and I fell right down. <laughs> did you see the bags of cement? <laughs> well, they was under the desk, sir. Did you see them? Well, I... Uh, well, no, sir, I didn't, but Thank I know I kicked... Thank you, Oh, Patterson had plenty of money in his wallet for the first time. We found that there was absolutely no identification in the ruins of the burned shed that any cement had ever been stored there. We'll find him. I said that nothing is ever lost. No thing, no person. I will admit, however, that it is sometimes extremely difficult to find a missing thing or a missing person, especially when the objects of the search have few distinguishing characteristics. Sidney Patterson was such a man. Description of Sidney Patterson, broadcast by Scotland Yard. Age, 43. Height, 5 feet, 9 inches. Weight, 11 stone 4. Medium brown hair and straggling moustache, same colour, which he may have shaved off. Eyes, blue. When last seen, was dressed in grey tweed, single-breasted suit. White shirt, dark red tie, black low-cut shoes. How many men answering that description do you see in a day? We had reports from every corner of the United Kingdom. Two slightly adult gentlemen, neither of whom resembled Patterson in the slightest, marched, one at Torquay and one at Thranvar in Wales, into police stations, announcing themselves as the wanted man. Each was promptly committed. Lodging house keepers by the hundred were interviewed. The manhunt dragged on for eight days before we had our first glimmer of success. Um, let, uh, let McMurphy tell it. He was there. There was a lodging house in Regent's Park, a very obscure one which smelt of Brussels sprouts. The proprietress was in the hospital having another baby and her husband, a very harassed man, was in charge. Yes, he said, they'd had a lodger who seemed to answer to the broadcast description. Had had, I said. Uh, well, he ain't here anymore, I mean. What became of him? Well, he opted. He opted the very day that the piper come out with the description. Where? I don't know. He, uh, he just sent us his telegram. Brother ill. Must leave. We'll get in touch later. Rogers. Rogers, eh? That the name he gave? Right here. Right here it is in the register book. Here. Sidney Rogers, see? 
Sydney, eh? That is own writing? Yes, yes. I'd like to have that page, if you please. Oh, I'll return it. You're sure it's his handwriting? Oh, I... I seen him. I, uh, I seen him write it. May I have the page? Well, well my, my old lady likes to keep things neat and tidy. Mm, well, I'll return it as soon as we have checked it against a sample of his handwriting. Now, uh, when did he come here? Uh, 16th of May, as it says right here. And when did he leave? Well, the day is his description first come out in the paper. Mm, he leave uh, his luggage? Oh, he hadn't any luggage. He, he was here all the time without even, without even changing his shirt. That room of his, oh, it's fair piggish. <laughs> Must be. Well, <laughs> we are rid of him and he's paid up till the end of the week. Anyway, so we don't lose nothing. Yeah. You, you suppose it, it was him? It'll be in the papers. Comparisons of samples of Patterson's handwriting with the signature of <clears throat> Sidney Rogers showed them to be identical. Peterson's full name was Sidney Roger Patterson. The telegram had been sent from South End. We turned our attention to that muddy little place. He was not to be found, although our search was scrupulous and thorough. We put a postal stop on all letters addressed to his former home, expecting that sooner or later he'd attempt to write to his wife. Thus, all letters addressed to that house would be held out and delivered to us first. We would open and read them, reseal, and allow them to be delivered to the addressee without the wife's knowledge that we had read them. No letters appeared. We waited. Time was on our side, and the searchers at South End plodded along, making no apparent progress. And then, after a week had passed, the post office people sent us a letter. It was addressed to his brother-in-law, Edgar Stone, who had a room there. Letter addressed to Edgar Stone. Dear Edgar, just a line to you in the hope that I shall be able to see a friend before I end it all. Will you come to see me at South End Sunday, uh -huh. please? Take the 10.35 train. It arrives at South End at 12.08. Come out of the station, walk straight across the road and down Whitegate Road on the left side. I shall see you coming. If you come, please bring me a 15 and a half inch shirt and a comb. Best of luck. Mine is gone. F. Farmer. Well, so... I withdrew the detectives from the area mentioned in the letter, which was resealed and delivered to Edgar Stone. I didn't want to alarm Mr. Farmer Patterson. The next day, Edgar Stone came to see me. He sat down nervously. What can I do for you, sir, Stone, I asked. I... I, I have received a letter, Inspector. Yes? It, it's from... Are you going to South End on Sunday, Mr. Stone? Huh? Stone had a strong sense of justice, strengthened, perhaps, by the shabby way Patterson had treated his sister for so many years. He agreed at once to assist us. We sat in my office and planned it, Mac and Stone and I. You all taking the shirt, of course, Stone, I said. Yes, sir. What a man who's going to end it all once with the shirt is beyond me. Probably needs it. Afraid he'll be recognised if he goes out to buy one, I expect. He's got plenty of money, we know that. If the banks had been opened that afternoon... He, well, he'd, he'd have any. He wouldn't have any. Why? Well, Fraser would have deposited his afternoon's collection, the same as he did his morning. Well, the banks had been open. Fraser would still be alive. Certainly he'd be up to some other mystery. Uh, yes. Well, let's get organised, shall we? First, we'll need a good man on this Whitegate Road to see Patterson doesn't get frightened and do a bunk. You'd better do that, Mac. Well, uh... Um, uh, afraid he'll spot you for a cop. Disguise? Hmm? I've seen too many cinemas, I'm afraid. I don't like false beards. Wait! You play the fiddle, don't you, Mac? What? You could be a street fiddler, couldn't you? Well, I... I could. That's what you'll be. Complete with tin cup and pathetic look. Very touching and, and very unsuspicious. And I'll have half of what you take in. How am I going to stop a man with a fiddle? Poof, simple enough, old boy. Just play God Save the King. He'll stand at attention till I get there. We planned it as carefully as we could. This was to be the definitive last act. Stone and I took the same train to South End, but when he got off with me, I stayed inside the station. Far down the street, I could see Sergeant McMurphy in an ancient green suit of clothes, sawing industriously away on his fiddle. There were a few pedestrians on the street, 
church services were just over. <clears throat> There's Whitehead Road, I said to Stone. Come back at once. The up train's due in a few minutes. Good luck. I wish I didn't have to do this, Inspector, but... Just remember what he's done, Stone. It's the only reason I'm doing it, sir. Good luck. Sidney was my friend once. He turned and crossed the road, walked slowly down Whitehead Road. I watched him from the station window. As he approached McMurphy, he paused a second. I chuckled as McMurphy held out his tin cup and Stone dropped a coin into it. Far away, I could hear his fiddle. I went to the door of the station and stepped outside as he turned the far corner. There is such a thing as trusting a man, but... I waited. The distant street fiddler shambled round the corner which Stone had turned. I fidgeted. A couple passed on their way home from the church. I waited. A small boy ran past with a hockey stick. I waited. And at last I saw Mac Murphy in his green suit come slowly round the corner toward me. In a moment, Stone reappeared. He glanced at Mac as he passed, and I thought I saw him nod. I started toward him, sauntering quite casually. We passed without recognition. Mac had halted again and was playing. I stopped alongside him. How much have you made, Mac? I asked. Four shillings. Hmm, good. What happened? Oh, it's all right. Anybody who sees us will think I'm asking you how you fell to this low estate. First house round the corner. There was a cardboard sign in the window. Sydney was printed on it. Door opened. He went in. That's all I saw. Good. I'll nip round to the back. You walk on around in front and play. We'll see what happens. Well, I, I, I don't... I can't play, God save the king. It was easy to nip over the fence and slip around to the rear of the second house, which was marked J. Huntington. I tried the rear door. It was unlocked. I opened it cautiously and stepped inside. It was empty, apparently. I stepped down the narrow hall. Is that you, Mr. Huntington? I walked toward the voice. Mr. Huntington, is that you? I walked to the door on the left. Mr. Huntington. He stood there in the frosty little room, a pathetic figure with his neatly combed hair, holding a clean white shirt in his hand, an embarrassed little smile on his face. Oh, I thought you were Mr. Huntington. I'm Inspector Whitaker, Scotland Yard, Mr. Patterson. Oh, yes. I knew you'd found me eventually. I just wanted to put on a clean shirt before I... before... Uh... I detain you on suspicion of being involved in the murder of Duncan Fraser. Oh, poor Duncan. And I warn you that anything you may say will be taken down in writing and used against you. Uh, there, there we are. I've only one thing to say, sir. I did murder Duncan. This is the revolver I shot him with. Give it here. The one you couldn't find, sir. Give it here. It wasn't lost, sir. Give it here. Oh, no, sir. Patterson! <laughs> No, Sidney. Nothing is ever lost. Except lies, I'm afraid. You have just heard the story of case number 201-MR-340 from the official files of Scotland Yard. All of the facts related are true, with the single exception of the names of the participants, which, for obvious reasons, have been changed. The research was prepared by Mr. Percy Hoskins of the London Daily Express, and the story for radio was written and directed by Mr. Willis Cooper. Next, listen for Tales of the Texas Rangers on NBC. White Hall, one, two, one, two. Hurry. This is Scotland Yard.
the first time, Scotland Yard opens its secret files to bring you the authentic, true stories of some of its most baffling cases. These records are drawn from the Scotland Yard files, and only the names of the participants have been changed. The research has been prepared by Mr. Percy Hoskins, chief crime reporter for the London Daily Express. The stories for radio are written and directed by Mr. Willis Cooper. Here are the principal participants in Scotland Yard case number 397-MR381. Stanley Russell, shop clerk. Mr. Russell is not to be found. Mrs. Hope Russell, his wife. Mrs. Russell was reported missing on the day before Good Friday. Adolf Hitler's Luftwaffe. Chief Inspector Bryce Purcell of Scotland Yard. I should like to introduce Deputy Commander William Byrd of Scotland Yard, my superior officer. Before we proceed, I believe it would be a good idea to visit the Black Museum. Come along with me, if you please. After you, sir. Good afternoon, John. Good afternoon, sir. This is Chief Superintendent John Davidson, curator of Scotland Yard's Black Museum. Well, how do you do? You came about case number 397-MR381, I believe you said, sir. Right. Will you tell us about it, John? Well, this is the exhibit. No, don't touch it, please. It's quite fragile. And as you can see, it has already been broken. We have a great many other exhibits of crimes in these rooms. Murder weapons, blood-stained garments, bullets that have snuffed out many lives, death masks and many notorious criminals. Almost every in instrument of violence that can be conceived. I should explain that these gruesome objects about us are not merely souvenirs. Many of them have aided our men in solving other crimes and bringing the perpetrators to justice. Now, this one... Tell us what this thing is, John. This is Mrs. Hope Russell. Sixteen months after the Easter Blitz of 1941, the work of clearing out bombed-out areas of London was still progressing. On the 12th July 1942, the Scotland Yard Information Room received an urgent call from PC John Dunn of the Kennington District. A patrol car in which Chief Inspector Purcell was riding was dispatched to the scene, a partially destroyed Baptist chapel. I was directed to the spot by P.C. Dunn, who was on point duty at the road intersection. Right over there, sir, where you see the men standing. They found some it, sir. The navvies that's working here. Right, thank you. Morning, boys. Morning. What have you found? Who are you, mate? I'm Chief Inspector Purcell, Scotland Yard. What's up? Down, sir. Down there. In that hole, sir. Yeah, it's an old burying wall, sir. What? What is it? A skeleton, sir. He's dead. Up down, Georgie and Sean, with your torch. All right. Yeah, you see, sir? Here he is. Stand to one side, will you? He's off under this stone slab, sir. See? I see him. Well, what's so strange about a skeleton in a burial vault? There ain't been anybody in there since 1934, sir. 1935. Uh, I was in that gang that moved the old corpses out of here, Herbert. It was 1934. We didn't leave a one. <laughs> God bless you. It's the quicklime down here, sir. Quicklime? How'd, uh, how'd quicklime get down there? You're the detective, mister. We just work here. The badly burned skeleton was removed to the pathological laboratories at Scotland Yard, together with the other articles found in the vault. A considerable amount of quicklime and a half-burned straw pellius which had partially covered the remains. There was nothing else. I stood beside Keith Briggs, the home office pathologist, while he completed his examination. What do you think, Keith? I asked. Well, she's dead. She? Oh, it's a woman, all right. No question about that. The hip bones are characteristically a woman's. So is the sacrum here, and... Uh, uh, how old a woman? Oh, 
Middle-aged, I'd say. See, the bones are fully developed, mm -hmm. so we know she was full-grown. And there were one or two strands of long gray hair adhering to the skull. Here they are. And then the teeth here. What about them? Well, you see, they're pretty well worn. Now, you see here, in the upper jaw, mm -hmm. seven of the uppers are missing. Now, see these ridges? Yes. Well, they were caused by a dental plate, which probably consisted of seven teeth, and then... Uh, what are you looking for? The, the measuring tape. Oh, here. The lady was lying on it. What are you going to do now? Hmm, see how tall she was. She's rather jumbled about. Uh, and the, the feet, where are they? Oh, the thigh bone's all I need. Oh, hold it, please, huh? This one. Now, let's see. Let's see. Uh, yeah, 43 centimeters. Now, well, that's all right, sir. Now, 43 centimetres multiplied by 3.6. What are you doing? A sediment scale. You multiply the length of the thigh bone by 3.6. Man's is 3.7. And you get the exact height. Now, see, that's uh, 154.8 centimetres. We'll call it 1 metre 55. Uh, metres 39.37 and 55 hundredths of 39.37 is 21.65. Now, 39.37 plus 21.65, that's uh, 7, 5, 12, 6, 9, 10, 9, 10, 11, 3, 5, 6, 61.02 inches. There. She was 5 feet 1 and 2 hundredths inches tall. In a word, 5 foot 1. What was her name? Whatever her name, sir, she was murdered. Consider that I've asked the question. Eh? Oh, 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 how do I know? Well, this bone here. Where does it fit? This is what she talked with. It's the voice box, the trachea, you know, her throat. Look, see these little wing things up here? Mm -hmm. Now, you see this one? See, it's broken. Well? Now, this is one of the most significant fractures in all forensic medicine, sir. Why? There's only one way to do it. Oh, come on, man, don't come Sherlock Holmes on me. How do you do it? Well, I was about to say by manual pressure on the throat, sir. Strangulation, you mean? Intentional strangulation, sir. There's no other way. And then there's the quicklime. <laughs> Surely you know that quicklime will not destroy a body, sir. Yes, I know it, Keith. But murderers seldom do. Reference to the ARP records showed that every other casualty and missing persons in Kennington had been accounted for. It was apparent that the victim had not been a resident of that district. I caused bulletins and charts of the teeth to be sent to all the dentists in London for identification. No results were forthcoming, and we were forced to conclude that the dentist in question had become an air raid casualty, or that the work had been done in some other city. I gave Purcell a very difficult assignment. Difficult, sir? Well, it's not so difficult, but it's tedious. It'll take a long time. I know, but it's got to be done. I'm strongly of the opinion that it was murder. We checked carefully, sir, and the, the only quicklime on the entire premises was that in the vault with the skeleton. I thought they might have dusted the entire place with quicklime for sanitary purposes, but they hadn't. Certainly looks as if someone had wanted to dispose of a body. Until we know who she was, we'll never discover who he is. <sighs> yes, sir. Well, I'll get cracking. I'll need men to go over the missing persons' rushes, sir, to find the names and addresses. Every woman five feet tall, of middle age with gray hair, who is still missing now. And then I'll need more men to make inquiries of all the next of kin to see which of them wore false teeth. And to find out which one wore an upper plate that matches the one in Briggs's chart here. Mm, it'll take a good many men and a good bit of time, sir. You can get the men, Purcell, and we've got the time. Good luck. Oh, thank you, sir. Nothing would ever happen for two weeks except for the unrewarded activities of Purcell's men. I had a minor inspiration about the seventh day. Put me through to Sergeant Bowles, please. Commander Bird here, Sergeant. I should like you to send me all the file copies of the Metro operations for the period two weeks before to two weeks after the Easter Blitz of last year, please. Yes, at once, if you please. The Metropolitan Informations is a daily newspaper containing digests of all the crime news. It is usually invaluable. I pored over every issue, looking assiduously for an item that might prove of some help. 
I had reached the end of the first week after the date the Kennington Chapel was destroyed with no results whatever when Purcell reported. Found, sir. Oh, good. Here. Here is the missing plate. That's much better than I'd hoped for, Purcell. Apparently the plate hurt her mouth. She often left it at home. As a matter of fact, I found it at her sister's. Oh, I stopped upstairs to see Keith Briggs in the laboratory, and they fit exactly, allowing for the fact that there's no flesh on the jawbones. Ah, here's Keith. Now, that right, Keith? Mm, that's right, sir. And the marks on the skeleton's teeth coincide exactly with these little clamps here. I've uh, brought the skull down. Yeah. You see, sir? Oh, she looks very fine. Congratulations, Purcell. Thank you, sir. The only thing is... She was reported missing three days before the raid that destroyed the chapel. She was? It's in all the records, sir. Where were you, madame? Mm, she might have been hidden in the vault. Immediately she was murdered, sir. And then the fire, when the place was bombed... It must have been quite a hot fire. Let's see. The Kennington Fire Brigade, please. Yes. Oh, what's her name, Purcell? Mrs. Hope Russell... Russell. Hope Russell, did you say... Oh, hello. Is that the Kennington Fire Brigade? The senior company officer, if you please. I'll wait. Hope Russell. I've run across that name somewhere. Yes? Thank you. Hello, this is Commander Bird at Scotland Yard. Do you remember during the Easter Blitz last year when the Baptist Chapel was destroyed there in Kennington? What I wanted to know was that a very severe fire... What? There was no fire. What? No fire, whatever, when the chapel was destroyed? Oh, two days later. Hmm, how very curious. It was reported by whom? The Kennington police. Or wasn't there a... Oh, look here, old chap. I'm sending at once for their divisional superintendent. Could you possibly come along with him to my office at the yard? Yes. I'm afraid it is rather important. I'll have him pick you up in his car. Thank you so much. At once, yes. No fire. Keith, would you mind... Get him in the fire chap over here at once. Use my name. Ask them both to bring their records for that night. Please. All right, sir. Oh, no fire, eh? What's that woman's name, Purcell? Mrs. Hope Russell. I knew I remembered it. Look at this. Metro information, eh? Look under articles lost and found. I was just reading it. Uh, lost and found. Here, the, the third item. Read that. Found by... Postmistress Guilford Surrey in the post office yesterday, a woman's purse. Black leather, plain, a strap. Contents, lipstick, comb, mirror, two London tram tickets, 11 pence in coin, ration book, identity card, issued to Mrs. Hope Russell. Well, what was she doing in Guilford? Look at the date of the paper, Purcell. April... The... What was she doing in Guildford three days after the air raid in Kennington? <laughs> the divisional superintendent and the fire brigade officer from Kennington sat in my office with Purcell and me. I looked at the fire brigade records first. Now, here, sir... This is the day of the big raid when the chapel was destroyed. Good Friday evening, 11th of April, 1941. Yes. Every call is set down in the occurrence book here, sir. Yes, I know. Together with all the calls to the auxiliary fire service, the civilians, sir. Yes, I know. And you can see there's no report whatever of a fire at the Kennington Baptist Chapel from either source. Right. But over here, sir, on this page, Tuesday the 15th, four days later, 11 o'clock p.m., you see, sir? Mm -hmm. Chapel and so forth. Report telephoned in by Kennington Police Station. Do your records correspond, Superintendent? I'll read it to you, sir. 10.57 p.m. Tuesday, 15th of April. P.C. Allison telephoned to report a fire at the ruins of the Baptist Chapel. Alarm telephoned to Kennington Fire Brigade at 11 p.m. Your anger's up yourself, Robert. Oh, I did that indeed. Here's my initials. What do you think, Percival? Why did the police constable report it? Yes, I was just going to ask that. I don't understand, sir. Wasn't there a fire watcher? Oh. <laughs> Wasn't there? Well, sir, there, there was a fire watcher. There was supposed to be. Well, where was he? 
Asleep, sir, probably. Or out cadging a drink somewhere. Not an ARP man. No, sir. A private man employed by the wholesale chemist across the road from the chapel. A thoroughly useless man. Completely undependable. Yeah, his employers caught up with him at last, sir. He was sacked six or seven weeks ago. I've not seen him since. Neither have I. Well, sounds like a spiv to me. He is, sir. I knew him quite well. Had a great deal of trouble with his wife, and I used to see him quite regularly. Oh. He agreed to pay in 18 shillings and ninepence, I, I think it was, weekly, at the police station for her, which he didn't ever do. Oh, not ever. Never once till Easter Monday last year, right after the big raid. He kept it up, too, till he was discharged and left. I suppose this chemical firm he worked for could put us on to him. I'd like to have a chat with the fellow. Wouldn't you, Purcell? I certainly would. I'll telephone them now and ask them if you'll give me the name of the firm and his name. Oh, his name is Stanley Russell. Russell? I wonder if you'd know his wife's name, Superintendent. Oh, I've seen it often enough. Yes, yes, sir. His name, uh, her name is uh, Mrs. Hope Russell. <laughs> In the Pirates of Penzance, Gilbert and Sullivan complain bitterly that a policeman's lot is not a happy one. I subscribe most heartily to that sentiment. I would like you to hear Chief Inspector Purcell's report to me, just as he gave it, in my office. Well, Purcell, I said, did you find our Mr. Stanley Russell all right? Uh, not there. Well, you've left men to wait for him, haven't you? Sir, I got the address of the place. Sergeant Hatton and I drove there in a yard car driven by Constable oh, Small. Oh, get on with it, man. The whole bloody place was gone, sir. Gone? The whole bloody block was destroyed. Destroyed by an enemy bomb in an air raid six months ago. One day after Russell moved in. Not one person in the whole building's been heard of since. Oh, sir, I respectfully request permission to go somewhere and get howling drunk. You know, Purcell, I think I'll go with you. But we didn't. We sat quietly in Commander Bird's office and thought long, dark thoughts. After a while, Keith Briggs, the pathologist... Observing the light inside, stopped by, and almost at the same time, John Davidson from the Black Museum came in to see what was up. <laughs> Nothing's up, John, I said. On the contrary. What happened? Purcell was just telling Keith here. The chap is a blitz casualty. Did? And may God have mercy on his soul. Mm, I'd rather hope to hear a bloke in a black cap say that, Keith. I thought we had him, dead to rights. Oh, don't be so bloody American. I think we could have proved it. He strangled her, then hid her body in the vault, took a handbag to Guildford and lost it in the post office there. Cleverly putting Scotland Yard off the scent. Timing was a little bad. And then when the Blitz came... Tried quicklime first, didn't work. Blitz came, and he set her afire. If, if he'd been a better fire watcher and not... Hiding in a hole somewhere, he'd have known there was no fire that night. Oh, but he wasn't a good fire watcher. He wasn't good at anything. I wonder... I wonder uh, what, John? What do you mean, John? Well, <clears throat> if I'd strangled my wife and burned her up, which God forbid, because I hadn't one, <laughs> I'd be very happy to have people think I was dead. <laughs> if I'd hear that my home was destroyed and everybody in it dead, I should be delighted. Most delighted. I'd change my name. Not in wartime, you no, wouldn't. No, that's not. right. Identity cards and ration books. Absolutely. I'd forgotten. Getting new ones in the name of Harry Hawkins or Sam Small <laughs> no, would be no, difficult. No, <laughs> but even Scotland Yard would stop looking for me if they thought I was dead. Wouldn't they, Commander Bird? And you'd go around buying new clothing and whatnot, if you could, and presenting your own ration book in your own name and... Where are you going, Purcell? I'm going to stagger home through the blackout, sir, with your permission. I've a large number of men's clothing stores to interview beginning tomorrow, and I'd like to get a good night's sleep. Good night, all. The Stanley Russell crop was enormous. 
Chief Inspector Purcell discovered that 200... Let me see. 234 of them had purchased clothing since the date our Stanley Russell had been reported dead by enemy action. But not one of them was the Stanley Russell we wanted. We made thorough inquiries of all his known acquaintances, all to no avail. The war office had no record of our man. We were reluctantly forced to the conclusion that he was dead, or that he had heard of our search for him and gone to ground most effectively, as I said to a rather haggard Purcell. Purcell shook his head. Ah, uh, I'd like to keep on looking, sir, if I may. I have a hunch that he'll turn up unexpectedly. It will certainly be unexpected so far as I'm concerned. I'd like to keep on trying, sir. Well, for a few weeks more, but I'm afraid... Commander Bird speaking. Yes, he's here. It's for you, Purcell. Well, I'll, I'll take it outside, sir. No, you... don't. Take it here. Thank you, sir. Chief Inspector Purcell here... Who is he? Oh? Well, I, I, I don't know him personally, but I know of him. Yes. Will you ask him to wait a moment? I'll ring you back. Sir. Yeah? I've never been so shocked in all my life. Oh, really? What's happened? Somebody dead? Somebody's alive. What? If I'd heard this on the radio, I wouldn't have believed it. Well, what's happened? Mr. Stanley Russell is calling on us. Well, Brother Purcell, let him enter and be received in due form. <laughs> Will you show Mr. Stanley Russell in, please? Thank you. <laughs> you sound like a spider, Purcell. Thank you, sir. I feel I am. And a chair for our guest. <laughs> you think I sound like a spider? Come, Come in. Stanley Russell, sir. Good morning, gentlemen. I, I was looking for Inspector Purcell. Come in, sir. I'm Chief Inspector Purcell. How do you do, sir? And this is Commander Bird. Good morning. Good morning, sir. May I sit down? Thank you. Does one smoke in here? Yes, by all means. Will you... Will you try an Abdullah? A tar. I'm afraid I always smoke woodbines. Now, I hear Scotland Yard is looking for me. That's, uh, <clears throat> that's true. Why, may I ask? You've been extremely hard to find. Oh, I've been in the country. Derbyshire. We should have come there eventually. Oh, I've saved you the trouble. What do you want to see me about? You were a fire watcher, Mr. Russell, in Kennington. Yes. There was an unreported fire at the Baptist Chapel there whilst you were on duty. When? Two nights after the raid that destroyed the chapel. I didn't see any fire. Is that all you wanted? No, Mr. Russell. Well, I don't recall any fire, sir. You didn't see or hear the fire brigade? No, sir. Near 11 o'clock? Oh. <laughs> well, <laughs> I must admit I wasn't there. Where were you? I did see the fire brigade moving away when I came back, but... Where were you? Oh, I was out of cigarettes, and I strolled around the corner to see if I could borrow one or two from the fire watcher at post four. He says he never saw you, Mr. Russell. Oh, he's probably forgotten. It's a long time ago. He will swear he didn't see you that night. Well, <laughs> the fire obviously didn't do any damage. A woman was burned to death in it. Murdered? Do you know anything about her? Of course not. I, I'm very sorry to hear that anything like that... The woman was your wife. May I have one of your cigarettes, please? Thanks. So that's what became of her. Do you know anything about it? I'm afraid I must disappoint you, gentlemen. I wasn't on very good terms with her. We know that. I'm afraid I have no tears for her. She was... Oh, well, she's dead now. I shan't say anything. Naturally, I'm shocked, Naturally. but I'm afraid I'm not sorry. Do you know anyone who would have had a motive for murdering her? <laughs> you had a motive, didn't you, Mr. Russell? <laughs> I can see how you might think so, but I didn't murder her, I assure you. When did you last see her? I don't really remember. 
several months before she was murdered, I think. How do you know she was murdered? Why, why you said so. Did I? Oh, I would have had good cause to, Inspector, but I'd have been a fool to do it now, wouldn't I? Yes. Well, Mr. Russell, thank you for coming to see us. If there is anything else you remember, please come back and see us again. I think that's all for now. How can we find you if we need you? We may want your corroboration of certain facts. Well, I'll write down my address, sir. It's a sad affair, and you have our sympathy. Thank you, sir. I admit I'm terribly shocked. Of course. Well, here's the address and telephone number, sir. Thank you. Feel free to call on us at any time. Goodbye. Well, good goodbye, gentlemen. I was merely trying to do my duty. Oh, you've done it admirably, sir. Goodbye. Well, thank you. Well, he's a liar. I know it. May I ask why you... Why I let him go? <laughs> he thinks he's got us completely fooled. He'll be back with more helpful information. Come in, Mr. Russell. Uh, I, I just That's remembered beyond. something that might be of importance. Uh, come in. I remembered that an old straw pelleus, uh, a mattress I used to catch 40 winks on... It was stolen about that time. Mm -hmm. Could that have been used to stop the fire? Did you find it? Yes, we found it. Oh, that's good. Well, I, I must go now. Oh, by the way, was the body destroyed? By the quicklime? Yes. What's the matter? You are a very clever man, Mr. Russell. Much too clever for your own good. Why? Why, may I ask? No one had mentioned quicklime, except you. Well, I thought... I mean... I, I didn't... I wasn't even there. I, I tell you, I didn't touch her. I said you were much too clever for your own good. You... You think I... I didn't strangle her. Go ahead, Chief Inspector. Stand no. Stanley Russell, I arrest you on the charge of willful no, murder. I didn't do it. And I, I warn you that whatever no, you no, say will be taken no, down in writing no. and may be given in evidence. The crime. The painstaking evidence Scotland Yard had collected, together with Stanley Russell's own statements, were sufficient to convince a jury that he had murdered his wife, Hope Russell, and burned her body. All his allegations of misconduct on her part were proved completely false. It was demonstrated at the trial that he had planned the murder for a long time and having found a convenient time and place, had committed it. The verdict. My lord, we, the jury, find the defendant guilty of willful murder. The sentence. Prisoner at the bar, stand up. It is the sentence of this court that you be hanged by the neck until dead. And may God have mercy on your soul. You have heard the true story of case number 397MR381 from the files of Scotland Yard. The names of the participants have, for obvious reasons, been changed. Starting next week, Whitehall 1212 will be heard at a new time, 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Research by Percy Hoskins of the London Daily Express. Stories for radio written and directed by Willis Cooper. Next, listen for Tales of the Texas Rangers on NBC. Whitehall 1212. Quickly, please. This is Scotland Yard. <laughs> For the first time, Scotland Yard opens its secret files to bring you the authentic, true stories of some of its most baffling cases. These accurate records are drawn from the actual files of Scotland Yard. They're true in every respect, except for the names of the participants, which for obvious reasons have been changed. Research on this exclusive series has been done by Percy Hoskins, chief crime reporter of the London Daily Express. The stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper. Some of the participants... Donald Rhodes, Chief Security Officer of Heathrow Airport and a former Scotland Yard man.
It was a considerable responsibility. Detective Sergeant Vivian Morris of Scotland Yard. I am a suburban housewife. Chief Inspector Robert Sheehan of Scotland Yard's Flying Squad. Step into the Black Museum here with me. I should like to show you something. John? Oh, is that you, Sheehan? Yes, I brought some friends to see you. Yeah, I'll be with you at once. Oh. Good afternoon. This is Chief Superintendent John Davidson, curator of Scotland Yard's Black Museum. Oh, how do you do? Well, I expect you've come about the relics of the Heath Row affair. All right. Oh, on the table there behind you. All we have. Oh, good. Yes, this one I recognize. Iron bar used by criminals in Heath Row affair. <laughs> some of my hair still sticking to it. Yes, yeah, some of your blood too, Bob. Makes my head ache yet. Uh, this is a uh, briefcase carried by the GOC. And here, <coughs> alterable license plate used by the GOC gang. You see, it reads GMU 436. Press the lever, please, John. And hey, presto. It reads CGC 829. Very neat, isn't it? You, of course, don't have the most important souvenir at all here, John. What's that? The half million pound sterling. I think that I should tell you a little about our flying squad. It consists of a large number of motor cars, all wireless equipped, all very fast, and all kept constantly in superb condition. The flying squad is on duty 24 hours a day, a highly mobile force, available on extremely short notice at any point in the entire London area. The members of the flying squad are hand-picked, and they're very unusual men. These three are typical. This is Detective Sergeant Nobby Clark of the flying squad. Yes, sir. I, I was one of Lord Lewis' commandos. I was at Norwich. Oh, yes, and at Dieppe. Former leading petty officer Dusty Miller of HMS Phoebe. I am 29 years old. I am six foot two, and I weigh 14 stone eight. I was welterweight champion of my ship. The light throws a feeling. Detective Sergeant Ray Lawton, the Canadian. I, I'm about the, uh, the only policeman you ever heard of who was once a lion tamer. Uh, in a circus. Like all policemen in Britain, we seldom carry arms. Although I assure you we're quite able to use them effectively should the occasion demand them. British policemen rely on the weapons provided by nature, augmented occasionally, of course, by the issue of stout truncheons or rubber caches, which I understand the Americans call black jacks, and which are wondrously effective. Our job, you see, is not to shoot criminals, but to bring them to justice, or, if possible, to prevent their depredations. We find our methods rather effective. Well, in June 1948... The great new London airport, London had long since outgrown the famous old Croydon airdrome, was operating at capacity, although it was still far from completion. My old friend Donald Rhodes, a veteran Scotland Yard man who was chief security officer at Heathrow, came to call on me at the yard. Can't stay away from the old home place, can you, Donald? I asked. I always know where to come for help, Bob. What's the matter? You know the GOC? General officer commanding what? Ancient and honorable brigade of robbers. Oh, Moriarty? Moriarty, Townsend, Inns, Hughes, West, Simmons. Brown, Bennett, <laughs> dozens of names. Yes, I know him. Or know of him, I should say. Big operator. Biggest. Well, his recce people have been looking us over. What's he after? A nice new airplane for himself? Gold. At Heathrow? We transship thousands of pounds in gold, you know. International affairs. Planes fly in dripping with the stuff. Leave it overnight with us and... Uh, Leave it lying about? We keep it as short a time as possible in our bonded warehouse under guard. Strongest safes in the country. Guarded, of course. <laughs> Try and get past them. Much gold? Plane load at a time. How is he going to do it? Tanks or something at dawn? Oh, he'll be much more clever than that. He always has been. That's why he isn't sewing mailbags at Dartmoor today. How'd you get on to all this? I brought the chap along, one of my mechanics. Like to talk to him? Naturally. Come in, will you, Karen? Yes, sir. This is 
Former Lieutenant John Carn of the Royal Tank Regiment, Bob. Good afternoon, sir. Sit down, Mr. Kern. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, tell Chief Inspector Sheehan about it, will you please, Kern? Well, sir, I've been with Mr. Rhodes for quite some time. The day before yesterday, I received a telephone call from an acquaintance of mine named Edward Mybridge. Where did you know this Mybridge before? We were in prison together, sir. Prison? Well, Mr. Hitler's off flag, 18 in the war. Oh, German prison camp. Yes, sir. I hadn't seen him since we were demobbed and we had a drink together. Oh, let's not waste any time, please, Colonel. Oh, no, sir. Well, he telephoned me again yesterday, sir, and... and... You had another drink? Right, sir. He asked me how I'd like to make a lot of money and whiskey, and I said, fine. I asked how. He said, passing on some information about Heathrow, how it was run, and the guards, and all that. What sort of looking chap was he? Red hair, squint eye, limps on right leg. Sound familiar to you, Bob? Not as what you call him, Colonel. Edward Mybridge, sir? His name's Ginger Johnson in our books. Unmistakable. He's not a nice fellow at all, Kern. I found that out, sir. Oh? He warned me to say nothing to anyone about our conversation or he'd have to take steps. I remembered what he did to a German prison guard the day we were released, sir. What? Cut his head off with a mess knife. A very hard character indeed, this Edward Mybridge, alias Ginger Johnson... An old Borstal boy. He had served honorably in the army, but had returned to his old ways immediately upon demobilization. He was well known to us as one of the GOC's most useful lieutenants. This GOC, a man of great mental attainments, we knew for the leader of one of the most desperate gangs of lawbreakers in all our experience. A genuine storybook mastermind. He had for many years operated like a real general officer commanding, maintaining a small staff of rough-and-ready assistants like Mybridge, and recruiting his actual operatives, his army, for specific jobs as he needed them. Scotland Yard had never been able to lay a finger on him, although he was quite well known to us under a variety of names and ostensible professions. It was obvious that this was to be no small undertaking. He needed to be watched, and thoroughly... And beginning at once. I telegraphed a chief inspector I remembered in a Scottish town not far from Perth, and he reported to me at Scotland Yard the next day. I finished my briefing on what he had to do for us. Walk, oh, I'll recognize him all right, sir. You have a lot of pictures of him. I wish we had him. I'm not to arrest him, sir. You'll not have a chance. He's a most law abiding man. Now, he's never seen you in his life. And you understand, I don't want him to see you. Okay, sir. I'll want to know everywhere he goes, everyone he talks to. Aye, sir. Don't telephone in. Stay with him till you see him home in the evening. Then come in and report. Okay, sir. And good luck. You'll need it. Oh, I'm a very ordinary looking man, sir. He'll never see me. Chief Inspector Ross was back in my office in two hours. Uh, <clears throat> Well? He, uh... I was standing on the corner, sir, waiting for the bus with him. And just as it stopped, he turned to me and said, It's all right, Chief Inspector Andrew Ross. You can go back to Perthshire. I'm just going to my bank this time. A detective constable we imported from Leeds who looked like a clergyman was addressed pittingly by name by the GOC who trod on our man's toes. The language he employed was quite unclerical. The law, of course, does not permit tapping a suspected man's telephone, so we were forced to continue to try to trail him to find out precisely what he was doing. But infallibly, he recognized our people. Rhodes kept hounding us. He couldn't organize his plan to defend the airport until he knew more of the GOC's probable intentions. And the man outwitted us at every turn. There came a morning ten days or so later when I saw Vivian Morris, one of our women detective sergeants, pass my open door. Oh, uh, Sergeant, I called. Good morning, sir. Come in here a moment, will you? Uh, yes, sir. Vivian. Yes, sir. You're a very pretty girl. Why, thank you, sir. Have you ever followed a man? <laughs> Report of Detective Sergeant Vivian C. Morris to Chief Inspector Sheehan at Scotland Yard. I don't think he recognized me, sir. You look like a young suburban mother, Vivian. I am. I've got two girls. I shall send them each a hair ribbon. What happened? 
Well, I got on his bus one street after him. There was no seat, but I spotted him at once. He was staring about the bus, looking for one of us. And we were not there. All at once, he leaped to his feet and offered me his seat. The very mirror of politeness. Yes. Then he rushed to the door, leered at a perfectly innocent man in a Homburg hat, and leapt off the bus almost before it had stopped. I couldn't follow, of course. Naturally. But tomorrow is another day. Report of Detective Sergeant Morris, the second day. Yes, sir. He stayed on the bus this time. I had my knitting with me. I'm doing a pair of tartan stockings for Sheila for her birthday. He didn't pay the slightest attention to me. He got off at Waterloo Station with most of the others on the bus, including myself. He went into a small tobacconist shop. Here's the address, sir. Thank you. He was wearing a dark blue coat and a bowler hat and carried a small briefcase. I went into a Lyons Corner house. You know the one, sir. Where I could watch the door of the tobacconist. I had three buns and three cups of coffee before he came out again. This time wearing a brown tweed suit and hat and without the briefcase. He looked about him sharply and hailed a taxi cab and they drove off. The number of the taxi cab was EBC 414. Thank you, Sergeant. Most well done. Would you just shove me the telephone, please? Thank you. There's an urgent telephone call waiting for you, sir. Who is it? Inspector Green of Traffic, sir. What does he want? He said it's quite important. All right, put him on. Yes, Green? Uh, Green, yes, Shane. See, I hear you're interested in Ginger Johnson. What about him? He's dead. I refuse to burst into tears. He was apparently struck by a motor car. Where? On the Great West Road near the New Heathrow Airport. Oh, was he killed instantly? Well, he lived only a few minutes after we picked him up. Well, he's out of our hair. Oh, uh, did he say anything? Uh, uh, just a sec. What must he say? He's a token. Oh, uh, say, perhaps you'd know what he was talking about. What did he say? He said, tell Karen not to drink the tea. It's poison. <laughs> Sounds quite Max Romerish, doesn't it? <laughs> You're sure he said, tell Karen? Did he say Karen? Yeah, yeah that's right, Karen. Say, mm. I don't know any Karen. Quite all right, old boy. I do. Oh, uh, thank you very much. I hung up on him. Is there anything I can do to help, sir? Yes, go out and get someone started on tracing that taxi cab at once, please. Here, take the paper with a number on it. Right, sir. Will you put me through to Heathrow Airport at once, Chief Security Officer? Oh, good, you're here, Bob. Oh, Donald, I was just telephoning you. Never mind, officer, he's just come in. Look, Don, what about Colonel the T? Eh? Ginger Johnson just got killed. His dying words were to tell your man, Kern, not to drink the tea because it's poisoned. Tea? What's it mean? I think he was off his rocker. Thought he was still in the German prison camp. Could be. What I came over for, I have a signal from the foreign office. The Americans are sending us some money soon. Much? Mere 388,000 pounds in gold. When? Ten days from today. Wonder if that's what the GOC is getting his sights on. A great many people knew that we were expecting a large amount of gold from America. He has a long nose. That long, do you suppose? You had a great deal of experience with him while you were here at the yard. I wonder. Oh, excuse me, sir. Uh, come in, Vivian. You know Sergeant Morris, don't you, Donald? Indeed, I do. How are the girls, Vivian? They're fine, sir. Excuse me, sir. Uh, they're checking the taxi driver, sir. They'll telephone you. Good. You can go home now, if you like. You want to try again tomorrow? Of course, sir. Good girl. Good night. Good night, sir. Good night, Mr. Rowe. Good night. What's... what's she doing? She's caught up with the GOC. Find out anything good? Shortly. Look, we'll have to get going on this thing at once. If it is the, ship, the new shipment he's after. I know it. There's not much we can do until we have an idea how he intends to try Pity Ginger Johnson died. He might have told us instead of babbling about poison tea in German prison. She in here? Shattinger here, sir. In the 999 room. Yes, Shattinger. And all the good luck on tracing that taxi cab, sir. Found the driver had just come into the company garage. Had his trip book with him. Good. The uh, trip at 10.23 this morning was from Waterloo Station to a shop in Sowell. A chemist shop. Sir. A chemist shop? Yes, sir. The taxi driver said he saw his fare enter the shop. George Schill, chemist, he said. It. George Schill, I know that name. What George about George Schill? George Schill has been involved in a number of narcotics cases. Yes, I know. Thank you very much. 
What about George Hill? That's who the GOC was visiting this morning. Is he in the narcotics thing, too? We shall find out, old boy. I wonder where he went from there. Probably to bump off Ginger Johnson. Bump him off? Now tell me why he should do that. Well, good old Ginger might have been looking on the wine when it was red. Bible, old chap. Or the whiskey when it was amber. And blabbered about his talk with your man, Kern. The GOC wouldn't like that, would he? He wouldn't know whether Kern had talked to you. And he might have decided to prevent any more talk by Ginger to the wrong bloke. Ah, a little fantastic. But plausible. Where'd they find Ginger? Uncomfortably close to your precious airport on the Great West Road. Ah. Yes. Put me through to Superintendent Trevelyan. Is that you, Trevelyan? She in here. Look, sir, I'd like to have a detail of men at once on an investigating job. Yes, sir, most important. I'd like to have a check made at once of all houses along Great West Road near the new Heath Airport. I'll direct them if you like. Eh? Oh, thanks, Donald. Mr. Rhodes, the chief security officer at the airport, will help them out. I'm looking for a house that has uh, a recent lodger check the houses that overlook the airport first. Please, for a lodger that did not return this evening. Here's the description. Tall, red-haired, has a squint eye and a gimpy right leg. Got it, sir? Thank you. Yes, sir, I'll get a search warrant and come at once when they find him. Thank you very much. They can telephone me at home if they find the place out of hours. Right. A few minutes after midnight, I was awakened by a telephone call from one of the men of Superintendent Trevelyan's squad. After some difficulty in obtaining a search warrant at that time of night, I proceeded to the house in which he had telephoned. The house was almost directly across the road from the main gate of the airport. Donald Rhodes, who was awaiting my arrival, accompanied me upstairs to the former lodger's room, which provided an excellent view of the airport from its single window. The householder turned on the lights and left us. The room was quite neat. There's, uh, there's a chair by the window. Yes. Turn towards the window. Cushions rumpled quite a bit. Somebody's been sitting on it a lot. Here's an officer's musette bag in the closet. Have a look. That's his, all right. See? E. Mybridge, Lieutenant, King's Royal Rifle Corps. It's a good regiment. He's a good soldier, I expect. Here's a drawer on the table. Ah. What? E. Leis, Wetzler. Good pair of glasses, these German officers. 10x30. He was spying. That's this. What's this? Royal Coral Signals Field Message Pad. Or his reports to the GOC, eh? <laughs> Quite regimental. Been using it, too. Good. What? Writing on the sheet he just tore out left an impression on the second sheet. Let's see. Hold up the lamp there, Donald. Mm -hmm. No, hold it so the light comes across the page from the edge so it casts a shadow on the ridges of the writing here. Hmm? Really? Hold the lamp still. See to guards at... at what's this word? Looks... Looks like midnight. What guards will he see to midnight? Makes no sense. Let me look again. No, that isn't C. Here. No. Looks like... I know what it is. What? T. T. T to guards at midnight. I don't... What was it Ginger said to tell Curran? Don't drink the tea. It's poisoned. It was the custom at that time for a local tea shop to send a man with a tricycle around the airport every night with a huge container of hot tea. It was a familiar sight to everyone on the field, and the sound of his funny little French taxi horn was the signal for everyone to have his tuppence ready for his tin cup of the stuff. The GOC's plan was obvious. If that tea were poisoned, then if they all drank it, and if half a million pounds in gold lay unguarded with a dead man at the gate, a, a most diabolical scheme. Nevertheless, a feasible one, by the GOC's reckoning. But he had overlooked some factors in his reckoning. 
One factor he'd overlooked was a rough, tough man's aversion to poisoning a wartime friend. The other was the flying squad. I sent men the following morning to all parts of London on a search for certain men whom we knew to have worked for the GOC before. A number of them were in prison. But we discovered that 11 of them had been mysteriously disappeared. They, we reasoned, had been mobilized by the GOC for final briefing and held in readiness for the attack. The GOC himself had left for parts unknown. He reappeared only once, and Vivian Morris reported that he had made a most curious purchase. Six pairs of nylon stockings, the largest sizes available. We knew something of the GOC's plans. This was our final briefing in the Flying Squad's garage. Repeat your instructions, Nobby Clark. I'm to drive the seal lorry that picks up all the guards and takes them to the shelter. I drop off a Flying Squad man for everyone I pick up. The Flying Squad men are to be dressed in BOAC uniforms like those the guards wear. Each will be armed with a truncheon or a rubber cough. At the shelter, I'm to tell the guards I pick up what is going on. Right. Detective Sergeant Norton, what do you do? Lion tamer. I'm in charge of the flying squad men that will be planted in the bonded warehouse where the money is. And you, Dr. Miller? I'd like to be with Lion tamer. What's your job? Oh, uh, I'm in general charge of the cars. So I was welterweight champion. We'll save one of them for you, Dusty. Say to it, Martin. All right, Dusty. Now remember, not a man must touch the tea. Oh, no, no chance. Not that poison had hurt any of you, but <laughs> I... I shall need it for evidence. Well, couldn't we offer them a drink, sir? Donald? Look, it's my airport and it's my responsibility. What do you do? I just sit in that bloody little shelter by the telephone, and when they're all inside, I'm to lift the receiver. Good. And the sergeant from the 999 room? Constable Lloyd, sir. I want to watch the special switchboard for it to light up when Mr. Rhodes lifts the receiver. And then? Then at once I'm to shout into my wireless microphone one word. Well? Go. Where's Dusty Miller? Oh, then I bellow yoinks and the cars with the rest of us converge on every entrance to the airport. Render such assistance as might be necessary. None will be necessary, Dusty. And Lawton, when do you start operations? Not till they start to open the safe, sir. Then what? Then we smite them hip and thigh, sir. Carry them all off to the pokey. To the what? Oh, sorry, sir, that's Canadian. Uh, to the bowels of the vast time. And when you're done, boys, Heathrow will supply beer for all. A bottle of pigs! <laughs> beer and bandages, boys. The day came. The airplane from America arrived with the gold. It was transferred under heavy guard to the bonded warehouse. Donald Rhodes supervised that himself. I joined the guard at the gatehouse of the airport about 11 that evening. It was very quiet. That'll be Clark, taking our men around and picking up the regular guards. Very lonely and very quiet. Maybe they're not come, I thought. I borrowed a cigarette from the gate guard, but I crushed it out. They mustn't know there's anybody here besides you, I told him. That's right, sir. Squidge down on the floor. I waited. That was Nobby, taking the regular guards to the shed. I... Who's that? Mark David, sir. Yes? Clark here. Tell Mr. Sheehan I've picked up all the guards and our people are waiting. Yes, it was... I heard him. <laughs> Just in time, sir. Here comes the tea. The man with the tricycle came up and stopped. Hello, Herbert. Hello, James. I thought I was going to be late. How come? Hey, got your tin cup? Here. Yeah. Some guard or somebody stopped me down the road a bit and demanded what I was doing. Made me open up the tea and let him look at it. Got all cold, I'm afraid, him staring at it. All right, Thomas, please. Right. Go on in. The guard brought in the tea, which we set on the floor to keep as evidence. <laughs> The driver came back with the empty container and went on about his business. The guard and I crouched on the floor of the little hut, waiting. Only the sound of a belated airplane or two broke the silence. It was half an hour later when we heard the sound of a lorry. I crawled under the table. The guard lay back in his chair, motionless. 
The lorry stopped at the gate and a man got out. He looked in our window. Here's one of them now. I stood up cautiously. The lorry moved straight to the bonded warehouse and stopped. We heard them at the door. We kept quiet in the dim light. The door opened. I watched through a crack in the sheltered door. My hand on the telephone to the 999 room. We sat in our cars, motors running, hidden at the road junctions all around the airport. My eyes began to hurt, watching that switchboard. I said to the guards in the shed, now mind you, not a sound. I could see the shadow of figures clustering about the door to the bonded warehouse. A man whispered in my ear. What have they got on their heads? They look like ruddy elephants. They had women's stockings on for masks. It sure looked weird with their legs hanging down over their faces. I hope the GOC is with them, I thought. The last one entered. I picked up the receiver. There it is. Go, you sods, go. Come on, the flying squad. They're at the safe. I saw a man running towards me. He tore the stocking from his head and I leaped out the door at him. Stop! Stop, I yell, stop! I'm Inspector Shield! When I came to an hour later, I discovered the grandfather of all bumps on my head from the loaded cosh the man had caressed me with. My men of the flying squad stood about, many of them bandaged to the eyes, but all happily quaffing beer. We totted up the score. Eleven prisoners, including the one who had struck me and whom the gate guard had taken care of. Two broken arms, one smashed nose, and a turned ankle. A pile of heavy coshes and short iron bars the robbers had carried. And the 388,000 pounds still untouched. The prisoners bore a large variety of contusions, black eyes, and broken heads. I, uh, I had a headache for a week. We never did catch the GOC, but we sent 11 of his men to prison, having caught them red-handed. And to this day, no one has ever dreamed of robbing Heathrow again. If they do, sir, may I have a chance at them, too? <laughs> another true story from the files of Scotland Yard. Only the names were, for obvious reasons, changed. Research for Whitehall 1212 is done by Percy Hoskins of the London Daily Express. The stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper. Listen again for Whitehall 1212 two weeks from today and weekly thereafter. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Whitehall, one, two, one, two, quickly. This is Scotland Yard. For the first time, Scotland Yard opens its secret files to bring you the authentic stories of some of its most baffling cases. These accurate dramatizations, which are presented exclusively by NBC, are drawn from the official files of Scotland Yard. They're true pictures of the operations of the world's most famous crime detection organization. Only the names of the participants have, for obvious reasons, been changed. 
The research is prepared by Percy Hoskins, chief crime reporter of the London Daily Express. And the stories for radio, which are performed by an all-British cast, are written and directed by Willis Cooper. Here are the principal participants in case number 108-MR-131. Two of these persons have been hanged for murder. Private Eric Slade, 22, of the Royal Army Ordnance Corps. I was a bomb disposal man. Gladys Brown, who wanted to be a dancer. I'm not so awfully bad looking, am I? Melanie Rodier, 20, a French war refugee. Je suis un pauvre, je suis Paris. Charles Brooks, 31, taxi cab driver. It was a brand new American Plymouth, a grey one, model 1941. Inspector Stuart Wilcox of Scotland Yard. Which of those four voices sounds guilty to you? This lower ground floor corridor in which we're standing leads to Scotland Yard's Black Museum. Come down there with me. I, I'd like you to see an actual souvenir of an actual murder. This is the Black Museum. Oh, good afternoon, Wilcox. Good afternoon, sir. This is Chief Superintendent John Davidson, curator of the Black Museum. Well, how do you do? I expect you've never seen a place like this before. Look about, if you like. Now, the items we have here have all served in some way in the commission of a crime. Here's the bullet from a murderer's gun. This is the linen duster in which the body of a murder victim was wrapped. This, well, now, this is what you came to see. The one thing remaining from our murder case, number 108-MR-131. Uh, that was what you wished to see, wasn't it, Wilcox? Yes, yes, please. A rather expensive silver cigarette case. Initial. Somewhat tarnished today. It was once quite good looking, wasn't it, Wilcox? Yes, it was. I'll tell you how it came here to the Black Museum. A man died for it. Yeah, two men died for it, Wilcox. Human motives are curious. The compulsion to become a dashing hero that led a simple-minded young shop clerk to join the most dangerous service in the army. The urge to acquire a compelling and seductive personality that led a one-time housemaid into displaying herself as a striptease artiste in a tawdry nightclub in wartime London. Neither of them knew the other's true name. The striptease dancer Gladys Brown called herself... Regina Montmorency. The absent without leave army private Eric Slade introduced himself to the glamour girl as Lieutenant Studs Farrell, erstwhile gangster. He took her for a ride in the huge red-painted bomb disposal squad lorry late one night in 1944. You did like my accent, Lieutenant. Sensational, I thought. Colossal. <laughs> you sound just like Hollywood. What? Hollywood. I said, you sound like Hollywood. No. I was in Hollywood for a little while. Oh, were you really? Over the mob, you know. I've been talking about the Hollywood contract. You have? Oh, yes, of course. Hollywood's always after me. Oh. Such a bore. Well, I like Chicago much better. Were you in Chicago long, studs? Oh, you could bet your bottom dollar on that, sister. Oh, it must have been ever so exciting. I've got a few notches on my gun. Oh, my. I oh, see, I'm no panty waste, my girl. Panty waste? That's what we call uh, a mother's boy in America. Oh, are you in America, and then, Stud? Oh, I lived there a great deal. Really? All over the Middle West. Mm. Chicago, Detroit, Minneapolis, Cicero, uh, Philly, you know, Philadelphia. My. I was a cowboy for a while, too, and a ranch in Ohio. I've been around. Did you have a lot of moles? What, eh? Mold, you know, gun mold. You? Oh, it must be wonderful to be a mold. Ah, it's dangerous. Ah, I love danger. And you get so rich. Well, I've done all right. I should like being a gun mold, really. Really? Hmm. No, I sometimes think I should be a very good one. Although I'm a very good dancer, aren't I? Oh, you are. Peachy. I should think you'd miss pulling jobs. Huh, I've just pulled one. What? Where'd you think I got this lorry? Did you steal it? I reckon I sure did, sister. Studs, darling. Let's pull a job together. 
I'll be your gun, Mall, and we'll... Statement by Melanie Rodier to Inspector Stuart Wilcox in a nursing home at Ealing two days later. My name is Melanie Rodier. I've been in England five years. I lived in Moulin au Bois, which was quite close to Amiens. My home was destroyed by the bush, but I escaped and came here. At 11 o'clock, two nights ago, I was walking down Staines Road on my way to London, very near Runnymede. You were alone, mademoiselle? Yes, I was alone. I was carrying my valise. A large army lorry painted quite gaily in red stubbed, and the man asked me where I was going alone so late at night. Where were you going? I said I was walking to London to catch a train at Paddington to Bristol, where lives my aunt Becquerel. The man told me to get in the lorry, and he would drop me off at Reading, where he was going. He was an officer, and I was not afraid. It would be a great convenience. Were you carrying money? I'm a very poor woman, monsieur. I had all the money I possessed with me. How much? Five shillings, sir. So I was not afraid of being robbed for that little money. But when I started to mount to the seat of the lorry, the girl... Girl? What girl? Was there a girl? She was seated beside the officer, sir. What did she do? She struck me on my head with an iron bar so that I did fall to the road. Ah? What then? I was stunned and... And she and the officer did jump down and hit me, and they robbed me of my five shillings and beat me until I was insensible. Uh, Did you see their faces? Only a little. Mm. I I would not know them again. And then? I did hear the woman say, What shall we do with the body? And I tried to cry out, but she did hit me with her fist. So I do not remember more until I find I am drowning. They threw you into the stream there. The Thames runs quite close to the road. They thought I am dead. Yes, yes. Mm-hmm. Afraid they did. And they have taken all my money and all my clothes. What is to become of me now? We'll find them somewhere. I came to England to escape my enemies. <laughs> It was a matter that should have properly been handled by the county constabulary, of course. A simple assault upon a friendless person, happily not involving murder. But there were other circumstances. First, the fact that the assault had been committed and connived at by a person in the uniform of an officer of His Majesty's forces. Driving a motor vehicle which was obviously an official one. Whoever it was had attempted murder once. They might try it again. And I confess I was unable to forget what the poor little French refugee had said. I came to England to escape my enemies. Detective Sergeant Kevin Moore and I discussed it in my office. Well, if it was a red-painted lorry, sir, it could be only one thing. Bomb disposal people, of course. He's a little out of his territory up there in Runnymede, sir. With a girl at 11 o'clock at night. Well, you didn't ask my opinion, sir. Well, why do you think I called you in? Well, in that case, sir... My opinion is that it was some young ex-schoolboy officer who'd had several dozen drops too much in some bottle club in London. And wandering about, he saw the lorry standing somewhere and, well, pinched it for a lark. A joyride, we used to say. Innocent amusements of the young. Oh, I think so, sir. I doubt that French girl thinks so. Mm. And neither do I. They thought they'd drown the girl for five shillings. Mm. And I furthermore think they'll try it again unless we catch them first. Well, we'll try, sir. I'll get in touch with the bomb disposal people and find out if any officer of theirs was out with one of their lorries that night. Or if one of their lorries had been stolen and one of their officers absent without leave. Yes, sir. That's a good idea. Of course it is. If I'm right, which I probably am, teletype the number of the lorry and the description of the officer to all the police in this area. Yes, sir. And warn everyone who knows about this French girl's case to say nothing about it at all. Especially to the newspapers. Why is that, sir? If they find out they bungled their first try, our friends may become discouraged and abandon their promising career as criminals. We'll never catch them. Oh. It was the next day before I saw Moore again. When he came in to report what he had accomplished, I had news for him, too. I let him speak first. Well, sir, 
I've been in touch with the bomb disposal people. And? Oh, I've had to talk to millions of people, sir. Finally, I found the right ones to give me the reliable information. Yes? There was a lorry stolen, sir. Aha. Uh-huh. Number W14519, an American-made ten-wheel six-by-six. Six. Good. There is no officer missing, sir. Oh. All of them in the London district are accounted for, including one who was blown up trying to unscrew a fuse from a buried blockbuster that's been sizzling for a week in Shepherd's Bush. But there's a private missing, sir. Oh? Uh-huh. Name of, uh... uh Eric Slade, former shop clerk, 22 years old, wears glasses, described as a mild-mannered little man, very quiet, residents when called up, clerk and well, sandy hair... He got a girl. <laughs> His mates say he was terrified of girls, sir. Doesn't drink or smoke. Doesn't seem the type to commit murder or try to, at least, does he? No. How'd a man like that ever get into bomb disposal? Well, believe it or not, sir, he volunteered. <laughs> Of course, he's been on permanent Cook's police ever since. <laughs> <laughs> well, I doubt he's our man, but at least we can help look for the poor little beggar. That is, if they want him back. Now, I've got a bit of news for you. Oh? What's that, sir? Same man that pulled the French girl out of the Thames at Runny Mead telephoned me. Well, what's he want, sir? There's been another attempt at robbery and murder. Attempt? Another girl riding a bicycle, run down by a red-painted lorry. Hmm. A lieutenant, she saw his badges quite plainly. And a red-haired girl jumped out after her. Mm. She ran away, but she did hear the girl call to the lieutenant, addressing him as Studs. Stubbs? Studs! Oh. Now, I want you to see your bomb disposal men and ask them if they have a lieutenant named Studs. Oh, excuse me. Inspector Wilcox. Yes? Well, he's right here. One second. For you. Oh, thank you, sir. Sergeant Moore here. Oh, yes, Sergeant Major. Oh? Where? Oh. Oh, well, thank you. Oh, by the way, do you have any officers named uh, Studs or Stubbs? Or... Studs! Studs. Yes, I'll wait. Who's that? It was the Sergeant Major I talked to, sir. Yes? Oh, none, eh? None at all? Oh, well. Thank you, Sergeant Major. All right. Bye. What was that? I found the stolen lorry, sir, a few minutes ago. They did? And parked all night on a street in Hammersmith in the rain. Which has quite efficiently washed away all fingerprints, studs and his lady friend and all. Yeah. Well, they're right back where we started. Yeah, we're further back than that, sir. How do you mean? Well, they've tried murder twice now, sir. The third time may be the charm. <laughs> The portion of case number 108-MR-131 I'm about to play for you now is reconstructed from the statements made by Eric Slade and Gladys Brown at their trial at Old Bailey three weeks later. I assume it's correct and accurate because it came from their own lips as they were on trial for their lives. They were standing in a darkened doorway, they said, on Hammersmith Broadway late at night. Have I got to walk home, then? Regina... Darling, I've only got ten shillings left. Ten shillings? The big shot gangster, the terror of Chicago and all. He's only got ten shillings. Well, I'll get some more. I'll get it now, gangster. I'm going to ride home. Regina, I can't go back and ask anybody for money. I'm absent without leave. I'm a wanted man. Oh. Would you have to leave that lorry over there on the street? We could have ridden in that. Somebody would recognize the lorry. You know that. Oh, is the big bad gangster afraid, then? You stow that. Oh, you're I'll... not afraid of girls, are you? I said stow it. What kind of bad man you are? Brave enough to rob a poor girl of her five shillings. Five shillings. But when a man comes along, oh, no, not you. Not bloody well you, my darling. Even made me smash the poor thing on the edge. You weren't man enough I'll to. I'll throw her in the water. After I killed Don't her. Don't yell so. Oh, there's no one to hear me. I'm sorry I ever took up with you. I thought you was a man. No, Regina. You won't even step up and stick up a lousy taxi man. Let me walk home in the rain because you've not got that... No, gut. Regina, Don't come please. back on me now. Take your hands off me. And I thought I was going to be your moll. Take your hands off me. You don't love me. Regina, I do love you. Well, then do something about it. Get me some money. If I'm going to be your moll, you've got to support me. Regina. Do you love me, studs, darling? Regina, you know I love you. Look. What? Here comes a taxi cab. 
Stop him. No, I, I don't want to do anything Stop like him. Stop him. Shout at him. He'll have lots of money. No, I don't think... Haven't we done that? Do you love me? Regina. Do you or don't you? Of course I do. You know that. Tapsy! Don't, Regina. Tapsy! Don't. Stop. Here, Tapsy! I don't want you. Now you've got to. Come on in afterwards. Oh, Tapsy! Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir? Stats. Are you... <clears throat> I mean... Driver, we wish to go to the top of King Street. Come on, Stats. Oh, uh, wait a minute, lady. What's the matter? Uh, this isn't a taxi. What? I mean, it's a private hire car. Oh, that's all right. Well, I don't know, lady. Costs a great deal more to ride a private hire car than a plain taxi cab. Am I... Uh, he has the money. Haven't you, dear? How much? Ten shillings. To the top of King Street? Shouldn't cost me more than one and six, your robber. Dad's dear. This is a private hire car, sir. I can charge what I like, you know. I won't pay it. Darling, I want to ride home. You heard what the lady said, mister. It's a filthy night, sir. And there ain't many taxi cabs about. The fare will be ten shillings. Come on, darling. We can afford it. We'll have lots of money later, you know. Come on. Coming, sir? Oh, of course he's coming. Get in, Stunts. Top of King Street, sir? We'll tell you where to stop. Still? We'll wait until we're almost there. Uh, what say, miss? I was talking to my boyfriend. Oh, sorry. I say, you must make lots of money in this business. Oh, we do all right, miss. Hear that? Mm-hmm. Get your pistol out, darling. I've got it. But I don't want to use it. Bloody bad night, ain't it? It is for you. Pardon? I said yes. I hope you don't mind too much about that ten shillings fare, sir. A man's got to make a living, ain't he? <laughs> well, what's so funny, miss? Oh, um, we've got a better way of making money than you have. Haven't we, Stud? Yes, we have. We're gangsters. What? Gangsters, we're gangsters. <laughs> I, I shouldn't laugh, buddy. He was a gangster in Chicago. Yeah. Oh, look here now. Keep your eye on the road map. Hey, look here, mate. I'm not in the mood for your practical jokes. This isn't a joke. Well, stop poking at That's me. That's a revolver he's poking in your neck, buddy. What? A pistol. What do you want? All your money. I'll give you my money. Of course you will. Stop the car. All right. I'll give you my money. Keep. I'll give your hands out of your pockets. What are you going to do? Shut up. All right, Regina, move to one side. What are you going to do? That's, you don't have to... You shut up! <laughs> Get to one side. Now, look here, friend, I... I'll show you how I deal with rats. <laughs> now, say your no, prayers, you rats. Don't! Don't! He's seen us and he'll turn us in. I've got him. No, no, one, no. One, two... <laughs> Message from J Division, Metropolitan Police, to Inspector Stuart Wilcox the following morning. Yes, sir. In a ditch, alongside the top of King's Road. Shot twice through the head. The parents they dumped in the ditch late last night. Yes, sir. Robbery was apparently the murder. His pockets were all empty. Tire marks on the roadway, very faint in the rain, as if a car had been stopped there. Body's been taken to the mortuary in Horse Ferry Road. That's all we have, sir. The body of the unfortunate victim lay in the mortuary for three days without identification. Although it was obviously murder and we had no single clue to go upon, we were not idle. A detail from Scotland Yard had been hurried out to the place where the body was found, immediately upon receipt of the message from J Division. With great difficulty, they had succeeded in making a plaster cast of the faint tire marks, and the laboratory was able to establish with some accuracy the fact that the tires were identical with those on the model 1941 Plymouth. Beyond that, there was nothing. Until a Mrs. Charles Brooks of Hammersmith identified the body as that of her missing husband, a private hire car driver. I spoke to Kevin Moore about it. Something extremely suspicious keeps occurring in this thing, Kevin. And I lay you thruppence. I'm thinking about the same thing, sir. Hammersmith? Right, sir. 
We found the lorry parked in a Hammersmith street first. And the dead taxi driver lived in Hammersmith. And the place they found the body was at the junction of King's Road and Hammersmith Broadway. You suppose our man Studs lives in Hammersmith? Or perhaps his girlfriend. You think it was them, sir? I don't know, Kevin. But when we get a series of coincidences like this... Well, it's the only symptom of a lead we have. Let's follow it through. Now, you suppose they've got that car? Oh, it'll be easy enough to find, sir. We've got the number and description of it from the man's wife. Mm Mm-hmm. Here it is. Gray Plymouth Saloon, 1941 model. License number GKP401. About 2,300 miles on the speedometer. I'd be an awful fool to drive it about town. I have an idea. He is a fool. Come in. Uh, I'm from the detail that was uh, searching the pawn shop, sir. Oh, oh, oh. Do come in. Did you find anything? Yes, sir. Yes. Cigarette case. Pawned at a shop in Soho, sir. It's Brooks, all right. See his initials inside here? C E B. Christmas, 1939. You're on the list Mrs. Brooks gave us, sir. Quiet. Did you find out who pawned it? Yes, sir. A young man in the uniform of the ROC. Officer? Uh, private, sir. Name? Private S. Farrell, sir. That's a new one. Sir, I know something. What? That's our studs. How do you know? Well, look, sir, I, I, I read a book once. Well, it was an American book, sir, and it was written by a man named Farrell. This man's not an American. No, sir, but maybe he read the same book and remembered. Um, let's try this all over again, old chap. Sir, the name of the book, which was all about Chicago in America, was Studs, uh, Stud something or other. Anyway, he was a very tough young man. Ah. Uh... Well, maybe our man's read the same book. Well, now, sir, this is a typical Chicago style affair, isn't it? And you were talking of coincidences. Our man Studs is the murderer, all right. You see. Well, then, I'll tell you what you do, Kevin. What, sir? You go find Mr. Studs Farrell, the amateur Chicago gangster, for me, will you? Well, I'll try, sir, but he's not an amateur any longer. He's turned professional. Wireless communication between Scotland Yard's 999 room and a patrol car two nights later. J23 calling MG2W. J23 calling MG2W. J23 calling MG2W. Over. MG2W to J23. Over. MG2W. This is J23 near Fulham. The wanted Plymouth saloon car, license number GKP401, has been located. It's parked in a dead end road near here. Over. J23. This is MG2W. Keep car under surveillance. Follow it if it leaves, maintaining communication with me at all times. Send constable to nearest road intersection to guide other cars being dispatched now to scene. Notify us where constable guide is stationed at once. Over. J-23 to MG-2W. Understood. Over and out. A Scotland Yard patrol car with Sergeant Kevin Moore picked me up at my home in less than ten minutes. We proceeded at a good rate of speed to the Fulham district where a constable hopped on the running board and directed us quietly to the scene. We ran without light, stopping at the mouth of the cul-de-sac where the grey Plymouth was parked. We blocked the exit of the dead end with our car and waited. It was very quiet. Half an hour later, Kevin Moore spoke. Oh... Oh, I'm going to get out and stretch my legs. Go on. Careful, though. Don't make any noise. Uh, I think I'll go down and have a look at the car. Be quiet. All right, sir. Moore did not return for several minutes. I called softly to him. Kevin, are you all right? I'm all right, sir. We waited. I was dying for a smoke. Better not smoke, though. Sir. Eh? Somebody coming. I hear him. Coming out of that house there on the right, I think. Yes, sir. Quiet. Hope they don't see Kevin. Getting in the car. Can't get past us, sir. I'm going down there. All right, sir. Turn your spotlight on them as soon as I call out. Yes, sir. Excuse me, sir. Is this your car? 
It most certainly is. I'll have to ask you to keep your hands away from your pockets, sir. Look here. Or I shall most certainly be forced to break your jaw, sir. Turn on your light. <laughs> Susan, Dad. Hold it. Hold it there. <laughs> Miss Colton Yard, men. Good, sir. Now then. What's your name, Lieutenant? My, my, my name is... My name is Lieutenant Studsfell. Oh, don't tell him, don't tell him. Well, sir, I'm Detective Sergeant Moore of Scotland Yard. I must detain you on the suspicion of being involved in the murder of Charles... But it was him. I didn't do it. It was him. Madam, we must detain you on the same charge. I warn you both that anything you say will be taken down in writing and may be used in evidence. You haven't got anything on me. I take it, sir, that you have not read the third and last volume of the Studs Lonigan books, then? No. What's that one, Kevin? It's called Judgment Day, sir. At their trial at Old Bailey a few weeks later, Eric Slade and Gladys Brown fought bitterly over who had been the most guilty. The jury decided. Members of the jury, are you agreed upon your verdict? We are. Do you find the prisoner Gladys Brown, alias Regina Montmorency, guilty or not guilty of murder? Guilty. Do you find the prisoner Eric Slade, alias Studs Farrell, guilty or not guilty of murder? Guilty. You find both prisoners guilty of murder, and that is the verdict of you all? That is the verdict of us all. Prisoners at the bar, you severally stand convicted of murder. Have you or either of you anything to say why the court should not give you judgment of death according to law? And the judge? Gladys Brown and Eric Slade. You have been found guilty after a long and patient trial by a jury of your fellow men of a most brutal murder. I entirely agree with the verdict at which they have arrived. There is only one sentence which the law of this country allows me to pass upon you and upon each of you. The sentence of this court upon you and upon each of you is that you be taken to a lawful prison and then to a place of execution. That you be there, each of you hanged by the neck until you are dead, and that your bodies respectively be buried within the precincts of the prison in which you shall have been confined before your execution. And may the Lord have mercy upon yourselves. Amen. You have heard the story of case number 108MR131 from the files of Scotland Yard. Only the names have been changed for obvious reasons. Research has been prepared by Percy Hoskins, chief crime reporter of the London Daily Express. The stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Today. 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 Whitehall, one, two, one, two, quickly. This is Scotland Yard. For the first time in history, Scotland Yard opens its secret files to bring you the authentic, true stories of some of its most baffling cases. These are the true stories, the unvarnished facts, just as they occurred, reenacted for you by an all-British cast. Only the names of the participants have, for obvious reasons, been changed. The stories are presented with the full cooperation of Scotland Yard. Research on Whitehall 1212 is prepared by Percy Hoskins, chief crime reporter of the London Daily Express. The stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper. Here are the participants in case number 604-MR-530 from the official files of Scotland Yard. Leo M. Stefanovich, former member of the Polish Navy. Yes, I deserted the Navy. Marian Konieczki, who had fought in Spain. What I am interested in is money. Kazimir Kashuba, <laughs> who was found dead. Albert Stevens, the copper's narc. It's a living... Superintendent Alistair Watkins of Scotland Yard. 
I must warn you that if you expect high adventure in Limehouse or sinister orientals lurking in dark byways, you'd best turn off your wireless now. We're quite ordinary people at Scotland Yard. Professional policemen, catchers of criminals, and we don't go in much for the picturesque, the way we are sometimes pictured. However, if you'd like to see how we proceed upon a case, I'll ask you to step inside our black museum and meet the man in charge of it. Come in. This is Chief Inspector John Davidson, who's in charge here. How do you do? I'm afraid that the so-called Black Museum is neither black nor a museum, nor is it the Grand Guignol. We have here a large number of guns, knives, other weapons which have been used in crimes. We have also disguises, clothing, exhibits of all sorts that have helped in solving many of these crimes. I think you ought to explain, John, why we keep these gruesome relics Yes, indeed. They're here for a purpose quite removed from idle curiosity. They're principally for the use of the men of Scotland Yard in studying crime techniques and exemplars of crime methods. They bring to life the cold words contained in our files and the most useful as well as graphic. For example, in this case, Superintendent Watkins is reenacting for you. Now, this is a bullet that killed a man. It was fired from this gun. 32 caliber warm automatic pistol. And it was Scotland Yard's job to prove that. And this, the top of an ordinary mechanical pencil. This is a very important bit of evidence. Just a cheap little metal pencil. It wasn't cheap for the man who lost it, John. Well, it cost him his life, you see. We were standing in the corner of a saloon bar in Whitechapel, talking. Albert Stevens, the copper's narc, and me. I expect you don't know what a narc is. N-A-R-K. In America, I think you call him a stool pigeon. Every detective in the world has his pet narc. And Albert Stevens was mine. It was an insignificant place we were in, and Albert Stevens, too mild and bitters, had set him talking sixteen to the dozen. I don't suppose you'd know him by sight, sir. But I could tell you how to find them. That is, I've seen them about here and there. It's American cigarettes they're handing now. But they ain't got many left. And when they're sold out of them, they'll try something else. Have you got any ideas of it? No, sir, not yet. But it'll be something big, I'm sure of that. Do they know you, do you suppose? <laughs> Nobody knows it's a taxi driver, sir. They've rode in my cab twice now. And they've never even looked at my face. But hey, I've looked at them. Will you have another mild and better, Albert? Well, I wouldn't say no, sir. Here, miss. Fill this up here, will you, again? Will you? Thank you. They're some kind of foreigners, sir, they are. Uh, thank you, miss. Uh, this I know. They're in the black market up to here. You said that. What kind of foreigners? Mm, I can't understand them much. Except when they talk about, well, what they think is English. Greeks or Spaniards or Russians, I think. All three of them. Oh, they tip quite nice, too. But uh, you're sure they're in the black market? No doubt about it, sir. I hear enough about it. Don't know their names. Well, one is called Marion. Marion? And the other's name is Kashmir. Kashmir. <laughs> Maybe he's an Hindu. And the other is a gentleman in some kind of navy, sir. Not ours. Some foreign navy. He wears a uniform. Who seems to be the boss? Well, I'd say this year, Kashmir is, sir. Coo. He, he's a odd man, he is, sir. Is that all you know about them, then? That's all I know right now, sir. Well, ain't that worth three pints of mild and bitter, sir? Just about, Albert. Well, I was sort of hoping you'd have a spare ten shilling note on you, sir. I have, Albert, but not for you, my lad. When you've something better than a comic trio of foreigners who gibber about American cigarettes, maybe, but not till then. Would you like to buy a magnificent new solid gold mechanical pencil, sir? Here, here, here. A sacrifice for ten shillings. <laughs> Where'd you get it? A lady gave it to me, sir. Now, what say? Say seven and six to you, sir. Come now, Albert. You know that's worth all of ninepence. Ninepence, then, sir? I need the money. Come off it, Albert. Well, then, sir. What? What? 
What did you say if I told you these foreign blokes is murderers? Shouldn't believe a word of it. Oh, they might be, sir. Well, when you can prove it, come round and see me, Albert. Well, don't I get another point, sir? Uh, here, miss. Another of the same for my friend here. Night, Albert. Scotland Yard next morning, I walked leisurely down the long corridor on the second floor that leads to my office. A voice hailed me as, as I opened the door of my office, and I looked back. It was Detective Sergeant Llewellyn, a Welshman who had been a constable at the Water Street Police Station when I was a sergeant. Here was a welcome face. David, I said, I've not seen you in six months. Longer than that, indeed, Superintendent. It's ten months, and I'm very glad to be seeing you. Where have you been? To the army all this time, sir. I was seconded to MI5. Yes, yes, I heard it that. It was tiresome work, but now I'm back. Thanks indeed to the Lord. <laughs> Taking a well-earned rest, I expect. Oh, indeed, goodness, no. There's no rest for the wicked. <laughs> I'm on a case already. Can we have dinner this evening, then? I'm not so sure, sir. What have they given you? Oh, a murder. Good bloody one? I've just seen the man. He's bloody enough, indeed. They found him shot to death in his car early this morning. Where? Chepstow Place, Notting Hill. The constable who found him in his car, parked beside the curb, thought he was taken with drink and sound asleep. <laughs> but it was a thirty-two caliber bullet in the back of his neck and out the front of his head. Very gory. Know who he was? A foreigner, it seems, with the name of Casimir Kersuba. Oh. Whatever's the matter, then? Do you know him? Come on in my room here. I don't know the chap, but I have an idea I know someone who does. Well, indeed, to goodness. Come on in. Come on in while I telephone. I've got his number in my book here. At least a number where I can reach him. Ah, here it is. Whoever is he, superintendent? A chap named Albert Stevens, a narc. Talking to him just last night. Mentioned a chap named Kashmir, he called him. Foreigner. <laughs> Just might be. Now, where's the beggar? Every little bit. Yes, who is it? Oh, oh, hello. Is Albert there? Albert Stevens? Yes, been home since yesterday morning. Who wants him? When he comes in, tell him to telephone Watkins. Watkins, got that? Hoskins? Watkins. W-A-T-K-I-N-S. He knows me. Just tell him to call me, that's all. Does he know where to call? Yes, it's very important. Do you understand? He ain't come out since yesterday morning. All right, have him telephone me at once. You needn't shout at me, Mr. Bloodywell Watkins. Goodbye. Not there. He'll telephone me. I say, where can I reach you? Oh, I've got all this report on the man to write up, for goodness sake. I'll be in my office till noon. Oh, he'll telephone me before that, I'm sure. Well, I must be going, sir. Oh, I'm sorry I couldn't reach him just now. But I'll be in touch with you as soon as I hear from him. I'll be very grateful to you, sir. It was good seeing you again. Been a long time, Llewellyn. Well, goodbye. So long. So long, old chap. Oh, you dropped something. Eh? Hey, where? There on the floor, beside your right foot. Oh, must have closed this. What is it? I found it in the car with the dead man. Huh? The top off a cheap mechanical pencil. Let's see it. Do you mind? Not at all. Don't have to be careful of fingerprints. They've had it in the laboratory. Nothing on it. That's it. Beg your pardon, sir. I've seen this pencil before, Lou. Oh, millions of them about, no doubt. The chap that was killed must have lost it. No. Eh? I've seen this particular one before. I saw it last night. I don't follow you, sir. Huh. That settles it. Look here closely. Yes. See these initials scratched on it? Very tiny here. Probably done with a pocket knife. Is it? A.S. By crikey, A.S., that's what they are. Whose do you suppose? Uh, he offered to sell it to me last night. Who? Albert Stevens, the copper's knock. I was just trying to telephone. Goodness sake. So that's why he hasn't come home. Eh? He said he knew this Casimir. He said Casimir had money. And money was what he needed. Oh, well, Casimir was robbed, we know that. But I never knew a copper's knock to have the courage to commit murder, sir. <laughs> Why, I... I bought him the courage, old boy. Four pints of mild and bitter. Suppose that makes me an accessory to murder? The 
constables who were dispatched to the home of Albert Stevens reported that he was still absent. At 11 the next morning, he had not yet come home. His wife knew nothing of his whereabouts, nor did the garage people where he usually kept his cab. At noon, a teletype signal was sent to all Metropolitan Police stations giving a description of the man and the number of his cab, GLP-301. The same information was published next day in Metropolitan Informations, which goes to all police officers. There was no immediate response. Neither the man nor the cab could be found. By now, Superintendent Watkins had been officially assigned to the case, and on the morning of the fourth day, we held a strategy meeting in his office. He had some new information for me. They found the gun. Indeed, sir. They'd been taking the car to pieces down at Hendon for us, you know. They found a thirty-two caliber Walther automatic pistol hidden in the lining of the top. Good. Our friend Casimir was killed by a thirty-two caliber bullet, you know. And ballistics assures me that this is the gun from which it was fired. Good. Fingerprints? None. Fingerprints? None. The ballistics say they're sure that more than one shot was fired from the gun. How could they tell that? There are, there are two cartridges missing from the clip. And it seems they found too much powder fouling in the receiver and the barrel for one shot. I, I don't quite understand, but they're quite positive. They find more than one bullet? Only the one that went through Casimir's head was embedded in the dash of the car. Well, where's this other one, then? Somebody else's body, I expect. Hmm. But whose, I say? Yes. Oh, plasterfer. Superintendent Watkins, him. Hi, Watkins. Fletcher here, T Division. Hello, sailor. Look here, we found your man, Albert Stevens. Oh, good. Found him. Oh. Where was he? Sitting in his taxi cab. Where? At the bottom of the Thames. What? Near Wapping Old Stairs. One of our boats found him. Is he dead? Twice dead, old chap. Drowned and a bullet through his heart. Well... So that's where the other bullet went. I admit I'd more or less dropped a brick in pinning all my hopes of a quick solution of the case on Albert Stevens. Llewellyn and I moved at once to realign our strategy. This was our estimate of the situation. It is possible that Stevens did murder Casimir, of course. Uh Possible, but not probable. The forensic laboratory people, the ballistics people, say that the bullet they found in Stevens' body was fired from the same gun that killed Casimir. The thirty-two Walther automatic they found in the car. But then, who killed who? Uh, I suspect that since the gun was found in the car with Casimir, he was the last one shot, wouldn't you? Well... Then, of course, Stevens couldn't have killed him. Right. Stevens must have been dead and at the bottom of the Thames when Casimir was shot. Then who killed Casimir? Obviously not Stevens. The forensic laboratory can tell us who died first, I hope. We know. How? The gun. It was with Casimir, remember? Unless someone shot him, then took the gun and killed Stevens with it, pushed him into the Thames, and then brought the gun back. Sounds silly. Indeed. Then who shot Casimir? One of Stevens' friends might have if he knew Casimir killed Stevens. Revenge. How do we know Casimir shot Stevens? Well, we... Besides, Stevens didn't have any friends. Except me. And I don't think I did. His wife, perhaps? Yeah. Perhaps. Well, besides, how could she get that gun? Hmm. No friends. None I know of. I knew Albert rather well. Ha. Huh. What? Casimir had friends, though. Albert told me about them. Who? A man named, um, his woman's name, um, uh, Marion. I don't know her. Him. And a man who wears a foreign Navy uniform. Polish? Casimir was Polish. And a deserter. I suspect our man's a deserter, too. They were all mixed up in the black market, Albert said. What sort of black market, sir? Oh, all sorts, it appears. Why should they kill Casimir? And, or Albert Stevens? Well, Albert, that's simple. They found out he was an informer, a narc. Why Casimir? Oh, people had been murdered for money before. Perhaps Casimir was cheating them. He was apparently the boss. Well, a crook who cheats a fellow crook is asking for it. 
Let's get on to Marion and the Navy officer. All we have to do is find them. Now, allow me to digress for a moment. There was, of course, no record anywhere of Casimir's former address. We put people on that at once, suspecting that Marion and the Navy officer might live close to Casimir's home. But another day dragged by without tangible result. I was sitting gloomily in my office, trying to think of a more tenable theory than the one we had tentatively adopted. Oh, plus the phone. Yes, Watkins here. Lady to see you, sir. Inspector. What's her name? Name, please. Miss Dotty Telfer. Spell it, please. T A L I A F E W R O. You've heard of me on the actress. Miss Dotty Telfer, sir. And. Actress! You know me. Actress, sir. What she wants. She says it's in connection with Casimir. What was her name, Miss? Cashuber, I said. I heard her. Yes, sir. Send her in. Yes, sir. And ask Sergeant Llewellyn if you'll just step in here. Yes, sir. Come in. Good afternoon, madam. Are you Superintendent Watkins? I am. Sit down, madam. I thank you. <laughs> you said you knew something about Casimir Kashuba. Yeah, I saw on the express that he's dead. Extremely. And good enough for him, I'd say. You knew him? Yes. He was a crook. I'm afraid you're rather late in telling us that, madam. Well, I mean to say, I... Uh, what uh, sort of dealings did you have with him? Well, I never had any. Well, I mean, he cheated me, and now he's dead. How am I going to get back the 17 pounds I gave him? That's what I want to know. Why did you give him 17 pounds? Oh, excuse me, sir. Oh, come on in, Llewellyn. This is Miss Dotty. Yes, sir. I'm a music hall star at the Ship's Bush Empire. How do you do, madam? Uh, sit down, Llewellyn. Seems Miss Telfer has given Casimir 17 pounds. Whatever for, miss? Well, I suspect it's rather silly of me, but I couldn't resist it. Resist what? Well, I was having a, a late supper after the show last Tuesday, and there was a man, Kashmir Kashuba, it turned out to be, sitting two tables away from me. Is that the first time you met him? Of course. Do you think mm. that uh, on the table before him was the most magnificent handbag? Handbag? Um, a woman's handbag, the kind I hadn't seen for simply years. I couldn't resist doing what I did. What did you do, madam? <laughs> oh, I know it's breaking the law, but isn't everyone in the black market? Not everyone exactly. I? Oh, oh well... I just stepped over to the table and introduced myself, and he gave me his name, and I said, Would you mind terribly telling me where you got that adorable bag? I wanted one myself, you know. Black market. <laughs> so um, he said he manufactured them, and that I could have one if I liked. All I had to do was to give him 17 pounds, so that he could buy the special leather it was made of. And in a day or two, I could call at his flat... And it should be ready for me, do you see? And you fell for that old one. You called it his flat. Would you believe it? When I called, he professed never having seen me. He said he was not a manufacturer. He wasn't. And nothing I could say would make him give me back my 17 pounds or the bag. And did you kill him then? I did not. Later, perhaps. I never killed anyone in my life. I'm a law-abiding... Will you give us the address, my dear law-abiding young woman? No, it's in Maida Vale somewhere. I think I have it here, in my shabby old handbag. Thank you very much, Miss... Telfer, an, an actress. actress, I think you said, yes. Yeah. Well, uh, that'll be all, Miss Telfer, and thank you very much. Come along, Llewellyn. Right. Yes, but how am I going to get my 17 pounds back? The man's dead You're now. not going to get it back, Miss Telfer. What? You're very fortunate. The black markets cost you only 17 pounds. It cost Casimir his life. Ready, Llewellyn? Within 20 minutes, a Scotland Yard car dropped us at the address in Maida Vale Miss Telfer, actress, had supplied us. We interviewed the proprietor of that dismal place, a cross-eyed young man in an unusually dirty waistcoat in the Red Mingus Tartan. His name, he informed us, was Ian Kalbfleisch, and he had a cold. Well, he ain't here. We're quite aware of that, my good man. 
He's dead. Did you murder him? Bell. Are you in the black market, too? Bell. May we see his room? Tay Diz, Eddie Bo. Whose is it, then? About the band. Who? An officer. <laughs> Navy officer. Oh? RN? RNR? Or RNBR? Not one of ours. <clears throat> Polish Navy. When did this Polish naval officer take the room, Mr. Kalbflash? Day after the murder. Oh, you know the day of the murder, then? I can read. <laughs> Was it all the papers? Is this man here now? No. Will he return? He always has. Was this naval officer a friend of Casimir's? I don't know. May we see the room? Got a warrant? Yes. All right. <laughs> Second door on the left. Come on, Lou. All right. It's unlocked. Come on. No, leave the door open, Lou. Our friend with a runny nose might just warn him that we're here. Right. I'll keep watch. While Llewellyn kept watch from the open door, I made a quick search of the place. I found nothing at all of any apparent importance until I went for the pockets of the navy greatcoat in the closet. I was about to exhibit my findings to Llewellyn when he hissed sharply at me from the doorway. What's up? Chap coming in, wearing a navy uniform. People in your room, Commander. Who are they? Police. Scotland Yard. What, what, what do they want? If you'll come in, Commander, we'll be glad to tell you. Who are you? Sergeant Llewellyn of Scotland Yard. I think you'd best come in, sir. Come in, sir. What, what is the meaning of this, may I ask? What is your name, please? Leo M. Stefanowitz, Commander of Polish Navy. What do you want? I should like to ask you a question. Well? May I ask you where you got this mechanical pencil, sir? Uh, I will tell you. I got it, uh... Well, uh, where did you get it? I didn't kill it. Kill whom, Commander? Why, Kasimir Kashuba. Uh, this was Albert Stevens' pencil, Commander. I didn't kill Albert. The top of this pencil was found in the car with Kasimir Kashuba's body, Commander. I didn't do it. Perhaps you can explain, then. Yes, I... Well? Uh, Marion did the killing. Oh, indeed, Marion. Uh, yes, I, I told him not... It was Marion who did it, and not me. Oh, our friend Marion, he did it. Hmm. Yes, I am telling you the truth, Marion. Do you know where Marion is? I will take it to him. Yes, I, I will help you. He did it, and I will help you find him. Uh, please, and let my me see, take you to him. Please. Will you please? Casimir was my friend. I'm just wondering something, Inspector. Eh? Uh -huh. I am wondering if Albert Stevens was also his friend. Let's go and find your friend Marion, shall we, Commander? It was a quiet little hotel we drove to in the West End. Inspector Watkins and me and the commander all jammed in the police car together. The clerk nodded in a familiar way to Stefanovitz when we entered. Is my friend in? Yes, sir. Oh, don't announce us, please. We will work the lift ourselves. Uh, get in, gentlemen. All right. Uh, now we shall see justice done. Indeed. The first floor, gentlemen. Uh, the door directly opposite. Uh, here. Who is he? Uh, Leo, Marion. Who is with you? No one. Come in. Ah, Leo, my boy, I am glad... We are from Scotland Yard, sir. I warn you, both of you, that anything you say will be taken down in writing and may be used in evidence. What is the meaning of you, this? murderer? What? Yes, these gentlemen have come to arrest you for the murder of Casimir. Socrat, you, you traitor, you, 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 you coward. Arrest him, gentlemen. He is the murderer. You, 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 look, look, this man. He's the one who fired shot. Huh? He's the one who did it. I, I see him do it. You see me? 
You know you did it. He's the I, one I, gentleman. Yeah, I'm not. He should catch me from behind as I sit in front seat. I was in the front seat. He did it. Shut up. Oh, talk. Talk for you, sir. You go. You thief. You. Gentlemen, gentlemen. Marian Konechny and Leo Stefanovich, I arrest you both on suspicion of having been involved in the murder of Casimir Kasuba. And of Albert Stevens. You've both been warned. Have you nothing to say? At the trial, the two men admitted all the details of the two murders. Albert Stevens, it seems, had talked too much about his relations with the police, and someone in a moment of rage had shot him, and his cab had been dumped into the Thames. Walking away from there together, they'd stolen a motor car. Casimir Kashubo, who had been drinking heavily, twitted his companions about the new hold he had on them as murderers. He boasted that he'd had no part in the crime, and one of the two men had shot him in the back of the neck with a Walther automatic pistol. Each man blamed the other. The jury took 25 minutes to decide who was guilty. Mr. Justice McConaughey placed the black cap on his head. Lorian Konyatsme, Leo Stavarovich. The jury have found you and each of you guilty of the murder of Casimir Kashuba. It is the sentence of the court that you and each of you be taken to a lawful prison and thence to a place of execution. That you be there, each of you hanged by the neck until you are dead. And that you are respectfully. The two men appealed the verdict and won. They were immediately tried for the murder of Albert Stevens and again heard the fatal words. That you there, each of you, be hanged by the neck until you are dead. The latter sentence was carried out. the eighth in the series Whitehall 1212, compiled by special permission from the official files of Scotland Yard. Only the names have been changed, otherwise the story is true. Research for Whitehall 1212 is prepared by Percy Hoskins of the London Daily Express, and the stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper and produced by Jack Goldstein and Collie Small. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. There's adventure zooming your way today with Joel McRae featured in another authentic story based on the files of the Texas Ranger in another authentic story based on the files of the Texas Ranger in another authentic story based on the files of the Texas Ranger in another authentic story based on the files of the Texas Ranger in another White or one two one two quickly please. This is Scotland Yard. For the first time in history, Scotland Yard opens its secret files to bring you the authentic, true stories of some of its most baffling cases. These are the true stories, the unvarnished facts, just as they occurred, reacted for you by an old British cast. Only the names of the participants have for obvious reasons been changed. The stories are presented with the full cooperation of Scotland Yard. Research on Whitehall 1212 is prepared by Percy Hoskins, chief crime reporter of the London Daily Express. The stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper. Here are the participants in Scotland Yard case number 505-MR-074. Donald Sims, the cabinet maker. I have some theories. Albert George Corcoran, the man who owned a gun. I tried to get it back from him. Patricia Emmons, who married a stranger. To my sorrow. Chief Inspector Grant McCrimmon of Scotland Yard. I think that Chief Superintendent John Davison has it here in the Black Museum. The one bit of evidence upon which the whole case turned. Shall we go inside and ask him to show it to us? Come on in. Oh, it's not half as gruesome in here as people would have you believe. So don't be squeamish. Good afternoon, Meg. This is Chief Superintendent John Davison, ladies and gentlemen. How do you do? 
I expect you're glad to see that this is not a chamber of horrors, as it is sometimes represented, and that I'm not a masked monster. This black museum, as we call it, is merely a repository for items that have figured in crimes of various sorts. It's regrettable that so many of those crimes were murder. These things are here for a purpose. It's a curious fact that criminals are seldom original in their approach. Here are informative, tangible objects that are often of enormous help to us. Hence, for your information, the Black Museum. Now, I think Chief Inspector McCrimmon here wants you to see what we have on our case 505-MR-074. And here it is. A brass cartridge case from a Browning automatic pistol. You'll note it still has traces of a sticky tape on it. And some photomicrographs of this case and of another similar one. That's all there is, Meg. Well, they were quite adequate, John. Yeah, the end, the hangman, another ten pounds. I was quite astonished when I received the call. Chief Inspector McGrimmon here. His Majesty will speak to you, sir. His Majesty? Say, who is this? My name is George, sir. Well, uh, I say, sir, I mean... Uh... I am not the King of England, Chief Inspector, although my name is George also. Oh. I have been exiled from my own country for some years. I have been in residence in London, however, for some time. Yes, sir, uh, Your Majesty. I have just taken a house in Belgravia. Oh, now I know who you are, sir. You're King George of... Precisely. Look here, Chief Inspector. I went around to my new place this morning. Yes, sir. And, and I was unable to get in. Oh, some of your enemies, sir? Uh, from your own country? Oh, I'll have special branch get onto it no, at once. No, 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 it's not that at all. I am locked out. I, I don't quite understand, sir, uh, Your I Majesty. I can't get in. Oh, you mean there's no one in the house, sir? Uh, my housekeeper, uh, Miss, uh, Miss Jessica Holmby, has been staying there alone, but she doesn't seem to be there. I'm a little alarmed. Your Majesty, do you suspect she I has... I have no cause to suspect her of anything beyond the fact that she seems to be missing. Uh, but uh, I'm a little uh, uneasy about uh, trying to enter. Bonds. I have many enemies, Chief Inspector. And Scotland Yard men are expendable, are they not, sir? Well, I'll investigate at once, Your Majesty. The address is... Thank you. Hey, we know the place, sir. Preliminary report of Chief Inspector McCrimmon's investigation dictated by himself to Miss Sheila O'Malley, Scotland Yard stenographer. A careful search of four of the ground room floors failed to disclose the presence of anything resembling a bomb of any sort. But upon entering the quarters assigned to the housekeeper, Miss Jessica Holmby, an important discovery was made. The body of Miss Holmby, aged 41, was found seated in an armchair opposite the door. She had been shot in the head. The body was identified by the King's equerry, Monsieur Langlois, who accompanied us. Item, a brass cartridge case, apparently from a Browning automatic pistol, caliber 38, was found on the floor near the door, thus establishing the probable position of the killer when the shot was fired. Signed, Grant McKimmon, Chief Inspector, CID. There was but one other possible clue. The torn corner of a card which was found in the corner of the room. There was nothing in the room nor the housekeeper's belongings that it might have been torn from. We kept it. Sergeant Peter Monk, who had been assigned to the case with me, presented the most immediately useful clue. I just thought it might be worthwhile, Chief Inspector, to have a look in the mailbox. I was lucky. Well, let's see it, Peter. Hmm. Pushmark Brighton. Well, she'll never open it. Hmm. My darling Jessica, won't you please write me or telephone me here? I've been trying to reach you by telephone for two days, but there is no answer. I am frantic. All my love, Poopsie. Poopsie? Oh, what a frightful name. You suppose it's a man? A pet name, no doubt. It's revolting. When was it mailed? The day before you found her. Well, see if you can find Poopsie or Brighton, Peter. Perhaps he or it can talk as well as he can write. It's quite a job, sir. No, I don't want you going up and down Brighton front crying, Poopsie, Poopsie. People will follow you with a butterfly net. I was thinking of that, sir. Telephone Jessica's sister in Kensington. She's probably heard of them. Uh, yes, sir. Poopsie. Your sister knew Poopsie fairly well, she said. The man with a revolting pet name was Donald Sims, a cabinet maker, 39 years old, and he worked in a penny peep show in Brighton. She gave us his address, and Peter Monk and I took a trip to that seaside resort. 
Well, we found the house, and we met Mr. Sims. I will not say that name again. It didn't fit this tall, curly-haired fellow at all. He crushed my hand. How do you do, sir? And this is Sergeant Peter Monk. Won't you sit down? Oh, thank Thanks. You. I suppose you want to talk to me about the late Miss Holmby. You knew her quite well, did you not? We were to be married in a month. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, I didn't know that. Yes. We kept it a secret. We kept it secret. Not even her sister knew our plans. I suppose it was she who told you about me. Uh, yes. I'm afraid she didn't like me very much. Oh, why? Oh, I'm sure I don't know. Sisters are often like that. Aye. I was very much opposed to the idea of her becoming housekeeper to the king. Oh? So many odd people about, you know. People with grievances and all that. I thought it was dangerous being there all alone and whatnot. Dealing with foreigners. Ah, uh, she. <clears throat> I'm very much of the opinion that one of these foreign people is responsible. Aye, we considered that. They're making a thorough check of everyone who visited the place. I hope you are. Uh, how long had you known Miss Holmby, Mr. Sims? About eight months, I think. It was rather a case of love at first sight. Mm -hmm. We were very much in love. Were you in the habit of visiting her often? Oh, quite frequently, yes. But I've been very busy recently, and I tried telephoning her instead. As you know, I was quite unable to reach her for several days, and then things happened. If I'd only gone up to London, I might have been able to prevent it, at least. I keep thinking so. Well, I misdoubt you could have done anything. I would have given my life for her. Well, uh, I loved her, gentlemen. <coughs> Your uh, uh, wedding plans were almost completed, then? Yes. Mm. I'm most terribly depressed about all this, gentlemen. I, uh, I can sympathize with you, sir. Yes. Could I offer you a small libation, gentlemen? I have a fresh bottle of Glenlivet in the cupboard. Well, thank you, no, sir. I never touch it, sir, thanks. <laughs> you don't mind if I do, then? No, not at all. I've done nothing but sit here in my room and drink, all alone, since I heard of this. I'm a little surprised that you have not yet been up to London, Mr. Sims. Sir? Huh? No, I couldn't bring myself to go to that place where she died. Are you sure you won't have a small libation? Thanks. Uh, we must be getting back to London. Oh, surely you don't have to go at once. No, I'm afraid we must. Thank you for your time, Mr. Sims, and let me assure you again of our sympathy. Oh, I wish you'd stay a little longer. I have some theories I should very much like to pass on to you. Well, we should be talking to you again, sir, I fancy. You know, if what? We, if we discover anything more... All right, or... uh, we may need your help. Oh. Well, Schlanter more, gentlemen. Schlanter. Hey, come along, Monk. Right, sir. I'm sorry you gentlemen won't join me in a small libation. No, thank you. We shall undoubtedly be seeing you. Find the assassin of my love. Hey, we shall try. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, Mr. Sims. Oh, goodbye, gentlemen. And thank you. Pupsy. Dreadful, isn't he? Well, he'd, he'd impress a woman. Now, oh, let's walk over to the seashore and see how he impresses some of his fellow workmen. You're suspicious of him, aren't you? I'm trying very hard not to be suspicious of him, Monk's old boy. We tramped along bright in front with the din of the dance band in our ears for a good while before we came across anyone who knew Sims well enough to discuss him with us. At last, a Brighton rock huckster at whose place of business we stopped admitted knowing him well. Yes, I know Johnny Sims. I knows him well enough. That I don't want never no dealings with him. Not no dealings what so bloody ever. <laughs> What's he done to you? <laughs> Plenty. Bright Rock! Who has Bright Rock? Take a bit of Bright Rock home for the kids, Missy. Only a bobble stick. Ah, chip. Plenty enough, mate. What? Well, I can't prove what he done to me, but I can have me su suspicions, can't I? He won't pay me, and I don't hold with fellas 
What commits bigamy, anyhow? Bigamy? Huh? Well, it ain't no secret, I'm telling you, mister. He got out of the stony lonesome not a year ago for marrying a bit of flapping Nottingham when he was already the husband and father of three kids and living with them right here in Brighton. Yeah. Take home a bit of Brighton Rock for the family. Here are. Only a bobber stick. Only a bobber stick. He was in prison? That big of me, as I said. There ain't no secret around here. Are you sure? Well, ask anyone around here about Poopsy. <laughs> He's a bad lot, mate, if you ask me. Oh, that's very really interesting. Yes, indeed. Uh, him and me used to be friends thick as thieves. We was, but not anymore. Take my word for it. Not since he stole my gun. Stole your what? My gun, mate. My Browning automatic. Oh, it was quite legal. I still got the license. That's <laughs> all I have got. He took a fancy to it, he did. The stinker borrowed it from me. <laughs> Last I ever seen of it, the dog's body. Claimed he lost it. Didn't pay you for it? Not Poopsie, not him. Claimed he ain't got no money. What caliber was this gun? Eh? Oh, 38. Interesting. Huh? I bought the gun because I rather fancy target shooting, see? Had a chance to fire it only twice. Down at my place over there on the downs. He was with me. He liked it, so he borrowed it from me. Last I see of the thing, I bet he still got it somewhere hoping to sell it. My gun! Well, uh, uh, thanks very much, Mr. Uh, uh, Corcoran, sir. Albert George Corcoran, later the loyal regiment now reduced to selling bright and bloody rotten starve into bleeding death. <laughs> well, I'll take a stick, Corcoran. Oh, here you are, sir. Thank you. Uh, I'll have one, too. Thank you, sir. Here you are. I say, sir, um, why was you so anxious to know about Poopsy Sin? Does everyone call him by that revolting name? He calls himself that, sir, the Og. Fair turn just stomach, doesn't it? Uh, yeah, it certainly does. Was you think of an employing him, sir? They say he is a good cabinet maker, but Christ, what a stinker. Well, I don't think we shall employ him now, Corcoran. Oh, you'll come to a bad end, sir. You know, I'm inclined to agree with you, Corcoran. We walked to the nearest telephone box, and I called London, Whitehall, 1212. This is Scotland Yard. The Criminal Records Office, please. Criminal Records, sir? Yes, sir. Sergeant Hammond, dear. Criminal Records Office. Hello? Hammond? Chief Inspector McCrimmon here. Oh, yes, sir. How are you? Hey, what do you have on a fellow named Donald Sims of Brighton, sometimes known as Poopsy? about him quite recently. Uh, just hang on, sir. Uh, look, I think he's wanted some. Why, how very delightful, Sergeant. Uh, hey, I'll wait. Uh, what's up, sir? Mm -hmm. Oh, Poopsie's a bad boy, it seems. Uh -huh. Worse than we think? Well, I'll tell you in half a moment. How are you there, sir? Aye. Uh, he's wanted for check fraud, sir. Travelling in rather high society, too. Well, how is that? One of the checks he forged is on account of royalty, that King George. Oh, that king that's just taken a new house in Belgravia? Yes. Say no more. Monks and I will fetch him in, full of dew of Glenlivet in three hours' time. <laughs> Accompanied by a slightly sozzled poopsie, Monks and I returned to London and deposited him for safekeeping on a charge of fraud. He promptly went to sleep on the floor of his cell in Bow Street. And Monks and I departed for a well-earned dinner of bubble and squeak, of which I'm inordinately fond. Oh, I also had two bottles of Guinness, I remember. Oh, the next morning, our prisoner safely incarcerated on his fraud charge, Monk Monks and I departed again for Brighton. Monks, armed with such warrant, went on to Sims' rooms, whilst I paid a visit to Cochrane, the Brighton rock man. Well, good morning, sir. I'm most happy to see you again, sir. No, I'm in need of further information this morning, Cochrane. What kind of information, sir? <laughs> Now, Poopsie. Oh, don't say that name so early in the morning, Corcoran. It, it makes me ill. <laughs> we took him back to London yesterday. <laughs> you did, sir. Aye, on a charge of defrauding by check. <laughs> Good. Who are you, sir? Well, I'm Chief Inspector McCrimmon of Scotland Yard. Oh, I thought you was Tex. I swear I did. Well, we are. Now, look here, Corcoran. You know, we may be able to get your gun back. No. But it won't be especially easy, you know. I know. It'll be very hard to identify, you see. Uh, the number was, uh, um... Oh, I don't remember the number. Oh, that's too bad. I wonder... Would you possibly have an empty cartridge case that was fired in the gun? Our ballistics laboratory could probably identify it that way. How? 
Well, it's the, the firing mechanism always leaves marks on a cartridge case that are quite different from those fired by any other gun. Sort of uh, mechanical fingerprints. Huh? Exactly. You see, no two guns in the world leave the same marks on the base of a shell. Let me see. Now, I did have one, I know. I I, I only fired two rounds with it before Poopsie borrowed it. I, I had one. Well, now, what did I do with it? You got it at home, perhaps. No, no, no. I had it here. Now, what did I do with it? Oh, come on, man. Think hard. I am thinking, sir. It's in your pocket, perhaps. No, I carried it for a long time, then I had some use for it. Let me see now. Uh... Oh, I know where it is. Good. Oh. Found it. Ah, uh, let's see it. Here it is. See, I used it for a spool to wrap this here sticky tape around. It was just the right size. <laughs> I see the mark she was talking about. Here, where the firing pin struck the primer. Are you sure that's from your gun, then? I swear to it. Hope to die, sir. Uh, you may have to swear to it. Or ain't no doubt about it. I'll match the gun all right. Every little mark it will. Here, sir. Let me take the tape off first. Oh, never mind. It's all right this way. No. I wonder. One more thing. Yes, sir. Could you possibly find one of the bullets you fired with the gun? Well, I don't know, sir. I could find the spot where I fired them. It was in a chalk pit. Uh -huh. But whether them bullets are still there and whether I could dig them out... Well, I... we only need one. Sir. Eh? Hey? I know why you want that bullet. Uh -huh. You do? I know every gun leaves marks on a bullet so you can prove it comes from that gun and not no other. Aye, uh, that's right. And what you want to do is compare one of my bullets with a bullet you think's been fired from it, too. Well, uh... uh sir, uh, did, uh, did Poopsie murder somebody with my gun? I don't know, Cochran. Oh, no, sir. But you can help us find out. Sergeant Monk's painstaking search of Sims' room failed to discover the missing burning pistol. But in a pocket of a jacket in his cupboard, Monks discovered a torn, crumpled card. It was the announcement of a marriage between Donald Sims and a Miss Patricia Emmons of Nottingham. So we telephoned the Nottingham police, asking them if it would be possible for Miss Emmons to come to London to see us. She was waiting for us at Scotland Yard when we returned. Yes, I married him. To my sorrow. And you did not know that he was married at the time? No, I did not. His wife died during his bigamy trial. And did you know that, Mark? Oh, yes, sir. I discovered it today. I discovered a great many things about him. Oh? He's a bad man. Let it rest at that. Uh, this uh, is uh, one of your wedding announcements, is it not? Oh, I thought they were all destroyed. Oh, I do wish you'd destroy that one. I'm sorry, Miss Emmons. He was money crazy. He said he loved me, but I discovered he thought I had an income. When he found I had nothing, he deserted me. It was while I was trying to find him that I found he'd married me bigamously. Aye, we, we know about that. Now, uh, did you ever see a pistol in his possession, Miss Emmons? Pistol? Yes, of course. Could you describe it? A thirty-eight caliber Browning automatic pistol. I know about pistols. My Uncle James is a retired warrant officer in the Royal Army Ordnance Corps. Uh -huh. He was at the Woolwich Arsenal for years. And you'd testify in court that you saw that pistol in Sims' possession? Oh, I would indeed. May I ask why, please? I don't think you'd like to know why, Miss Emmons. You escaped with your life. The cartridge case that Cochrane had given me, you know, the one that you saw in the Black Museum with the remains of sticky tape still on it, had been sent to the ballistics laboratory when we returned to Brighton. Kenneth Ogilvy, the technician, telephoned me, asking me to come up, which I did, and he sat me down before a binocular microscope. I hope your eyes are normal, Chief Inspector. I've adjusted the eyepiece to mine. Oh, I'm 20. Good. Now, this is a comparison microscope, you know. Here on this side... Huh? Uh, no, don't look in the eyepiece yet. Oh. This one is the cartridge found at the King's house with the victim. Aye. And over here is the one you got with the tape on it. Aye. Now, look. You see, uh, just let me turn it a wee bit. How the mark of the firing pin is exactly the same on both shells. Aye. And the tiny scratches at the upper right. Aye, and these down here at the bottom, too. Uh, the ones that look like an H. Yeah, that's right. Well, I'd say they're from the same gun, all right. But will it convince a jury? 
Uh, don't worry about that, sir. When we get our photomicrographs prepared and labeled... Oh, if we only had the gun. I think it's only fair to warn you in advance, sir. A, a jury can believe just so much. But if they can't see the gun, only the cartridge case and the bullets that match the missing gun. Oh, if we're in worse shape than I thought. What can I do? Sir, as a... Uh, one good Scots Presbyterian to another. Have you tried prayer? I'll not tell you whether or not I prayed. You can judge for yourself by the results. But on the theory that the greater crime is the more important, Donald Sims was sent to my office at New Scotland Yard instead of the police court where he was to be examined in the forgery case. He sat before me at my desk. Monk was in a chair beside me, and uh, Miss Virginia Emmons sat in a corner of the room. Now, uh, Sims was quite self-confident. You can't cross-examine me. You know better than that, McCrimmon. I'll uh, overlook your rudeness, Mr. Sims. I have no intention of cross-examining you. I have no questions to ask of you. Oh, well, what about your pal there? You. I don't want to know anything, Sam. Oh, what's she here for, then? Who, Miss Emmons? You've got nothing on me any longer, Virginia. I paid for it. She'll ask you no questions. McCrimmon here. Who? Cochran. Oh, he has. Good. Good. Well, send it up to Ogilvy in the ballistics laboratory, please. Aye. All right. Thank you. <laughs> He's found the bullet, Monk. Huh? Who? Cochrane. What? No. But... Look here, Mr. Sims. This is a scrap of paper found alongside the body of Miss Jessica Holmby. This scrap exactly matches the torn wedding announcement Sergeant Monk found in your jacket pocket in your rooms. These comparison photographs show two cartridge cases. One was found at the scene of the crime. One was fired in a pistol which formerly belonged to the man Cochrane. A pistol which is known to have been in your possession. I will testify to that. Well, now, you've observed that I have asked you no questions, Sims. Is that correct? Yes. Sergeant Monk and Miss Emmons are witnesses to that. Yes, that's, that's right. right. What are you trying to do? I am relating certain facts to you, Mr. Sims. Ah, here's another. The forgery case in which you are at present involved concerns the King's equity. Now, I do not refer to His Present Majesty of England, but uh, you know who I mean. Yes. Now, finally... Our ballistics laboratory has in its possession a bullet fired from that pistol by the man Cochrane. They have also the bullet with which Miss Jessica Holmby was murdered. And they're about to compare the two to uh, demonstrate that both bullets were fired from the same gun, which is known to have been in your possession. Well, what are you going to do about it? I'm going to do exactly what you expect me to do. Donald Sims, I arrest you for the willful murder of Jessica Homby. And I warn you that anything you say will be taken down in writing and may be used in evidence. Now, I'll take the liberty of asking you one question. Do you wish to make a statement? What will happen to me? I don't know. Will they hang me? Will they... Me? You're not required to make a statement of any sort, Mr. Sims. Well, if you have nothing to say, Sergeant Monk. I killed her. You take this down, Sergeant. Yes, sir. I was talking to her at the King's house in Belgravia. She'd heard about the check. What we check do you refer to, please, Mr. Sims? <laughs> the one I... I signed with the name of the king's equerry. It was for 400 pounds. 
The query had shown it to her. When it came back from the bank, marked R.D., and she'd recognised my handwriting at once. She said he'd already lodged a complaint against me, but that she could find forgiveness in her heart because she loved me. She offered me 400 pounds of her own savings to make restitution and said we would forget about it and be married anyway. She... <laughs> she loved me, gentlemen. Please, Miss Hermans. We talked for a while and then... As I took the money from her, the card fell out of my pocket as I took out my wallet. Oh, sorry. I, I started to pick it up. She'd evidently seen my name on it and asked, what's that? Reaching for it at the same time, I snatched it away from her, tearing off the corner you found. Now that uh, card you mentioned was the announcement of the wedding between you and Miss Ammons? Yes. Well, that's all there is to it. A frightful scene occurred between us. She became angry and I became violently angry. I, I found myself standing at the door with a pistol in my hand. I don't know how it got there, but she was dead and the pistol was in my hand. Hmm. All right, it's your opinion then that uh, you killed her. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Is that the whole of your statement, Mr. Sims? <laughs> They'll hang me. They'll hang me. I'll die. Well, if you'll read over your statement, Mr. Sims. <laughs> they'll hang me. You think they'll hang me? Will you read and sign the statement, sir? <laughs> there is still plenty of time, Mr. Sims. <laughs> Time ran out on Donald Sims. He was brought to trial at Old Bailey three weeks later. His statement to the Scotland Yard men, the statements he made in court, caused the jury to bring in a verdict of willful murder. He was hanged on a Friday morning at 8 o'clock, still weeping. You have heard the ninth in the series Whitehall 1212, adapted from the official files of Scotland Yard. Research is prepared by Percy Hoskins of the London Daily Express. The stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper and produced by Collie Small and Jack Goldstein. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Today... NBC. Today, NBC. Today, NBC. Today, NBC. Whitehall, one, two, one, two. This is Scotland Yard. <laughs> For the first time in history, Scotland Yard opens its secret files to bring you the true, authentic stories of some of its most baffling cases. These are the true stories, the unvarnished facts, just as they occurred, reenacted for you by an all-British cast. Only the names of the participants have, for obvious reasons, been changed. The stories are presented with the full cooperation of Scotland Yard. Research on Whitehall 1212 is prepared by Percy Hoskins, chief crime reporter of the London Daily Express. The stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper. Here are the participants in case number 693 MR 966. Lance Corporal John Latimer of the Royal Corps of Signals. It was my lorry, right enough. Signaler Lewis Ruling of the same company. It only hadn't rained that night. Mrs. Elsie Avery, who lost her son. He was a lively lad, but he never done any harm. Miss Hartley, the Colonel's daughter. I was raised in the army, and I know what I see. Superintendent Robert Lester of Scotland Yard. If you will come into the Black Museum here with me, I think Chief Superintendent John Davidson can show you what we started with on this case. Here's quite a collection in here of items that have figured in various cases we've worked on here in Scotland Yard. Some of them successfully, and some of them unsolved to date, shall we say. Come with me, please. 
Ah, here you are, John. This is Chief Superintendent John Davidson, who has a long and distinguished record with us. Well, how do you do? Say, I finally found those things, Bob. Ah. I mislaid them, I'm afraid. Now, don't be afraid to look. They're not at all gruesome. Some folks seem to think we have a kind of chamber of horrors here. But I assure you, these things are quite innocuous for the most part. Now, this is the handkerchief. Still quite clean, isn't it? Wasn't always so clean, Bob. See, an ordinary cocky-colored handkerchief, such as millions of soldiers carried during the war. <laughs> I carry one. And this, you don't recognize it? It's a gas mask cover. See the shoulder strap here? Oh, no. Soldiers didn't carry this kind. This is red leather, or imitation leather, if you will. It was the type children carried with them. A child did carry this one. You can still see his name inside it here, written in his own kid's handwriting. Philip Ainsley Avery. Philip Avery is dead. But this little red leather bag helped Superintendent Lester start a man on the early morning stroll that ends on the gallows trap. I was fortunate enough to be called by the Bucks Constabulary at once on this case. Too many times Scotland Yard is called in only after the local police have exhausted their every resource. But those chaps in Buckinghamshire wanted help at once and badly in this little village in early November 1941. Station superintendent... Uh, no, I'll not tell you his name. Brief me. He tossed the gas mask case, the one you just saw, on the desk. This is all we found so far. Rather a bright-colored gas mask case for a boy to carry. Uh, how old is he? I don't know whether we should say is or was superintendent. Hmm... Been looking for him how long now? Three and a half days now. And this is all you found? Aye. I'm scared if he's lost and if he throw away his respirator case. Where'd you find it? About a mile from here, down the road in the ditch. Well-traveled road? Not very. Get anything from his parents? Father's dead and mother's well as you'd expect. He was the only child. What did she think? Well, first she thought he'd run away. Mm. He was quite dotty over the army, and she thought he'd be hanging around some camp or other in the vicinity. He wasn't. Well, they all moved out last one a week ago. Oh, except for that convoy that went through here the day after they disappeared. Could they have taken him along, a mascot, perhaps? <laughs> Checked him first bloody thing. Not with them? No. Their O.C. telephoned me from somewhere over the East Coast. Nice chap, and worried. Said he'd turned out the whole party and no one had heard of the kid. Good man. And the countryside is turned out, you said? Not an able-bodied man in the village that isn't out in the country searching. They'll find him, perhaps. That's what I'm afraid of. Yes. Well, where do you want to start? Who saw the boy last? His mother. He was just setting off for school. Hmm. What about her? Well, frankly... Oh... I've seen mothers who treated their kids better. I'd better see her, hadn't I? Killing her kid's awfully nasty, Superintendent. Yeah. He's my sister-in-law. Oh. Her brother's wife. I, uh... I thought the kid's name was Avery. Oh, she married Avery after my brother was killed at Calais. Where is Avery? Killed at Tobruk. She must be pretty Bitter? Bitter? I'll have a talk with him. Right. Oh, I'm sorry. No, it's all right. I was rather fond of my young nephew. Probably why I telephoned you so quickly. Yeah. Thought you said every man in the village was out looking for the boy. They are. Who are all those chaps, then, coming down the road? Well, they're carrying something. Steady, steady. It's my sister-in-law. That's it. They found him. In my time, I've seen a good many murdered persons. 
I shall probably see a good many more before I turn in my warrant card. But this one, an 11-year-old schoolboy. I can still see that great blue bruise on his forehead and his throat. I've got kids myself. His mother, she was quite controlled when I talked with her. You'd better take me in, Superintendent. I did it. How did you do it, Mrs. Avery? It was such a lively boy, but he... He never meant any harm. Everyone says he was a fine boy, Mrs. Avery. I called him a little hellion. He was always talking about the army and how he was going to join up the minute he came of age. I hate the army. Yes. It's taken Philip's father from me and Avery. I couldn't bear the thought of losing him to it. I raised my hand to my son. <coughs> he said it was his duty. And I thrashed him so many times, but he was stubborn. Duty, I said. What about your duty to your mother? He was all ready for school. With his little gas mask case, standing in the door. Somebody, he said, somebody's got to take Daddy's place. Just like a kid talks. Daddy's place. Mr. Avery's. And I... I slapped his face. I could cut off my hand. And he... He gave me such a look. And went away and I never saw him again until... I sent him to his death. I murdered him. The army got him too. I went away from that stricken woman. What else could I do? She was obviously convinced that she was responsible for the boy's death. But if her story was true, then that was a matter for her own conscience. If it was not, well, if she had killed the boy, there was time enough. The divisional superintendent drove me to the place where the body had been found in his own car. It was a side road off the main highway. Little traveled, and the local constable pointed out the place. I was right there, sir. I marked it with a stick. I was with a searching party. We came across the road here, and Sammy Roberts, he seen that red gas mask bag lying on the edge of the ditch right over there. We pecked it up, and we was looking around like, and I spotted the body lying right down there. Mine on his back, he was. Like he was asleep with his little arms folded on his chest. I, I thought he was asleep till I saw the blood. Though there weren't much of it for the rain. We run over here, and then we saw the mark on his forehead. He's dead all right. And quite peaceful, as I said. That's all, sir. Be no other cars along here since you found them, then? Only one or two, sir. Where did all that oil come from, then? Where, sir? Down there. Oh, I, I don't know, sir. Looks like crankcase oil. The car's been standing there. Some time ago, though. The rain's washed it out, partly. Like it washed away all the fingerprints on the gas mask bag, sir. Certainly looks as if a car or a lorry's been standing here. Could those be its tire marks? Constable, see that no one that comes along here gets near those tire marks. You want to make a plaster cast of them, sir? Yes. Well, Nobby Clark back at the station knows how to make them, sir. He, he was at the police college at Hendon. I'll send them out when we go back. Have you covered everything else, McKinnon? I think so, sir. Rain's washed away everything else, but, but I, I didn't notice these marks. Who's there? Stop him, Constable, before he runs on those tire tracks. Stop! Stop, stop! Please, stop! Who is it, you know? <clears throat> I think it's Miss Hartley. She's got the only MG in this spot. Who is she? The daughter of our local retired colonel, Chief oh, Air Raid Warden. to learn about poor Philip Superintendent. He was such a charming boy. What in the world are you doing out here? This is the place where he was found, Miss Hartley. Oh, how dreadful. You have my deepest sympathy, sir. Who's this man? I'm Superintendent Lester of Scotland Yard, madam. Now, don't call me madam. The name's Hartley. Inga Hartley. Lived here for years. My father's Colonel Hartley. Late, late the Green Howards. Been in the army practically all my life. I, What's I, Scotland Yard doing up here? Can't you handle this, Superintendent? Well, I... Oh, no, your nephew, of course, yes. Sorry. 
Who's have a lorry up here with a leaking crankcase? Don't Have a leaking crankcase as far as I can see it. Who was it? The murderer? Oh, sorry. We've only just come in on this. I saw a lorry over there at the road junction three mornings ago. Army lorry, driven by a Lance Corporal, driving onto the main road from this road. Oh, was that the day the boy was reported missing, Superintendent? Was, huh? You're sure it was an army lorry, Miss? Hartley. Of course I know it was an army lorry, driven by a young lance corporal wearing steel-rimmed glasses, a 1,500-weight portson. I was raised in the army, sir, and I know what I see. Was there any markings on it, Miss Hartley? Of course. It was a Royal Corps of Signals lorry. How did you know? Why, it had the blue and white patch painted on the front like the signaler's armband. A big 56 was lettered on the side in white, and there was a red and green clover leaf painted on the left front door. Yeah, the trucks of that signal convoy that passed through here... Uh? I remember the markings on them. Cod pips, that's right. What, sir? Yes, what are you talking about? Yeah, they were marked with plain card pips. Some of them with the ace of spades, some with diamonds and hearts and... and... clubs. There's your clover leaf, Miss Hartley. Good. Stone the bloody crows. Excuse me, that's the murderer. <laughs> As Miss Hartley roared off in her MG, we headed for the village. It was a thin enough clue, but it was the only one, except for the mother's fantastic confession, but we started to investigate it at once. A telegram to the war office. Request most urgent the present location of Royal Corps signal unit. Passed through this village three days ago, headed for East Coast Port. Information desired in connection with serious crime. Lester, Scotland Yard. No use trying to trace him any other way. Security regulations and all that. We'll have a reply in no time, I'm sure. But if that signals call corporal did kill him, why? Probably struck him with the lorry and got frightened. But what was Phyllis doing over there? The school's in the opposite direction. Maybe he was running away. Excuse me, sir. Would you like to have a look at the things we took from the boys' pockets? I... Would you mind looking, Lester? If there's anything you think I should see... I'll have a look, Constable. He's a string, sir. An old cap badge. That was his father, sir. He always carried it with him. Threepence and coppers. Half a packet of peppermints. Mm. Fair breaks your heart, doesn't it, sir? Poor kid. Go on, Constable. Cotton handkerchief. Hold, hold, hold. Hold on a minute. Was that his? Can't say, sir. Hold it out, I... I think we'll take a closer look at it. I believe that's oil on it there. It is, sir. Smells like old crankcase oil to me, sir. Hold it out. I'll tell you what to do with it. it might be quite important. Yes, sir. How's huh? his mother? Took her to a nursing home down the road, sir. She's, uh, I'm afraid she's, you know, not going to get over it. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, is that all? Only this, sir. What? This we found inside the gas mask case, sir. What is it? Looks like the corner of a pound note, sir. All crumpled up. It's a bloody strange place to find a bit of money. How do you suppose he got it? Why, I think, Constable, the important thing to discover is who has the rest of it. The murderer. Oh, hello, sir. We've heard from the war office about the signal company. Where are they? Oh, they're at a port of embarkation. Oh. They're due to leave the day after tomorrow for North Africa. If we were to follow up what seemed to be a promising clue, in fact, our only clue, there was, of course, no time to lose. But there were things that we must accomplish before we left for the port of embarkation. And these are the things we accomplished with the aid of Scotland Yard technicians who were rushed to us from London. We have the plaster cast of the tire marks on the road, sir. The samples of oil we took out of the mud are here, too. They match the oil stains on the khaki handkerchief. The handkerchief has been washed and examined. What appears to be a laundry mark, K201537, was discovered on the edge of it. It had been partially obscured by the oil stains. The wound on the boy's throat was inflicted after death. 
which was caused by the blow on the head, sir. One thing we do not know yet, Superintendent, is where that torn piece of the one-pound note came from. I brought Philip's murder here to tell you about that. It's from Philip's money box. What? I knew at once when the su- my brother-in-law told me. I took her home to see you. Philip had come back and taken it. I looked in the drawer in his cupboard where he kept it. I found it broken open and empty. I knew what had been in it. Thirty-one shillings in coin. I always and gave him a shilling for shining my boots. And the pound note I gave him for his birthday the day before Michaelmas. He'd taken it all to run away on. And they murdered him for thirty-one shillings a pound note. The army paid me much more for his father. <laughs> I don't think I shall ever forget that. We arrived at the barracks of the signal company at the port of embarkation shortly after Ravelli. Major Hugh Scott, the young officer commanding who had been an engineer at Wandsworth, was waiting for us in what he called his orderly room. The men were still at breakfast, but the company sergeant major ushered us in. The gentleman from the police, sir. Oh, yes. Thank you, Sergeant Major. Come in, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you, Major. Sit down, gentlemen. I'm afraid I don't know what this is all about, you know. I had an urgent message. Yes. I'm afraid we shall have to cause you some inconvenience. This is a very serious matter. Mm-hmm. I gathered that. It, um, it involves murder, sir. Mm-hmm. You're serious. What do you want me to do? Answer some questions first, Miss Major. As well as I can. Far away. Are all your men present? The Sergeant Major will know that. Sergeant Major. Yes, sir. All our people on hand, Sergeant Major. All present at Ravelli, sir. Thank you. Yes, sir. Well, they're all here, murderers included, if any. You were encamped at the superintendent's village a few nights ago. Right. He called on us. That's correct. You have one vehicle that has a bad leak in the crankcase. How'd you know that? Well, I'm asking you, sir. We surely have. Our number 56 is 56 acting 56 up... of 1,500 weight Fordson. Well, I don't know how you know, but we're having more trouble with this monster. And the day. markings on this lorry? Well, the usual blue and white signals tab. And then uh, there's the section marking on the front door. What's it like, please? An ace of clubs in red and green. Ah. Oh. May we see the driver, please? Of course. Sound major again. Yes, sir. Send in uh, Lance Corporal Latimer. Get him out of our palatial breakfast room, please. Yes, sir. Is he the, he the murderer? We'll see, I hope. A mild-mannered bloke can't see him murdering anyone. Well, you must be wrong. You have a special laundry mark for your company, Major? <laughs> laundry mark? Well, hardly in this man's army. We found one on this khaki handkerchief. Mm, might be anyone's, old chap. I have one myself. It was in the murdered boy's pocket. Boys? Oh, good Lord, gentlemen, do you... Yes? Latimer, sir. Come in, Latimer. Lance Corporal Latimer, sir. Stand easy, Latimer. What makes you jingle so, Corporal? Jingle, sir? You ring like bow bells. Oh, that's shillings, sir. I've got a pocket full of shillings. Excuse me, sir. Never mind, Corporal. Where did you get those shillings? Why, sir, I... Answer anything these gentlemen ask you, Latimer, they're policemen. Oh. I got them from my mate, sir. Who's he? Signal or ruling, sir. Sergeant Major. Yes, sir. Send for ruling. Yes, sir. Thank you, Major Scott. Yeah, that's quite right. Where did he get them? I don't know, sir. Latimer. Is this your handkerchief? Looks like mine, sir. May I see it, please? Yes, sir. Here's the laundry mark they put on it when we were stationed at Leeds, sir. K201537. Yes, sir, that's mine. Where did you lose it? Lose it, sir? I, I didn't lose it. My pal had it. I lent it to him. Ruling? Yes, sir. Sure? Yes, sir, I'm sure. Do you always wear those steel-rimmed glasses, Latimer? 
Yes, sir. Always. Wearing them when you met the lady in the MG the other morning? What morning, sir? When you turned off the side road onto the main road. When you were to camp before the last one. I never saw a lady up there, sir. I, I wasn't even out of the camp. The morning you stopped your lorry on the by road and stayed there a few minutes? I never left the camp, sir. Your lorry was out, I think. I wouldn't know, sir. I, I was working on the generator truck all day, sir. Alone, no doubt. Alone? Yes, sir. Look at this. Do you know what it is? Looks like slabs of plaster, sir. They are plaster casts of tire marks left by your lorry at, uh, at a certain place, Latimer. I don't think they could be, sir. The lorry wasn't in a certain place. What certain place? Well, where you sit, sir. You can easily prove it by comparing these casts with your tires. Well, sir, if it, if it was where you said it was, it, it wasn't me driving it. Where did I say it was? Well, I, well, I don't know, sir. Latimer. Uh, one moment, please, Major. Latimer, do you recognize this? Do you know what it is? No, sir. A red satchel. It was the boy's gas mask case. I never saw it before in all my life, sir. I I'll take my bloody oath to that. What boys, sir? And blast. Come in. What is it, Sergeant Major? Sorry, sir. What? Ruling's missing, sir. I think he's gone over the hill. <laughs> Major Scott got the military police on the track of the missing signal or ruling at once. We wanted to see him badly enough, but um, Major Scott had reasons of his own. Desertion from a post in wartime is also a very serious matter. While a red cap MP lieutenant, a former Berkshire constabulary sergeant, assured the Major that they'd very soon find the adjective rascal... The superintendent and I went out to compare our plaster cast with the tires on lorry number 56. They matched perfectly. We returned to the orderly room to find the policeman gone and Major Scott sitting staring at the contents of Ruling's kit. Look here at these clothes, gentlemen. Hmm. They're soaking wet. Perhaps they were the ones he wore when... It was raining then. They could very well be, if he did it. I didn't do it. Yes, you said that, Latimer. Look. Here's something on the cuff of this jacket. Well, Look here. What's this? Uh, looks like blood. He, he said he cut his hand. Did he? He didn't show me the cut, sir. Then you don't know? No, sir. What kind of chap is this man ruling, anyway? Well, he's a... He's a great husky young fellow. He, he wears steel-rimmed glasses, just like I do. He does. Sir, I... I was just thinking. What? Well, when I came back to my bivvy after working on the generator lorry all day, I, I had a look at 56. And? Mm -hmm. well, she was awfully muddy. Much muddier than the other lorries that had been standing in the park all day. Could someone have taken her out without your knowing it? Could they, Latimer? Would be possible, sir. Ruling? Well, sir, he's, he's supposed to be my pal. But what? He was always drifting off, I remember. Alone. What oh. for? Well, he, he always liked to visit people in the business, he said. What business? The business he was in before he was called up. What's he do? He was a butcher. The MPs brought signaler ruling back at three the next morning... They had found him, they said, standing in front of a... Um, you guess what kind of shop. He was quite self-possessed as he stood in Major Scott's office. Stand easy, Ruling. These gentlemen want to talk to you, Ruling. I say. I think they want to ask you some questions. First, we want to search this man, Major. Go ahead. I'll look at your wallet first, Ruling. I say. Not much in it, sir. We'll see. 
Yes, sir. I opened the wallet. There was nothing in it at all. Nothing except a torn one-pound note. Give me the torn piece of Philip's pound note, I said to the superintendent. That was all. It fitted perfectly. Let me do it. Lewis Ruling, I arrest you for the willful murder of Philip Ainsley Avery. Aye, sir. And I warn you that anything you say will be taken down in writing and may be used in evidence. Ah, I'm not afraid to tell you about it, sir. I killed poor little beggar. He said he was running away to join army. I laughed at him. And he told me he had plenty of money. And I asked him where he kept it. He said in his respirator case. And I reached for it and he yelled. Just like one of them little lambs when you've got it by it back. <laughs> and I got mad. And he jumped out of lorry. And I after him. And he turned to yell at me. And I hit him with a spanner. Just like a cute little lamb. And then he fell down. And I did what you always do to a lamb when you kill it. Lewis Rowling was tried and found guilty of the murder of the poor little lamb. But his counsel appealed on the grounds of insanity, and he was adjudged mentally irresponsible. He was committed to an institution for the criminal insane and died there more than a year ago. You have heard another authentic story from the files of Scotland Yard on Whitehall 1212. Research is prepared by Percy Hoskins of the London Daily Express. The stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Today... Today, 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 Whitehall, one, two, one, two. This is Scotland Yard. first time in history, Scotland Yard opens its secret files to bring you the authentic stories of some of its most baffling cases. These are the stories, the unvarnished facts, just as they occurred, reenacted for you by an all-British cast. Only the names of the participants have for obvious reasons been changed. The stories are presented with the full cooperation of Scotland Yard. Research on Whitehall 1212 is prepared by Percy Hoskins, chief crime reporter of the London Daily Express. The stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper. Here are the participants in case number 921-MR-421. Peter Williams, who boxed at 135 pounds. It's all right. It looked like your duty. Mrs. Jessie Fallowfield, his mother-in-law. It'll come out all right one of these days, I'm sure. Sir Brendan O'Neill, Home Office pathologist at Scotland Yard. We're doing the best we can do. Iris Williams, who resembled her mother. No, no, not to the police station. <laughs> Chief Inspector Oscar Ford of Scotland Yard. On the morning of 19th November, 1943, two engineers employed by a Bedfordshire town discovered something floating, half submerged in the waters of the River Lee. Now, if you'll come with me down the corridor here to the Black Museum, I'll show you what they found. Come along, please. Now this is Scotland Yard's Black Museum, of which you may have heard. Well, Chief Superintendent John Davison doesn't seem to be here. Oh, John. Who is it? It's Austin Ford, John. Oh, I'll be with you at once. Chief Superintendent Davison is the custodian of the Black Museum. Has a long and distinguished record with the Yard. Oh, good afternoon. Came in connection with the Williams case, John. Oh, yes. 921 MR 421. Up here on the shelf. Say, I hope you're not too disappointed in not finding skeletons and gory human bodies lying about in here. 
But they're in short stock with us. Yeah, this is it, Oscar. Actually, this isn't the Grand Guino, you know. The articles filed away in here, all, of course, at some connection with one crime or another, but they're not particularly gory now. We don't keep them here to inspire writers of penny dreadfuls on the wireless at all. No, they're here for the use as reference items in our business of catching criminals. Examples, you see, of how certain crimes were committed. And I think you'd be amazed how much they aid our people in solving of other similar ones. Now, these things in this box are potato sacks. Ordinary rough burlap sacks. But potatoes come in. Other things come in them too, John. Yes, a dead body came in this one. Clammy rain mixed with snow had been falling all day when I arrived at the riverbank, 40 miles north of London. And thanks to the inclement weather, no crowd had gathered. And the huge local constable, the unfortunate victim, and I had the dismal landscape all to ourselves. I showed my card to the constable. Thank you, sir. That's it? I wouldn't look if you don't need to, sir. Drowned, eh? Not only drowned, sir. Oh. Doctor's just left, sir. They'll be coming to take her to the mortuary. Her? He thinks it was a woman. It was, of course, patent that the woman had died a violent death, to use the old cliché, at the hands of a person or persons unknown. Our job was not only to find that person or persons unknown, but first to establish the identity of the unfortunate young woman who had worn potato sacks as her ultimate garment. A homicide is a very personal thing. The relations between victim and killer that exist before the deed are most important in discovering the latter. But lacking identification of the victim, it's most difficult to establish what relations ever existed between the late unlamented and any other person in the world. So one might think that the secret of successful murder is to render your victim unidentifiable. But don't try it. It can't be done. We'll catch you. Sir Brendan O'Neill, the Home Office pathologist, told me to what extent the killer had attempted to prevent identification of the victim and thus of himself. And there are no fingerprints, of course. I, I suggest that you have the bottom of the River Lee dragged at once. Already. See if you can find the missing hand. Already had that, Sir Brendan. No luck so far, though. Well, whoever she was, she wore false teeth, so there's no good trying that one. And teeth are missing, of course. Neither upper nor lower plate. Oh, they might be at the bottom of the river, too, in a foot of mud somewhere. Well, you'll never find them. I've never seen such a completely anonymous body in all my time, Oscar. No scars or moles, birthmarks, that sort of thing? Well, not a thing. I can tell you her height, though. Five feet, three inches, and her weight... Assuming that the missing arms weighed about 20 pounds, that'd make her 121 pounds. Say 120. Quite average brown hair, Bob. Can't tell you what color her eyes were. No. Uh, we're trying to type her blood now. Afraid that's all. You know her age, sir? Oh, I'd say about 27. Oh, yes. And she'd had children. Well, it isn't much to go on, is it? Oh, best we can do, Chief Inspector. Oh, I know that, sir. Those wounds on her head. Mm, hit with something that has a sharp corner. Uh, smashed the skull in three places. Dead when she was thrown into the water. Well, we'll check every missing woman case up Bedfordshire way first. See if we can find out which 120-pound, 5-foot-3 woman is not accounted for. Mm, had children, dull, brown, bobbed hair. That's all of it. I should have listened to my father. Huh? He wanted me to be a parson, sir. Oh. Well, good luck. I'll well, bloody well need it, I muttered to myself as I closed the door. I didn't have any, though, for a long time. This is what we accomplished in the next six weeks. 534 lorry drivers known to have passed the riverbank where the body was found during the 24 hours previous to the finding of the body were investigated and screened. Result? Nothing. The movements of every soldier on day leave from the nearby army camps during that period were traced. Result? Nothing. Every war factory worker in the vicinity, in both day and night shifts, was questioned. Result? Absolutely nothing. 604 women throughout Britain who had been reported missing were checked on by Scotland Yard and Provincial Police. 
The result, all 604 women were found alive. The banks and bottom of the River Lee were searched for two miles in both directions from the place where the body was found. The results, quantities of mud and useless debris. A photograph of the skull was given to an expert artist who carefully reattached it into what we all hoped was a semblance of the dead woman's features. We caused copies of this photograph to be handed from house to house in this market city of 70,000. We had the photograph exhibited on the screens at all the local cinemas. Thousands of persons saw this retouched picture in the weeks before Christmas 1943, including the murderer himself, we found out later. But the results were still nothing at all. On the day after Christmas, the coroner's order for the burial of the remains was signed. Case number 921MR421 was about to be stamped unsolved. As I was leaving the yard on the evening of that 26th, I ran into Chief Superintendent John Davidson, the Black Museum man. Have a good Christmas, sir, I asked. Not bad at all, Oscar. Very pleasant. You? I worked. What a pity. Understand they're burying that girl tomorrow. I expect that's the end of it. Burying her up there in Bedfordshire, are they? Aye. Going to the funeral? Well, sir, you'd hardly call it a funeral, exactly. You're going? Hardly, sir. Hmm. Oh, have a cigar? A Canadian friend of mine sent me a box for Christmas. Real Corona Perfectos. Thank you, sir. Well, one more for me, then. I should think it would be an act of Christian charity if you did attend the girl's funeral. Well, sir, I... I remember once about 199 or 10, if I remember correctly... I think it was old Smudgy Steele, Inspector Steele, dead now. He nabbed a man at a funeral. That's who, sir. The murderer. Chap came to gloat, I expect, at his victim's last rites. Steele wondered who this stranger was and got into conversation with him. <laughs> Orson Wells or someone ought to get hold of that one. <laughs> Make a corking good penny dreadful, wouldn't it? The stranger at the funeral. <laughs> but it really happened. Might happen again, too, you know. Well, good night. Yeah, uh, good night, sir. And so I rode 40 miles to a market town on a dismal day after Boxing Day to a grimy little cemetery not far from one of the hat factories for which the town is celebrated. The two second assistant sextons were shoveling the frozen clods into the raw new grave as I walked away from there with the huge constable and the young army chaplain who had been summoned away from a nearby officer's mess to officiate. The cemetery was deserted except for us. The murderer hadn't been in attendance after all. The big constable and I walked on past the hat factory whilst the young chaplain left to go back to his unfinished lunch. It was cold streets almost deserted. The policeman talked about the tug of war at the last summer's police game. I give you my word, sir. I never saw such a team as them blokes from the city police. Uh -huh. Not a man less than 15 stone amongst them and coop blow that anchor man. Well, that chap weighed not a pound less than 17 stone and strong. Oh, a ruddy bull. Name of Brian O'Brien from Galway originally. <laughs> I, I thought I should have died laughing, sir. <laughs> the way that belt nearly cut him in two. Yeah. He sunk them great eels in and he huffed and he puffed. Hey, what's the matter with you, young lady? Uh, nothing the matter with her voice. Oh, now, what's the matter, dear? I want my mummy. Oh, she's lost the best thing of the nearest police station, eh? Come along, young lady. No, policeman, no. Oh, she thinks you're going to throw her in jail. No. I'm not going to pinch your sister. You lost, you see. Mummy lost. Mummy lost. Probably swilling tea somewhere or else planted in a cinema. No. Mummy in London. Mummy got. I want my mummy. Oh, that's jolly. Now what do we do, Constable? Mummy said she's coming home for Christmas. And Mummy not go. Poor little tight. <laughs> Here, little girl. Little girl. What's your name? Well, look up at me. Here, let me let me see your face. What's the matter, sir? I have a hunch. Yes, sir. Now, don't let that kid get away. Here. 
what she's done to. I'll show you in a second. Well, keep her quiet, will you, before we run in. Stow it, you little dolly. Oh! No, no, mustn't fight. Oh! Hurry up, sir, please. Oh, give her a sixpence or something. I'll find it in a minute. Ah, here. Here it is. Look at it. Look at it. Now, don't let her see it. No, love a ruddy duck. You recognize the paper there? Of course, sir. We circulated thousands of these all over town. Well, tell me what it is. Oh, darling. Um, yes, sir, it's the picture of the missing woman that you people at Scotland Yard had made up. What else do you see? Sir? I said, what else do you see? Oh, this little maniac whose mother is missing is the spitting image of the picture. All right. Come on, come on, darling. We'll take you home. My mommy come home. Now, dear, your mommy can't come out now. We accompanied the little girl whose name we learned was Iris Williams, age three, to her home, a short distance away. It was a modest three-room flat occupied by a Mrs. Jessie Fallowfield, the child's grandmother, and her son-in-law, Iris' father, a member of the local National Fire Service unit. Little Iris retreated to the doorstep with an enormous slice of bread and wild bramble jelly while Mrs. Fallowfield talked with us. Yes, I've been here only two weeks, you see. I didn't want to talk before little Iris. Her mother's away. My daughter. So we understand from Iris, Mrs. Fallowfield. Quite. I don't like to have to say it, but Jessie, my daughter, she has the same name as mine, and Peter, my son-in-law, didn't get on together. Where is your son? At the fire station. Uh Well, to speak quite plainly, my Jessie wrote to me at Seven Oaks in Kent, you know, that she couldn't stand it here with Peter any longer, and she was going away. Well, how long ago was that? Oh, the 19th of November. Uh-huh. You haven't heard from her since? Oh, yes, indeed, almost every week. You've heard from her since she left? Oh, yes, but we're on the best of terms, as long as we're not together, you see. I'm afraid she's a bit flighty. Well... One can't live one's daughter's life, can one? No, no, one can't. And you say you heard from her recently? Oh, yes. As a matter of fact, the reasons I came from Seven Oaks to live here is because she wrote asking me to. She did? Yes, she insisted she couldn't live with Peter. But he needs to be taken care of, says she, and won't you go and make a home for him, Mother? So that's why I'm here. Peter just moved in with me a week ago. It's very cosy. Though I do wish she'd come home again, though it would probably be the same thing all over again. Bicker, bicker, bicker. Oh, there's no peace in this world anywhere, is there? Well, uh, I'm sure we're very sorry to have bothered you, Mrs. Fallowfield, but we were quite captivated by little Iris. I do hope she didn't hurt you. Oh, I better make sure to come and fix that up, ma'am. Iris was quite upset that her mother hadn't come home for Christmas. Oh, my, yes. Though Jessie wrote both Peter and me saying she couldn't make it. She was so busy there in Hampstead, the Christmas rush and all. A hairdresser, you said? Yes, but I'm afraid I don't know the name of the place. Well, it doesn't really matter since you're sure it was your daughter's handwriting in that letter. Well, I should think I'd be able to recognize that handwriting of hers. (laughs) The hours I've spent trying to teach her to write tidily. (laughs) Well, I hope you'll pardon our intrusion, Mrs. Fallowfield. We were so taken with dear little Iris. Yes. And rather alarmed about her mother. Oh. And I'm afraid that we, uh, police officers... Suspicious. I'm sorry. Well, there's nothing at all to worry about my daughter, gentlemen. I'm quite sure that she's safe. Oh, I'm quite sure of that, madam. But, uh, her husband, your son. Oh, I'm sure. Oh, I wouldn't be surprised if that's Peter now. Peter? Hello, Ma. There's another letter from Jesse here. Oh, I'm sorry. These gentlemen are from the police, Peter. The police? About Jesse? I'm happy to see you, Mr. Williams. Oh, I'm Chief Inspector Ford of Scotland Yard. What? What's this about Jesse? Oh, don't be alarmed, Peter. Iris was blubbering in the street about her mummy being lost, and these gentlemen were afraid murder has been done or something equally horrid and brought her home. Oh, well, well, thank you, gentlemen. Mother, I must have tea early. I'm fighting tonight. My son is a boxer. You're, you're a lightweight, I take it, Mr. Uh, Williams? Uh-huh. 135 pounds, yes. Didn't see your name on the card. At the drill hall, eh? Yes. Slasher Rifkin broke his wrist this afternoon. 
I'm a substitute. Oh, I shall probably see you then. Too bad about Slasher. Good man, that. Saw him fight that Australian four weeks ago. Oh, I've beaten him twice. He can't stand up against a left-handed boxer. You're left-handed? Yes. Another letter from Jesse Peter. Yes. The postman was just passing, and he... Uh, that another example of your daughter's handwriting, Mrs. Fallowfield? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, of course. Did you ever see such writing? A girl will never learn. <laughs> Nobody could ever imitate that writing. Well, gentlemen, I'm sorry that you've had to get mixed up in all this. My wife's a very charming girl, but... Can... Oh, we quite understand. I, uh, I hope you'll forgive our intrusion. Oh, it's all right. <coughs> Looked like your duty, I suppose. Another one of those unfortunate affairs. I'm sorry about it, but, well, you're men of the world. You understand. Oh, yes, absolutely. Quite, quite. It'll all come out right one of these days, I'm sure, though. It's all right, Mother Fallowfield. Hey, gentlemen, if you'll excuse me, I've got to have my tea now. Oh, of course, of course. Uh, so sorry to have disturbed you, sir, and uh, Mrs. Fallowfield. Oh, it's quite all right. Good night. Good night. Good, Good night. night. Now, Peter, would you fancy a nice kipper, perhaps? <coughs> well, <coughs> what did you think? Sir, done a bit of boxing in my time, too. What? One thing I learned many years ago. Yes? Never trust a left-handed boxer. I went back to London completely baffled at this turn of events that had suddenly reopened a case that should have been closed in that wintry little graveyard. Here was almost indubitable proof that the woman we had buried was still alive and in constant communication with her husband and her mother. The letter from her had arrived on the very day I had seen her body committed to the frozen ground. It was impossible, obviously. Well, at my desk at Scotland Yard the next morning... I arranged to have every known hairdressing shop in Hampstead and the whole north of London investigated to find if any employed a girl named Jessie Williams or Jessie Fallowfield. I'd caught the return address on the envelope in the Fallowfield flat, and it said, Jessie Williams, Hampstead. Hampstead. Spelled that way, without the P. H-A-M-S-E-E-A-D. I remembered. Well, I thought she spells as badly as she writes. I dismissed it and picked up the telephone to make a routine inquiry. Criminal Records Office, Sergeant Healy. Healy, I'd like you to look up a chap for me, please. Who is this speaking, please? Oh, I'm sorry. Chief Inspector Ford. Yes, sir. A chap named Peter Williams, a boxer by profession. See if we've ever had any dealings with him before, will you? Take some time, sir. Oh, good enough. Ring me when you find out, will you? Williams, Peter. That's all I know about him. All right. Thank you. I went upstairs to see Sir Brendan O'Neill, the home office pathologist. Hello, Oscar. Get her buried, all right? Yes, sir. Now, sit down. But I want to dig her up again. Oh, what for, old boy? Can it be done? Well, of course, if there's sufficient reason. I need to know one or two things. Well, it's unusual, but... Uh... The case isn't closed yet. I saw to that. Well, if her relatives don't raise the row... We haven't been able to find any relatives, sir. Oh, that's right, isn't it? Well, in that case, dig her up. Right, sir. Then we can have her sent down here, and I'll need your personal assistance, Sir Brendan. For what? I want to find out some things. Well, I can't tell you her name, Oscar. Perhaps I can. Well, what do you want me to do, then? Help me to find a very clever murderer, sir. <laughs> These things happened during the next two days. First, a report from the officer in charge of checking the hairdressing establishments. We have checked every hairdressing shop in the entire north portion of London, with special reference to Hampstead, sir. 131 shops. Not one has any record of a woman named Jessie Williams or Jessie Fallowfield. There was only one Jessie among them all, a Mrs. Jessie Forrester, age 61. She was obviously not the person we was after. Thank you, Sergeant. Yes, sir. A report from the Criminal Records Office of Scotland Yard. Sergeant Healy speaking, sir. We checked thoroughly on your boxer, Peter Peter Williams. Find anything on him? Yes, sir. He's been up twice. Convicted. Penal servitude in both instances. Good. That all, sir? Yes. Oh, no. Uh, what was he charged with? Forgery, sir. A 
A final visit to Sir Brendan O'Neill's laboratory. Here's the... Uh, here's the report, Oscar. She was struck twice on the head with a flat object, like a wide metal bar or a heavy, narrow wooden plank. Uh, the instrument was of undetermined length, uh, but the marks on the skull indicate that it was three and seven-eighths inches wide, uh, at the point where it was struck into the skull. Mm, very good indeed, Sir Brendan. Uh, how about the other experiment? Well, they're still working on that. Ah, looks rather silly, doesn't it? I think you were right. Will you be able, do you think, to swear to it if, uh, if you find I'm right, sir? Well, if results continue this way, we shall. Uh, you sent for me, Sir Brandon? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, you're Hayes, aren't you? Yes, sir. Mm. Right or left-handed, Hayes? Left-handed, sir. Good. Uh, over on that side, they'll call you when they're ready, Hayes. Uh, yes, sir. Would you like to take a little trip up to Bedfordshire with me, Sir Brendan? My constable friend from the tug-of-war team had briefed me on how to find the little house where the boxer Williams had lived with his wife, Jessie, before she went away, as he said, to Hampstead, before he had gone to live with her mother. It was a tiny cottage not far from his present flat. I noted with interest that one of the windows looked out onto the graveyard where we had buried that poor woman a few days before. We walked around the place, staring at the neat rooms, empty as they'd stood since Williams had moved out. There was nothing at all at first to excite our interest. Sir Brennan O'Neill walked into the tiny stone-floored scullery. I watched with the other Scotland Yard man who'd come with us. Sir Brendan spoke from the other room. Uh, this might be it, Oscar. And uh, this strip of wood on this old bench here. Uh, measure it. Three. Three and seven-eighths inches, all right. Well, right width, Oscar. Good. It's been nailed on fairly recently, sir. These are new nails. Mm. See if you can get it off. Uh, carefully. Oh, I can do it. Hand me the parcel, Oscar. What's that, sir? It's a skull. Never mind it. The, uh, the piece of wood. You've been here before, madam. Fits the scars perfectly, Oscar. I think we've got... <coughs> that him? Right inside, Mr. William, if you please. That's him. Back here in the scullery, constable. Right, sir. Good afternoon, Mr. Williams. Hello, Inspector Ford, Scotland Yard, sir. I'm afraid I don't quite understand. Why, we'll try to show you, Mr. Williams. I really haven't much time. I... <laughs> uh, that's enough, Constable. What? A few things, Mr. Williams. Now, what's the name of that place that your wife writes to you from? Why, Hampstead. How do you spell that? Why, H-A-M-S-T-E-A-D. How interesting. Well, that's the way it's spelled on those letters from your wife, isn't it? Isn't that right? I... That's the way I always spelled it. I Exactly. This object is the skull of a woman. Shall we say, uh, resembled your wife in many ways? I don't know. I... May I have the club, Sir Brendan? Thank you. This heavy plank, which is been once removed from this stool here and been replaced, fits the scars on the skull exactly. You see? Now, look here, I don't know about Watch him, that. Constable. I'm watching him, sir. And Sir Brendan O'Neill here conducted certain experiments with this poor relic of the woman who so closely resembled your wife, Mr. Williams. A large number of men... 141. 141 men struck at this skull which was placed where a standing woman's head might be. What is this nonsense? I'm afraid it's far from nonsense, Williams. <gasps> None of the right-handed men were able to strike the skull at all in the region of the scars. But every left-handed man could. Steady, lefty. Peter Williams, I arrest you on a charge of willful murder of your wife, Jessie Williams. And I warn you that anything you may say will be taken down in writing and may be used in evidence. Do you wish to make a statement at this time? The 
evidence was incontestable. At the trial, the testimony of handwriting experts proved that Williams had written the letters purposely coming from his wife after her death. The days on which these letters had been posted were in every case the days on which Williams had been off duty, the only days on which he had been able to go to London for that purpose. It was demonstrated in court that only a left-handed man could have struck the fatal blows. The testimony of more than a dozen acquaintances of the couple provided the motive for the murder. And in a dramatic break with his counsel in open court, Williams shouted out his confession that he had indeed committed the brutal murder. He was sentenced to be hanged, and the sentence was executed on May Day, 1944. <laughs> have heard another in the series Whitehall 1212, compiled by special permission from the official files of Scotland Yard. Only the names have been changed, otherwise the story is true. Research for Whitehall 1212 is prepared by Percy Hoskins of the London Daily Express. The stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper. <laughs> Three chimes mean good times on NBC. There's it. Whitehall, one, two, one, two. This is Scotland Yard. For the first time in history, Scotland Yard opens its secret files to bring you the authentic stories of some of its most baffling cases. These are the true stories, the unvarnished facts, just as they occurred reenacted for you by an all-British cast. Only the names of the participants have for obvious reasons been changed. The stories are presented with the full cooperation of Scotland Yard. Research on Whitehall 1212 is prepared by Percy Hoskins, chief crime reporter for the London Daily Express. The stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper. I am Chief Richard Anderson of Scotland Yard. Murder with a gun is, is not common in Britain. But Anthony de Bruyne was shot to death. I would like you to see the evidence that led us eventually to the murderer. This is Chief Superintendent John Davidson. And you're standing in Scotland Yard's Black Museum, of which I have the honor to be the custodian. Now, while we have certain extremely gruesome objects in these two rooms, many of them are quite innocuous when taken out of context. They're here not as ghoulish exhibits for the morbid, but as examples for study by our people in connection with their jobs. Now, such an exhibit is this one in case number 160277. Now, this is an ordinary cheap raincoat, ah, that's identical the one, that's the one. with those worn by thousands of men. 
identifying tags of all kinds had been removed. It was completely anonymous. Our people thought it might be an important clue to the identity of the murderer. It seemed impossible. But my good friend Inspector Anderson here followed this extremely tenuous clue to the end. Almost to the end, sir. What do you mean, Inspector? I wasn't present when they were hanged, sir. The crime. At 10 o'clock of the morning of April 3rd, 1947, Anthony de Brun, a young stockbroker's clerk, was walking with his fiancée toward Howard's Jewelry Shop in Charlotte Street near Tottenham Court Road in London. They were on their way to purchase an engagement ring. Or at least six carats, darling. Set in platinum, too. I wish I could afford it, really, though. Whatever it is, I'll love it, Anthony. <laughs> well, come on. Let's see what I can afford, shall we? Darling. Hey! hey, hey Robert! Out of the road, there you go! Oh, my God! Out of the road! From Inspector Anderson's first notes on case 160277. Uh, robbers wore white cloth masks. Faces not seen by anyone at murder scene. Apparently young men. No jewelry taken. De Bruyne only casualty. Shot through head. N.B. Pathologist extracting bullet for examination. Gun not found. Apparently taken with him by murderer. Girl hysterical, unable to talk coherently. Witnesses to murder unable to identify. <laughs> murder and companion disappeared inside business building at number 14 Charlotte Street. Interview with Thomas Cobley, porter at number 14, by Detective Sergeant John Quinn of Scotland Yard. Oh, I've seen him all right, sir. See this knob on me head? One of them hit me with a bleeding great pistol as he ran past me, sir. After that, he tried to shoot me, but the thing wouldn't go off. Could you recognize either of them again, Cobbley? Oh, that I could, sir. Both of them had their masks hanging about their necks. I've seen their faces all right. I'd recognize the one with the mustache anyway, sir. I think. You know how they were dressed? Well, uh, uh, one of them had on a raincoat, sir. The other one, uh, uh, well, I'm afraid I don't remember, sir. But I'd know him again, sir. Interview with Police Constable Roy Harris on point duty near the rear entrance to number 14. Yes, Sergeant. Uh, it was them, all right, I'm sure. Two men answering to Cobbley's description came running out of the rear entrance at 10-7, Sergeant. I saw the one with the moustache. Would you recognize him again, Constable? Oh, I'm sure I would, Sergeant. However, I didn't notice the raincoat. In fact, I'm sure that neither of them wore one. But you would recognize them again, though? Positively, Sergeant. Raincoat or no raincoat. Inspector Anderson of Scotland Yard. We found the raincoat three hours later. It had been hastily tucked in a dark corner of the hallway at number 14, through which the men had apparently run. Yes, it was the same coat you saw in the Black Museum a few moments ago. The manufacturer's label had been removed, so had the label of the shop that had sold it. it contained no initials, no marks of any sort. A shabby, shapeless garment that might have been worn by anyone. In the right-hand side pocket was a caliber 45 automatic pistol, the type used by the American Army. It apparently been fired twice. A clip containing four ball cartridges was still in place with an additional one in the chamber. I took it myself to Chief Inspector Carl Tree in the ballistic laboratory. I, I had it checked, Anderson, for fingerprints. And? None, of course. Uh, let's use one of those shells. Tom, did you fill the catchment box with cotton wool? Yes, sir. All right, stand aside, Anderson. All right, Tom, get it out, will you, please? All right, sir. First time I've seen that, sir. All right, they're sending us up the bullet they're taking out of this chap's head. Post-mortem must be about finished. Then we'll put them both under the comparison microscope and see for certain if this is the gun they both came from. Quiet. I I'll be waiting, sir. All right. We'll let you know at once. By the next afternoon, the 4th April, we were certain this was the murder gun. Ergo, the raincoat had probably belonged to the murderer, the man with the moustache, who we had been assured could be readily recognized. If we could find him, that would be difficult. I put criminal records onto it. They produced some 150 dossiers of known criminals whose taste ran to robbing jewelry shops and or carrying guns. Further checks showed that the pistol had been stolen from a U.S. amphibious engineer regiment in June 1946. 
There is no clue to the thief, the American Army DCI informed us. The porter Cobbley remembered that the men had worn gloves. The constable said that he did not see the direction they had gone. They simply lost themselves in the crowd of passers-by. Quinn and I went over the anonymous raincoat again. I haven't been able to discover anything, sir. Uh, he's done a good job. Every single identification that's visible to the naked eye has been removed. How do you know? I compared it with me own and Nobby Clark's and yours, sir. All the tags on this one are gone. I wonder if he removed things that aren't visible to the naked eye. You mean things you might find with ultraviolet or infrared light, sir? I was thinking of something else. What, sir? Get me a razor blade, Quinn. You, you're going to rip the coat apart. I was lucky. The first cut I'd made. The seam where the left sleeve was attached to the coat itself revealed a tiny stamped paper tag sewed inside the lining. It was a kind of manufacturer's stock tag. Photographs were quickly made, circulated to every manufacturer of raincoats in the country. That took a week, but a firm in Leeds identified it at once as one of theirs. The coats, they said, bearing that stock number, had been sold to shops in southeast London, either Deptford or Bermondsey. Well, thank heaven for forgers, Quinn, I said. That I don't get, sir. Look, A, people forge clothing coupons. Yes, sir. B, when you buy clothing at any store in London, the shopkeeper puts down the number of the coupon book, what you've bought, and your name. Why, oh, that's right, sir. Uh, go and find me the names of the people who bought these clothes. <laughs> It wasn't quite as simple as all that. Uh, but it wasn't so hard either. There had been 24 dozen of that lot of raincoats sold in those two districts, and we accounted for all but six of them. Inspector Anderson and I went over the list of 282 names. We found not one name we'd ever heard of, and criminal records reported that none of them were known in their files. Well, it was a good try, sir, I said to Inspector Anderson. Well, we still haven't checked on each of these names personally. Uh, we'll have to do it, sir, I expect. Quite. Well, gird up your loins, Quinn. Sir, they're right up under me chin now. I was just thinking of something. Sir? Got your own book of clothing coupons on you? Yes, sir. Let's see them, will you? Yes, sir. Sign? Sign it myself, sir. Hmm. hmm. What's the matter, sir? What's your name? John Quinn, you know that, sir. This is signed Quinn John. Well, by crikey. And mine is signed Anderson Richard. <laughs> Let's look at this list again, the hind end, too. Yes, sir. Clancy Oliver. That'd be Oliver Clancy. Gold Joseph. Never heard of Joe Gold. Johnston John. No, John Johnston. She and Robert. No one could be named She and Robert. We're right, old boy. Freeman George. George Freeman. Mullen... Fry Crikey, I remember that name. So do I, sir. But he died last month. Yes, sir. A smash and grab fella. A uh, real white boy. I remember. He killed in a bus accident in Clarkenwell. He must have bequeathed the coat to somebody, mustn't he? Hmm. You know, I, I seem to remember... He, he had a kid brother in Boston, sir. Check up and see if he's still there. If he's been let out, I shall very much want to talk with young Mr. Freeman. In the room in Clarkenwell where George Freeman had lived prior to his untimely death, Sergeant Quinn found the younger brother, Arthur, who had been released from Boston Reformatory only a few weeks before. He was quite willing to accompany the sergeant to Scotland Yard, where Inspector Anderson interviewed him. Sit down, Freeman. Don't mind if I do. Um, we found your raincoat, Freeman. Did you? Yes. Who had it? What? Oh, I lent it to a fella. Who? <laughs> oh, I'm not a copper's mark, Mr. Inspector. You, um, you lent it to someone, then? Yes. Listen, uh, what do you want of me? We want some people to see you. What about? Oh, a little affair up Tottenham Court Road, right? Oh, uh, that fellow got murdered. Right. 
Well, who wants to see me? I should think you could guess. Oh, do no good. I wasn't there. That you can prove, no doubt. Oh, I've got an alibi. I'd be glad to hear about it. I'll tell you when the time comes. I've got it all right. I expected you would have one. How did you know it was my raincoat? It was your brother's, wasn't it? You're pretty smart. Thank you. But not as smart as you think, Mr. Inspector. Have you any objection to appearing as an identification parade? Me? Uh, other people going to appear with me? Of course. Same size as me. Mm -hmm. Same build, mm -hmm. uh, and so forth? Naturally. Well, uh, if you're afraid you'll be identified, Freeman, nobody will identify me. Well, in that case, I shouldn't think you'd object. I'm not objecting. Well, then. I just don't want to be framed. You needn't worry about that. Oh, oh. Take it or leave it, Freeman. Heads, you win. Tails, I lose, eh? If I won't do it, you lock me up and... Uh, I'll arrest you on very definite suspicion. Yes. And if I do, you will contrive some way to point me out to the... Look here, Freeman, I'm trying to be fair. Oh. I won't even go in the room where they're having the identification parade. Huh? You'll leave me go as soon as it's over. If you're not identified, yes. Nobody will identify me. All right. All right, then. I'm not afraid. Sergeant Quinn. Yes, sir. Quinn, this gentleman's for the identification parade. Will you show him the way, please? Oh, yes, sir. Well, will you come with me, please, sir? Lead the way, my good man. Thank you. You want to know uh, who I lent that raincoat to? I'd be most interested. Tell you what I'll do. I got an idea. That raincoat was found somewhere near that Charlotte Street place. Is that right? Was it? Yes. Huh? You'd like to know who it was that lost it, eh? I'm not going to bargain with you, Freeman. <laughs> I just want to be bloody sure I'm not being framed. When I walk out of that identification parade without being fingered by anybody, then I'll tell you who I'll enter to. Thank you. Uh, uh, are you ready, sir? In a moment, my good man. That's a promise. Was. Freeman was not identified by anybody. True, only two persons, the constable and the porter, had seen the killers without their masks, but neither was able to point out any person in the lineup at all. Freeman, in high glee, returned to my room. Come on, let the raincoat to is Charlie Mortimer. Within the hour, criminal records had supplied us with details of Charles Mortimer whose record showed he had served two terms at Dartmoor for armed robbery. Two detective constables were sent at once to his last address of record. Mr. Mortimer was not at home, but in his room were found three Patek Philippe watches. They were at once identified as part of the loot from a jewellery shop robbery at Queensway in Bayswater a few days before the one in which the man de Bruin was killed. Well, I said to Sergeant Quinn... Our friend Mortimer may not be the murderer we want, but he'll have some explaining to do. Why don't you think he's the murderer? I didn't say that. I said he may not be the murderer. Well, sir, if he had the raincoat... If. Yes, sir. I've seldom heard of people like Freeman implicating others in murder. Except for a reason. To get even is the phrase. Ah, uh, there's another thing. If Mortimer was in on the jewelry shop job in Bayswater... As he obviously was... At least he had those three watches. Well, if he was, why should he try armed robbery again two days later, sir? That's a very important point, Quinn. I think so. Well, when we find Mortimer, we'll have a lot of questions to ask. We'll find him. Oh, excuse me. Inspector Anderson here. Oh, hello, Thomas. You have? Good. Where? We found him. Mortimer? Yes. Hello, uh, Thomas. Where is he now? Oh, here. Well, <laughs> send him in. I'll go get him, sir. Good. Quinn's coming to fetch him. Uh, did he talk? Didn't ask him any questions. <laughs> Good. Let him think it's the Bayswater job he's been mad for. Right. 
And may I say that's very fine, quick work. Quinn will be there any second. Quite. Goodbye, boy. Hello, uh, uh, Inspector Anderson again. Will you ring George and ask him how soon he can get those people together again? The people that attended the identification parade this morning. The ones on the Charlotte Street murder case. Uh, what's the number? Um, 160277. Thank you. Ask him to let me know as soon as he can, will you? Thank you. <laughs> what is it the Americans say? We're in business. Ah, ah Sergeant Quinn. This is Mortimer, sir. Go on in. You may sit down, Mortimer. Mm. Sit down, Quinn. Thank you, sir. Has he been charged? Yes, sir. Accessory to armed robbery. Warned, of course. Anything I say may be taken down in writing and used as evidence. Ask me no questions, I'll tell you no lies. Uh, let me ask you one, Mortimer. Where's your raincoat? Out there at the desk. I mean the one you borrowed. What did I borrow one for? I've got one. I thought you borrowed one from Arthur Freeman. From Artie Freeman? Now, look here, mister. Artie Freeman's been looking for me ever since I... Uh, ever since that jewellery shop job in Bayswater that your bloody coppers pulled me in for. Do you think he'd lend me anything? Why is Artie Freeman looking for you, Mortimer? He's promised to cut me throat the minute he sees me. <laughs> This is how Charles Mortimer explained that somewhat astonishing statement. It was on the day that Arthur Freeman was released from a Boston institution where, as a juvenile delinquent, he had served a long sentence. A friend of his, a certain Basil Green, another ex Boston boy, and Charles Mortimer had arranged a welcome home party for Arthur at a pub in Clerkenwell. It was quite a party, Mortimer said. After the other guests had departed, Arthur Freeman and Charles Mortimer sat at a table together and talked. The third man, Green, was asleep on the floor. Welcome home again, Artie, old boy. Welcome home to you, Charlie. Very happy return. That's right. Give a drink. Yeah, I'll see you. Yo. I got extra some money. Well, I got two half crowns. More than that. I ain't got no more. Maybe Basil's got some. Hey, Basil... Why am I? He's asleep. There he is. Take your foot off his face. Why? Got to be polite. I'm fired. I need money. I'm stony. Let's go get some. All right. You know where? I know a jewelry shop. Let's go rob it. What I mean? Hey, he's got a gun. I ain't got a gun. I'll borrow batteries. Where's this jewelry establishment? Huh? Bayswater. Queensway Bayswater. <laughs> Listen, uh, you double cross me, I cut your heart out. Oh, I ain't gonna double cross you. Better not. I slit your throat, boy. Just don't worry about your pal, Charlie Morrison, old boy. <laughs> uh, where we do it? What? Rob jewelry shop, kill people in shop, get jewels. I got the place all figured out, been casing it. Taking sides. That's right. When we all do it? Tomorrow. Oh, listen. Uh, oh, oh let go. Listen, uh, I'm not kidding about this, Charlie. I ain't had a sixpence of my own for so long. Not a bloody farthing. I gotta have money. Let go. If I have to kill somebody to get it. That's all right, too. If I got a kill to get money, I'm the lad will do it. Look at me, Charlie. And I don't care who I kill. And that goes for you, too, if you cross me up. I'm not going to... You understand? Gonna think I'm a crook? Meet me and Basil tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock on the down platform at Bayswater. I'll bring Basil's gun. We're gonna be rich, Clark. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that was the way the first robbery began. The first association of Arthur Freeman, Basil Green, and Charles Mortimer. The affair was quite successful from their standpoint, and the three men separated, Mortimer carrying the loot. Mortimer went directly to a receiver of stolen goods and disposed of all but the three watches we found in his lodgings. 
thoroughly dishonest crook. The rage of Arthur Freeman was terrible to behold when he came to Mortimer's deserted lodgings and found only the three watchers, watches Mortimer told us. He told us more. I heard from Basil Green that he raged, simply raged, sir. Cut me throat from ear to ear, he said. Cut me up in little pieces and feed them to me, he promised. I was fair upset. Gentlemen, I never killed nobody. I know he'd do what he said because I know the knife he carries. I'll be safe in prison, won't I? Won't I? I'm bloody weary of dodging Artie Freeman. I was just on my way to a boat for South America when your Scotland Yard gentleman picked me up. You saw the tickets. Inspector Anderson sent me to pick up Basil Green and Arthur Freeman. I found Green easily enough, but our chief suspect, Freeman, had disappeared. As an identification parade, Green was quickly identified by those present at the Charlotte Street murder. No one even looked at Mortimer. Green was placed under arrest for complicity in the latter case. Mortimer was tried and convicted for the Bayswater robbery. Green, a rather simple-minded young spiv, decided to make a statement. Yes, sir, my own free will in the court. Yes, sir, I understand what I say will be used in evidence. Go ahead, Green. Well, sir, well, I start. Whatever you like. <clears throat> well, sir, I, I was asleep when they planned it. Do you mean when Mortimer and Freeman planned the first robbery? Huh? Yes, sir, that's what I mean. <laughs> Artie and me and Charlie went to Bayswater and we did that thing. Do you mean the robbery? Huh? Yes, sir, that's what I mean. Charlie took the stuff we got and when Artie and me went to find him, he was gone. You know about that, sir. And then Artie got awful mad, and he cursed, and he... What What did he say? Well, I couldn't repeat that, sir. There's, there's a lady present. And Miss Bellamy will hold her ears. Yes, sir. Well, you threatened Charlie and said he'd cut off Charlie's bloody ears and cut his throat and stab him and murder him. And that is Charles yes, Mortimer you're referring to. Huh? Yes, sir, that's what I mean. So... Then he said we had to have some money right away. You're now referring to Arthur Freeman? Huh? Yes, sir, that, that's what I mean. He said he wouldn't give me my gun back, and we'd go and stick up another jewelry store right away, and I told him I knew a little about this place in Charlotte Street, and he said, all right, let's go. We went and looked at it, and the next morning we did it. Uh, what'll I say now, sir? Whatever you like. Well, sir, we had those masks on we used at Bayswater. As soon as we went in the place, somebody shouted, and somebody must have pressed a buzzer or something. And Artie yelled out. Now, he cursed, sir. And we run out, and there was this man, this De Bruyne, or whatever his name was. He, he was just coming in the door, and he said, Stop, and Artie cursed again and shot the man, and we ran. Now, masks was falling down, and... We hit a band in the other building. We run right through it and out the back, and Artie took off his raincoat. It used to be his brother George's. He was a very nice fellow. You are now referring to George Freeman as a nice fellow. Huh? Yes, sir, that's who I mean. Artie wasn't. Isn't, I mean. Well, Artie swore at the raincoat and said he could be identified by it and threw it away. That's the way it was, sir. Your statement will be given to you after it's typed. What for, sir? For you to read and sign. Sir, I can't read very good. Well, I know where you can find Artie if you want him, sir. You, you know where he is? Yes, sir. You die when I tell you, sir. <laughs> Should I tell you, sir? If, if you like, Green. Well, sir, he's in jail. And there he was, in Brixton Jail. We hastened there, and the warder took us down to the cell block, where after a long walk, we finally found our man. He grinned through the bars at me. Hello, Inspector. Hello, Freeman. How'd you find me? Your friend, Basil Green, told us. I'll kill him for that. I doubt it. What are you in for, Freeman? Hey, well, I broke a policeman's jaw. I thought they'd send me up for a while for that. By the way, my name's William Patterson in here. Good place to hide out. Not good enough. I got a little bothered about you, you see. Obviously. You found Charlie Mortimer? Yes. And he talked? At great length. Just as Basil Green did. Unlucky for me. Oh, no. 
We came to get you out of here. Oh, yeah. And take you elsewhere. Arthur Freeman, I arrest you on a charge of willful murder. I warn you that anything you, you say will be taken take down in writing and may be used in evidence. evidence. Unlock the door, please, Water. At the trial at Old Bailey, both Arthur Freeman and Basil Green were found guilty of the murder of Anthony de Bruyne and were sentenced to be hanged. The sentence was duly carried out. You have heard another in the series Whitehall 1212, compiled by special permission from the Spiles of Scotland Yard. Only the names have been changed. Research for Whitehall 1212 is prepared by Percy Hoskins of the London Daily Express. The stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper. This evening, Whitaker Chambers comes to the NBC microphone to read a letter to his children. Now, this is not an ordinary letter. This letter means as much to you, the Americans, as it does to Miss closest relative. This letter brings you the true nature of communism, its political implication to you as a citizen of the world, more particularly of the United States of America. And this evening, Mr. Chambers will tell you why he chose communism, what he thought it would mean to him politically and personally. That's a letter to his children by Whitaker Chambers. Beginning next Sunday, February 24th, the time period now featuring Whitehall 1212 will be occupied by Hollywood Star Playhouse, which will be followed immediately by Whitehall 1212. Whitehall 1212. This is Scotland Yard. <laughs> For the first time in history, Scotland Yard opens its official files to bring you the authentic stories of some of its most baffling cases. These are the true stories, the unvarnished facts, just as they occurred, reenacted for you by an all-British cast. Only the names of the participants have for obvious reasons been changed. The stories are presented with the full cooperation of Scotland Yard. Research on Whitehall 1212 is prepared by Percy Hoskins, chief crime reporter for the London Daily Express. The stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper. Here is the story of Scotland Yard file 133123. This is Chief Superintendent John Davidson of Scotland Yard. Good afternoon. The Black Museum contains articles which have figured to a greater or less degree in several thousands of cases, a great many of them involving the crime of murder. Case number 133123 occurred, believe it or not, a few years before my time here at the Yard, in the year 1910, 42 years ago. However, it is still remembered as one of the most unusual cases in the Yard's history, and I think you'll shortly discover why. In fact, despite the disguised names, you yourself may recall the case if you're old enough. I show you now two of the exhibits remaining from this notable case. First, the top of an ordinary suit of cotton pajamas. These stains are blood. You will agree with me that occasionally the Black Museum does live up to its reputation as a chamber of horrors. Now the other is a curiously altered suit of men's clothing of the period. It also figured prominently in case 133123. You'll hear about this case in the words of Inspector James Waters, who led the investigation in the year 1910. The man who put me onto it was a wretched busybody, and I didn't like him very well. I sat scribbling aimless words on a block of yellow paper as he talked. I fully realize it's none of my business, Inspector Waters, but I feel it my duty as a British subject, sir. Go on, please. In my opinion... 
He's murdered her. Oh, come now. Bear with me, Inspector. I am listening, sir. First of all, reflect that they have been on bad terms for a long time. So you said. So he had plenty of, uh, what do you call it, motive? Motive, yes. So you see? I'm afraid I don't, sir. Eh? I mean, uh, what you have is the information the man has given you. That his wife was visiting relatives in America. In Los Angeles. Los Angeles, he says. And that his wife died there and was buried in Los Angeles. That is true. Well? I believe he murdered her and hid the body. But, my dear sir, there's no evidence that he... Pardon me, sir, there is. What? Well, first, the evidence that he requested her friends, including myself, to send no cards, no floral offerings, whatever, to him in memory of his wife. Well, that... Is, I think you will agree, a little strange. Yes, but... And, secondo, the fact that I've lately returned from America myself. And? I interrupted my business trip, sir, at Los Angeles to call upon her mother and offer my condolences. Well, go on, please. I was informed by her mother, sir, that the woman had not been in Los Angeles for more than four years. I called on the widower at his house in Camden Town, number 39, Hilldrop Crescent. A battered tin sign bearing his name was tacked under the door, Dr. Edward Walton Harvey. The door was opened by a remarkably pretty young woman whose name, it appeared, was Miss Elaine LeBaron. She was Dr. Harvey's secretary. She led me up the stairs from the untidy ground floor, apparently used as a combination of lumber room and a strange place for coals. She opened the door, smiled at me, and I entered alone. Good afternoon, my friend. I doubted seriously that I should ever be Dr. Edward Walton Harvey's friend, but I bowed politely. Come in, sir. Sir, that was better. I entered. What can I do for you, my friend? May I sit down, sir? By all means, sir. What seems to be your trouble, see? This is not a professional call, Dr. Harvey. I'm Inspector James Waters of New Scotland Yard. Happy to meet you, Inspector. What can I do for you? I've called in connection with the death of your wife, sir. Oh, May I ask you a few questions? Certainly, sir. I... Uh, I must admit, though, that I... I find that subject rather a painful one. I can understand that, sir. Yes. Quite painful, sir. You were, of course, on quite good terms with the late Mrs. Harvey. Oh, yes, of course I was. Uh... Frankly, sir, no. I'm afraid I don't quite understand that, Mr... Dr. Harvey? You are a doctor, sir. Oh, yes. I got my degree from a college in the States. You're an American? Born there. I've lived here for quite a while, though. But uh, let's get back to our muttons, as the French say. I speak French like a native. The last few years have been very difficult ones for me, Inspector. Is that it, Inspector? Yes, Doctor. How have the last few years been difficult, if I may ask? My wife was a wonderful woman. But she was in the theatrical profession. A singer. And I'm afraid not a very good one. In the States, you see, she wasn't much of a success. But over here, I trust you'll pardon me, but the standard of excellence in your music halls... Do you follow me? I'm inclined to agree with you. Then she was more successful here in England. She certainly was. She didn't sing any better, but an American, you know. She made a lot of money. Some rather strange friends, I'm afraid. Bohemians, you know. Yes. Well, we got to quarreling. <laughs> I think you'll find that that's no secret. Nevertheless, her death was a great shock to me. I grieve constantly for her. What are you looking at? Sir? I see you still keep your late wife's clothing. Oh. Oh, you mean those furs? And the other things. Yes. These were my wife's. Yes, I... I gave them to Miss LeBaron, my secretary. Uh, she does leave things lying about. The young woman who showed me in. I... Uh, I have recently asked her to make her home here as my housekeeper. Uh, that's what we'd call her in the States. I saw no reason to throw away her clothes, you see. 
I'd have thought she'd take her clothes with her. Huh? To America. I guess she didn't expect to be gone long. How long has Miss LeBaron been living here? Was she here when your wife left? No, but she was a frequent visitor here. It was quite convenient to have my secretary handy, you see. And Miss LeBaron is a quite deserving young lady. Yes, of course. So that's the story. There's only one thing I do not understand, Doctor. What's that? I understand that the late Mrs. Harvey is not buried in Los Angeles in America. Sir? And that according to her mother, Mrs. Harvey has not been in America for some four years. Well, I guess you've caught me, Inspector. <laughs> My wife isn't dead. Oh? She left me. She ran away from me. Where did she go? I don't know. She just piled a few clothes in a bag and walked out. Blacked my eye first. We had a terrible quarrel. It was terrible. She called me the most awful names. And she insulted Miss LeBaron frightfully. It was dreadful. And then she rushed out of here shouting for a cab to take her to Charing Cross. Well? That's the reason I gave out the story she'd gone to America, Inspector. That's why I gave out that she died there. How do you know she is not coming back? She'll never come back. Really, Inspector, a doctor has to have some dignity. I don't want people to know my wife has run out on me. I'm afraid you may find, though, if you don't mind my saying so, that you've been quite unwise. I didn't ask your advice, sir. I'm not giving it. If your wife returns and finds you've given away her clothing... I tell you... I know she's not coming back. The gas jet in my room at Scotland Yard burned late that night. I was not currently on an assignment, so I had a good deal of time to spare, and I found myself curiously caught up by the dusty little doctor's unique formula for avoiding scandal. He'd stored up a large order of scandal for himself, I thought, when and if his wife should return... But he was so certain that she would not. Next morning, I began certain inquiries. In the course of the next three weeks, I found... Dr. Harvey, on two occasions, had pawned jewelry belonging to his wife. Both occasions were before the date on which his wife left him. Count that against him. He was not entirely honest. Mrs. Harvey had withdrawn the entire sum of money she and her husband had had in joint deposit at Barclays Bank. Count that for him. That was a clear indication of her intent to desert him. Mrs. Harvey had known of the doctor's relations with Elaine LeBaron for many months prior to her leaving him. There was no record that she had objected to this situation. She had obviously tolerated it. Why should she make an issue of it at this late date? Possibly he had lied to me. Count that against him. A cable to America to Mrs. Harvey's mother at Los Angeles confirmed the fact that the missing woman had not been seen there. Dr. Harvey had explained that. Hold that in abeyance. Dr. Harvey had given a quarter's notice to his landlord at Hilldrop Crescent. That meant he intended to leave that place. Was that suspicious, or was he merely being prudent against his wife's possible return? But he was so certain that she would not. A month before his wife left him, Dr. Harvey had purchased five grains of hyacinth hydrobromide from Lewis and Burroughs' shop in New Oxford Street. Hyacinth hydrobromide, I learned from Henry Bernard, is a drug used in institutions for the mentally ill as a sex depressant. It is also a peculiarly deadly poison one grain being sufficient to cause death. He was so certain that she would not return. I took a four-wheeler to Camden Town at once. There was no answer when I knocked on the door of number 39, Hilldrop Crescent. Dr. Edward Walton Harvey was gone, and with him, Elaine LeBaron. I went back to my office at Scotland Yard to do two things. First, I caused notices to be sent to every police station in England, Scotland, Ireland, and Wales with the descriptions of Harvey and Elaine LeBaron raising the hue and cry from the North Sea to Land's End for them. Second, I obtained the necessary warrants and sent a squad of men to Hilldrop Crescent, armed with pickaxes, shovels, and other equipment, with instructions to search the place most thoroughly. Most thoroughly, I said. I joined them. Men were in the garden, digging. Others were turning over every article of furniture in the rooms and tapping the walls. 
I stayed in the untidy lumber room, cum coal cellar, on the ground floor. We've got all the coal shoveled away, sir. Well, let's see. Bring uh, pickaxes and take up that floor. Oh, I'm oh right. get cracking. All right. George! The garden was in ruins. Curious bystanders had appeared to give gratuitous advice to the sweating detective constables. I watched anxiously as one worker drove the point of a pickaxe through a water main. The landlord stood by and swore softly to himself. Nothing happened. I wondered if I had not been a trifle precipitate. Still, one can't take chances. Inspector Walters! That came from inside the house. I sprinted back from the garden. What is it, I called. Yes, sir. <coughs> Found something, sir. Yes, it looks like a bit of a man's shirt, sir. Yes. No, more like a woman's dress. I think this floor's been taken up before. Must have been, else how did that get down there? Tell you what I think it is, sir. I think it's a pajama jacket. See? Broad stripes, gaudy lights. Go ahead, dig some more. Carefully now, carefully. Uh, Morgan, just run upstairs and see if the chaps up there have run across anything that matches this piece of whatever it is. Yes, sir. There's rocks around something. Use your hands, not the shovel. Yes, sir. Steady. Yes, sir. Something here, all right, sir. Oh, well, what is it? Oh, what do you want? Oh, did they find something upstairs? Let's have it. Here, let's compare this down there. Here, catch. Got it. Matches all right, sir. Told you it was a pajama jacket, sir. These are pajama trousers, matches it perfectly. Well, go on, dig it out. Dig it out, dig it out. Pull that stuff off it. The pajama jacket, sir. Devil blame me blind. What is it? Looks like a side of beef, sir. <coughs> Blimey, is that I? The trunk of what appeared to be a human body, wrapped up in the jacket of what was apparently Harvey's pajamas. It had been efficiently, professionally dissected. It was impossible even to determine whether the body was that of a male or a female. It was removed to the pathological laboratory for examination by Henry Bernard. Back again in my own office, I received the first report on the search for Harvey and Miss LeBaron. The pressmen had discovered our activities at Hilldrop Crescent, and most of the evening papers carried articles about the missing doctor and his secretary. An excited gentleman with a hoarse voice and a green bowler hat burst into my office. He smacked the desk vigorously with a copy of the Express. I knew it, sir. I knew it. I told him at the theater as soon as ever I saw the newspaper. One day there'll be a murder in that family, I said. Madame Rene was a great artist, sir, and I mourn her. My dear sir, who on earth is Madame Rene? She was the wife of this fiend, sir. The late Mrs. Harvey. Alas, I knew her well. Mm, they said you had some information for us, sir. My name is Ponsonby Diggs, sir. D I W G E S. The same as the actor, Dudley Diggs. Although I am no relation of his, I am a dramatic tenor, sir. I have appeared with Madame Rene at the Metropolitan, Holborn Empire, and many of the other music halls in London, as well as the Hippodrome of Manchester, and uh, in most of the principal cities of the provinces. I am not unknown. The information, sir, if you please. W what information, sir? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, yes. I have heard. I have heard that viper say many and many a time, sir. What viper? The unspeakable Harley. Dr. Harvey. Oh, Harvey, indeed, yes. You are correct. I have heard him say many times that he has always been enamored of the Belgian coast as a holiday place. Oh, very interesting, I'm sure. Well, thank you, Mr... Uh, uh, Diggs, at the real point of my visit, sir, only yesterday morning, perhaps even as you and your men approached Hildop Crescent, I saw this scene. Where? In Victoria Station, sir. Oh, no, 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 but bear, bear with me, I beg you. The boat train for Folkestone leaves from Victoria Station. Folkestone? The port. The port for Antwerp, my dear sir. Information at once was transmitted to the Belgian police. It was a mystery to us how they could have left England, but this was too good a lead to be ignored. 
Later in the day, information reached us from the police at Folkestone that a man answering to the description of Harvey had been seen by a railway porter and again by a news vendor who recognized him from his photograph in a newspaper. Elaine LeBaron had not been seen. I visited Henry Bernard, the pathologist, in his laboratory. No, Inspector Waters, <clears throat> I'm still unable to determine the sex of the body you found. The fellow who did it was a very good technician. The merest shell of a body. Looks like a doctor's work. Well, certainly someone with a considerable knowledge of anatomy. Very workmanlike. No identification, possibly. Oh, we shall see. I will say that identification will be most difficult, but I have only just started. Yes. I did discover one thing which I hope will be of help. What's that, sir? I found 2.7 grains of hyacinth hydrobromide in the remains. Message from the Belgian police at Antwerp. Industriously searching city for trace of fugitives, but no results as yet have placed special attention to all transatlantic steamships sailing from this port and hope to report progress in course of hours. Rely on us. I hadn't thought of that. Certainly they go further away from Antwerp. Harvey was an American after all. If he could escape to America, we might never find him. I must stop up that hole. Many ships at sea are already equipped with the wireless telegraph, I remembered, and Instanta caused messages to be flashed out to all, to all of them, with special reference to ships sailing from Antwerp, warning them to be on the alert for Harvey and LeBaron. Another message came from Antwerp. Your Dr. Harvey, seen and positively identified by a former patient of his now living in Antwerp. Girl was not with him. Sending you further details. I spoke with Henry Bernard again. I'm coming along, I'm coming along, Waters. Found the evidence of the poison, and I shall identify her for you. Uh, find out for me whether the woman ever had an appendectomy. Oh, what, sir? An appendicitis operation that left a scar on her belly. I found out. She had. I told Bernard, who grunted. Nothing more from Antwerp. Where was the girl, I thought? Had Harvey murdered her, too? Ruefully, I thought we don't even know for certain that he murdered his wife. What we wanted was Harvey. Experience of Captain Horatio Sowerby, RNVR, master of the steamship Claverhouse, Antwerp for Halifax, Nova Scotia. As we moved down the river skelet to, be, to the sea on the start of our voyage, I stood on the bridge with the pilot. Few passengers were on deck, it being a very dismal day. However, as I glanced down at the bows, I observed two men standing on the main deck of the forepeak. My attention was directed to them by the fact that they seemed to be holding hands. Uh, I was astonished to observe that the younger one placed his arm about the other in a most affectionate fashion. Mm, I'll have a little talk with those two, I said to myself. They walked back to their cabin, arm in arm, as I watched them, unobserved. Message from the Antwerp police. Unable to discover any trace other than the one reported of fugitives Harvey and Le Baron, cannot find any indication they may have sailed for America. Shall we continue our search? I talked again with Henry Bernard. I'll tell you when I find out, Waters. See this fragment of skin? Yes. If I can prove to a jury that that is an appendicitis scar and not a fold in the skin caused after death, we shall pretty well have identified her. Can you do it, sir? I don't know. Continuing the experience of Captain Horatio Sowerby. I made it a point to speak to those two I had discovered holding hands. Pleased to meet you, Captain, sir. Uh... This young man is my boy. I'm taking him on a sea voyage for his health. Very delicate. Your son, sir? Eh? Oh, yes. You don't look like your father, young man. Uh, don't try to talk, son. That's a very bad case of laryngitis, Captain. Very painful, dangerous for him to try to talk. I see. Uh, you're a doctor, sir? Me? Oh, no. Well, I hope you enjoy your trip. And you, young sir. I hope it will do you a lot of good. Thank you, Captain, for both of us. Uh, I think we'd better go to our cabin now, hadn't we, Jeff? Sammy? There's something queer about that. I thought as they walked away, not hand in hand this time. The wind blew the boy's coat away from his body. That's when I saw his trousers. The back of them had been ripped down the seam and fastened together again, under the coat, with safety pins to make them wider. Extraordinary, I said to myself... I turned away to go to my cabin. The boy had left his hat on the table. I picked it up. The sweatband had been stuffed with paper to make it much smaller than its actual size. Then I recalled the boy's startlingly crude haircut, as if it had been done by an amateur. Ha-ha, <laughs> I said to myself, that boy's a woman. When I got back to my cabin, 
There was the wireless message from Scotland Yard. I was sitting at my desk again, seriously considering going to Antwerp myself. After all, I'd seen both Harvey and the girl. I should be able to recognize them if I saw them again. Then the door opened, and a constable brought in the wireless message. Inspector James Waters, Scotland Yard. Leave your man, Harvey, and the woman, LeBaron, to be passengers on my vessel bound for Halifax. Woman disguised as boy. Please, Wallace, additional information to aid identification. Sowerby, master, SS Coverhouse. They've got away. To add to my woes, Henry Bernard came cheerfully into my office. I've got it, Waters. What? That's definitely an appendicitis scar. Too late now. What's the matter, old boy? You sick? I'm dead. Oh, I thought you'd be delighted. I can prove that it's a scar, all right. And we can demonstrate to a jury that the body can't be anybody else but Mrs. Harvey. And with that hyacinth I found in the body... It's no good. They'll be in America in a few days, and then who can tell where they'll go? We've been had. Not necessarily. How do you mean? When did they leave? The day before yesterday. You're on the telephone here, aren't you? What good does that do? What ship are they on? Clover House for Halifax. Where are you going? Listen. Are you there? Hello, hello. Are you there? I say, this is Henry Bernard here. Now, listen to me carefully. I want you to find out for me at once whether there's any ship sailing for Halifax that will arrive there before a ship called the, uh, uh, what's the name, Waters? Clover House. A ship called the Clover House just sailed from Antwerp gets there. Right, do you understand? There was one that afternoon, the steamship Morgiana, due in Halifax 40 hours before the Clover House, barring acts of God. I got aboard somehow, leaving messages to be sent to Captain Sowerby and asking him to wireless me on the Morgiana. I'm not a good sailor. It was a bad time of the year for the North Atlantic, and Captain Sowerby's wireless was working quite well. Waters, this is Morgiana. Has Harvey a moustache? Sowerby, master, SS Cleverhouse. I said no. Waters, SS Morgiana. What color is Ellen LeBaron's hair? Sowerby, master, SS Cleverhouse. Blonde, I said. Water, SS Morgiana. Stewardess discovers woman's garments in cabin of Harvey. Sowerby, master, SS Cleverhouse. Good, I said. Water, SS Morgiana. They are seasick. Sowerby, master, SS Cleverhouse. So am I seasick, I said. Water, SS Morgiana. You will pass out of seven bells tonight. They are still unsuspicious and practically certain they are the ones you want. Sowerby, master, SS Cleverhouse. Practically certain, I said. But there I was two mornings later in Halifax. The news had leaked out. Perhaps I shouldn't say leaked. Practically everyone in the world except the man and woman in the Clover House had heard of it. The pressmen were in Halifax, some 40 strong. As the Clover House dropped anchor at quarantine, we all crowded aboard the pilot boat. I went over to the Clover House in a rowing boat with the pilot. Captain Sowerby met me at the Jacob's Ladder. They're in their cabin, Inspector. Where? Come along, please. A few curious passengers stared at me as I followed him to the cabin door. Um, this one. That you, Stuart? It's uh, Captain Sowerby, sir. Just a minute, please. Come in. Well, we made it after all, didn't we? Well? That isn't them. I... Uh, I recognize you, Inspector Waters. Oh, stop it, darling. We didn't make it after all. I... Don't know how you got here, Inspector, but I'm ready, I guess, eh? You you won't have to take her, will you? Edward Walton Harvey and Elaine LeBaron, I arrest you both for the willful murder of Cora Harvey. I warn you that anything you say will be taken down in writing and may be used in evidence. <coughs> uh, come, gentlemen, while the lady changes her clothes. Harvey had grown a heavy moustache, 
and had changed so much in the few days of flight that it was difficult to recognize him, which had given me that awful moment when I first saw them. Elaine LeBaron was never brought to trial, there being scant evidence that she had played any part in the murder other than that of the other woman. Harvey was tried at Old Bailey, and after a bitter battle opposing medical men, which was won by the brilliant testimony of Henry Bernard, he was found guilty and was hanged a scant six months after he had committed the crime. You have heard another in the series Whitehall 1212, compiled from the official files of Scotland Yard. Research on Whitehall 1212 is compiled by Percy Hoskins of the London Daily Express, and the stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper. Beginning next Sunday, the 24th of February... Whitehall 1212 will be heard over most of these stations one half hour later because another great program, Hollywood Star Playhouse, will be heard in the time period we now occupy. Remember, listen next week to Hollywood Star Playhouse and Whitehall 1212. For correct time and station, check your local newspaper. Thank you. Whitehall 1212. This is Scotland Yard. For the first time in history, Scotland Yard opens its official files to bring you the authentic stories of some of its most celebrated cases. These are the true stories, the unvarnished facts, just as they occurred, reenacted for you by an all-British cast. Only the names of the participants have, for obvious reasons, been changed. The stories are presented with the full cooperation of Scotland Yard. Research on Whitehall 1212 is prepared by Percy Hoskins, chief crime reporter for the London Daily Express. The stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper. This is the story of Scotland Yard file number 140MR519. And here to brief you is Chief Superintendent John Davidson. Good afternoon. This is the famous Black Museum of Scotland Yard. These two rooms on the lower ground floor of the main building are the repository of, shall I say, mementos of some of our most famous cases both solved and unsolved. We keep here, as exemplars of the practical art of murder and other crimes, a great many weapons. A not inconsiderable stock of disguises, a large number of miscellaneous objects, more or less directly concerned with the commission of specific crimes. Death marks of a few notable criminals, such as the late Heinrich Himmler, and a great many bullets, some of them with the stain of death still discernible, and more than a few genuinely gruesome objects, portions of human skeletons, things in alcohol-filled glass jars. Every object in here has an unhappy association, and most of them have aided us in solving other puzzling crimes, for the criminal mind is curiously imitated. Now, this case, number 140MR519, happened 30 years ago. You may have heard about it. It created a great sensation in the United States. Now, here is the one item that remains, a knife. It was once very sharp, but the blood has rusted the blade. Oh, good afternoon, David. Good afternoon, sir. Now, this is the man who knows more about case 140-MR-519 than anyone else at the yard. 
May I introduce Chief Inspector David Apries of the CID? There was another man who knew a great deal about this case, sir, but he's not with us anymore. Who was that, David? The hangman, sir. Mrs. Hildegard Amory was one of the most fascinating women I've ever known. Her husband, Peter James Appleston Amory, was 32 years old, but everyone who knew the couple thought he, he was at least 10 years older than his wife. Although, in point of fact, he was only four years her senior. From what we know of him, he was dull, moody, and not a very good husband. Except that in the accepted sense of the word, he, he was faithful to her. It's a pity that he had no other recorded virtues. On the night of the 3rd of October, 1922, he was murdered. This is all I had from Detective Sergeant Max Fisher of the Ilford Police Station, who reported it to me. Kensington Gardens, Ilford, sir. Ten minutes before 12 midnight, sir, last night, stabbed to death by a person or persons unknown, sir. Mr. John Thomason and Miss Elizabeth Poole of 7B Oxford Crescent, Ilford, met Mrs. Amory as she was running down the street screaming. A doctor was fetched who pronounced the man dead. Go on, please, Sergeant. Mrs. Amory remarked to Police Constable Douglas Gregg that she supposed that she would probably be blamed for the husband's death. She'll be at the Ilford Police Station, sir, this morning. I proceeded first to the mortuary in Horse Ferry Road to view the body. He had been stabbed untidily three times in the neck. The man at the mortuary said one slash had severed the carotid artery, causing death. No weapon, Sergeant Fisher said, had been found. I went to Ilford for a talk with Mrs. Amory. She's in there, Sergeant. Oh, thank you. Do I go in with you, Chief Inspector? I wish you would, yes, please. Yes, Sergeant Fisher. I have Chief Inspector Apparis of Scotland Yard with me, Jones. May we come in? Mrs. Amory? Let them come in. Thank you. We'll be all right, Jones. Yes, Sergeant. Come in, sir. Mrs. Amory? This is Chief Inspector Ap Reese. I don't know what more I can tell you, Chief Inspector. I, uh, I'm sorry to be under the necessity of asking you any further questions, Mrs. Amory, but you understand. Yes, of course. If, uh, if we might sit down. Oh, please do. <clears throat> you did not see the assailant, you said? No. Peter had gone... Your husband? Hmm? Yes. My husband had gone ahead of me a few steps to unlock the door. All I remember was a kind of black shadow rising up beside the steps, hearing Peter cry out. The other man said nothing? Nothing at all. He just turned and ran away down the street. And you? I'm afraid I was so frozen I didn't do anything for a second. Peter was coughing and crying out and... I think I screamed and ran away. Uh-huh. You didn't touch your husband. I put my hand out to him and the blood... I, I was so... I don't know. I I think I ran for help. I know I was screaming. Those people heard me and called out and I... You thought your husband was dead? I knew he was hurt badly. You didn't tell us before about seeing the man who attacked your husband, Mrs. Amory. Oh, I thought I did. No, you didn't, Mrs. Amory. I'm sorry. I'm going to ask you a question, Mrs. Amory, which you need not answer. I'm sure I have nothing to conceal from you, Chief Inspector. Of course. Why did you remark that they will blame me for this, or words to that effect? Did I say that? In Constable Greg's report, madam. Oh, I don't remember saying uh, that. Why should you say such a thing? Why... If I said it... I was very much agitated, you must understand. Of course, I suppose I must have been thinking that no one else had seen the... The... Murderer, ma'am? Yes. The... The... Sergeant Fisher. Yes? Yeah? I'll be back at once, Chief Inspector. All right. Had your husband any enemies that you know of, Mrs. Emery? 
I've been trying to think. Can you think of any other motive? Robbery, perhaps? Oh, I should think that a robber would have run away without attempting to attack. I don't know. Could I... Could I ask you to tell me in your own words exactly what happened, as near as you can remember? Peter and I had gone to the Criterion. And we were in rather a gay mood when we came home. Peter said to me, I'll run ahead and unlock... That is a very dark street. Well, usually it's quite bright. But last night, the street lamps... Something apparently had happened to them. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Well, that other couple saw him. Saw who? The murderer. Oh, no. Oh, good. Saw him quite plainly, they said. Did that. they recognize him? I mean, they're not going to be able to identify him, are they? Catch her, Fisher. She's going to paint. <laughs> Verbum sat sapienti. If I remember my schoolboy Latin, a word to the wise is sufficient. I'm not at all certain of the degree of wisdom, if any, that I possess, but we had the word right enough. Recognize. Why should they recognize the man? Had Mrs. Amory recognized him? Why should she be so concerned about his being recognized? She returned to her home. Fisher and I quietly began asking questions of the people who knew her. Her next-door neighbor answered me. Oh, it's a dreadful thing, sir. And the poor woman's fair out of her mind. How long have you known the Amory, sir? Mm, six months. Uh-huh. Had she any friends uh, other than her husband, could you say? Well, sir, the, the parson, I should say. Mrs. O'Malley, who keeps the pastry shop. And... Well, uh, I liked her very much. Uh, I'm the dustman, sir. I saw her almost every day on my rounds. What about her husband? I say nothing but good of the dead, sir. Although my private opinion is it served him bloody well right. Why? Well, sir, many's the night I've heard him shouting at the lady something terrible, sir. What about? I never listened to details, sir. I have a great admiration for the poor thing. <laughs> She's very attractive, sir. Do you know anyone else who is of the same opinion? Everybody, sir, except him. God rest his nasty soul. Inquiry of the parson brought more praises of little Mrs. Amory. A most attractive, lively, pleasant young housewife were the exact words. I talked to her employers, a firm of wholesale milliners in Aldersgate Street. I've known Mrs. Amory for a great many years, sir. She's been in our employ since the third year of the war. Oh. Well, what are her duties with you? She is chief bookkeeper and manageress, sir. Do you know anything about her friends? Everybody in this establishment can lay claim to that title, sir. She is universally beloved. We do not make inquiries into the private life of our people, sir. Of course. But do you know any of her friends apart from her colleagues in this office? I have seen her lunching once or twice with a young man, assumed to be a, a younger relative, sir. But I naturally made no inquiries. Well, thank you very much, sir. Quite welcome, I'm sure, sir. Um, I should like to ask you one more question, sir. As you will. Why do you think this young man is a relative? I do not believe I am breaking a confidence. Mrs. Amory has several times received letters from him posted at various points of call of the Peninsula and Orient Steamship Company. I have seen the envelopes. Well, how does that prove that he's a relation of hers? I have seen the name on the letters, sir. Oh, oh. You looked at the letters? Uh, inadvertently, sir. And the name was? Westlake. The same as Mrs. Amory's maiden name, sir. I happen to know. Oh, well, thank you very much indeed, sir. Good day. <coughs> I didn't tell the uh, male milliner that Mrs. Amory's maiden name had been nothing at all like Westlake. As a matter of fact, it was Balderston. I saw the Mrs. O'Malley the dustman had spoken of and within two hours after I learned the results of Chief Inspector Aparis's interview with the milliner. Oh, yes, sir. I know Mrs. Amory very well indeed. And her husband? I knew him. Sad affair. I didn't like him, sir. You know a man named Westlake, Mrs. O'Malley? Of course. You do? 
He was a paying barter for a few weeks at the Amory's. How long ago? Oh, about 18 months ago. He left and went to see Mrs. Amory, said. I don't want you to get the idea, sir, that Mrs. Amory's the type who takes in boarders indiscriminately. She's a genuine lady, sir. Of course. Amory threw him out after a few weeks. Oh? Why? Some tosh about his being too thick with poor dear Mrs. Amory. Such tosh. What's like the brother of a girl who attended school with Mrs. Amory? What arrant nonsense. But Amory was a swan. You know where this Westlake is now? No one's heard of him from that day to this. But not Mrs. Amory even? This young man was merely the brother of a former schoolmate, I told you. Why should she know anything about his private affairs, indeed? Uh, I agree with you, Mrs. O'Malley. Why, indeed? That was the fourth day after Peter Amory's death. Sergeant Fisher and I struck what bookkeepers are fond of calling a, a trial balance. A. Peter Emery was stabbed to death. With a knife. Practically every sailor carries a sheath knife. Westlake was a sailor. He had been thrown out of the Amory home. He was also accused by the husband of too great familiarity with the wife. That could be a motive. Mrs. Amory was quite concerned about the possibility of the murderer having been recognized. Perhaps she did recognize him. Would she be shielding him? Well, he's the younger brother of a schoolmate of hers. Would she be shielding the murderer of her husband? Let's ask him. Let's find him first. <laughs> I had very little trouble finding William Westlake. A telephone call to the offices of the P&O Steamship Company found him for me. Yes, they said they had a steward of that name. Twenty years old, they said. Had been with the P&O for about 18 months. Well, that corresponded with Mrs. O'Malley's recollection of the date of his departure from the Amory's house. What ship? The SS Murray, they said. Where was the Murray, please? It had docked at Tilbury on the 23rd of September after a voyage to the Mediterranean. Well, at least Westlake had been close at hand when Amory had been murdered ten days later. The Murray was still at Tilbury. I paid the ship a visit there. A young sailor loitering at the gangway greeted me. Where are you going, mate? Is this the Murray? Unless they change a name this morning. What do you want? Looking for a man named Westlake. What do you want him for? No one to talk to him. What about? I'm afraid it's none of your business, mate. Ain't it? <laughs> My name's Westlake. Oh, is it? William Westlake? Right, what's yours? My name's Fisher. Never heard of you. Detective Sergeant Fisher of the CID. What do you want? Detective Sergeant Fisher of the CI bloody D. Did you ever hear of a man named... Peter Amory? I didn't do anything to him. I didn't ask you that, Westlake. I might have known him. Well, then you won't mind answering some questions, will you? About him? Why? He's dead. Who killed him? I don't know. Well, what do I know about it? That's what we want to find out, Westlake. Well, ask me. Go ahead. No, oh, you'll have to come to Scotland Yard with me. What if I won't? Better. What'll you do if I won't come? Take you. <laughs> come along. There's nobody looking. I could smash you on the head and drop you in the water. See those constables down there on the pierhead? Where? I shouldn't try while they're watching us. Oh. Well, I suppose I'll have to come along with you. But you've got nothing on me. Good enough. Get your sheath knife and come on. What? Well, I've got no sheath knife. I haven't had a sheath knife for... Oh, for ever so long, mister. I haven't got a sheath knife. I lost it. I lost it, I said. Well, come along, then. I'll try and find your knife for you. <laughs> I 
I had invited Mrs. Hildegard Amory, the bereaved widow, to come to my office at New Scotland Yard from Ilford to consult about some new evidence that had been discovered, I said. She arrived at 11 o'clock, quite composed, with no outward signs of nervousness. I said she was one of the most fascinating women I've ever seen. Blue silk frock, a most fetching hat from the establishment that employed her. Hardly suitable for a recent widow, I remember thinking idly. Great purple-blue eyes. A most charming smile as she greeted me. You must tell me the news at once, Chief Inspector. What has happened? A few facts that I think you should know, Mrs. Amory. Have they identified the man they saw running away? Uh, the people who saw the man. A little too anxious, Mrs. Amory, I thought. I said they had not identified anyone yet. Do you think they can? Identify him, I mean. Oh, I'm not at all certain that they can, Mrs. Amory. The street light was out, you know. Oh, I do hope you find him. Did I detect a suggestion, just a suggestion of triumph in that? We'll see, I said. I haven't the slightest idea who... It's so dark, though, uh, I'm afraid he'll never be identified. I wish you had seen him. We could hold an identification parade. Your telephone, Chief Inspector. Oh, oh, it's ringing, isn't it? Chief Inspector Abreese him. I've got him, sir. Oh. Westlake, I mean, sir. Oh, good, good, old man. Is she there, sir? Oh, quite, quite, quite. Is your door open, sir? Uh, forget it, old boy. I'll take care of it, sir. Thank you, that will be excellent. I'll bring him. Thanks very much indeed, old boy. Goodbye. Oh, my dear Mrs. Amory, the, the light from the window is directly in your eyes. I'm so sorry. Please, take this other chair. It faces the other way. Oh, it's quite all right, Chief Inspector. Oh, I insist, I insist. Please sit here. It'll be much more comfortable. Well, if you must be so thoughtful, Chief Inspector. Please. Thank you very much. There. Now, you see, you're much more comfortable. The light's much better this way. I think there's someone at your door, sir. Oh, really? Who is that? Who is it? The man you wanted to see, sir. Here we go. William! What? They found you! Say, you're the one that wanted to see me no. in Scotland Yard. No! Pater! No. Pater! To murder no, you! No, Take him away, Fisher. No! Oh, no, 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 I'll kill her, I'll kill her too! Oh, no, what can I do? Come on, Wesley. Why did she you do it? Do it. I really think you owe us an explanation, Mrs. Amory. <laughs> This is what she said. I did not know William Westlake at all. When his sister asked me if he might come and stay with us, I remember him only as a small boy from Norwood. And I met him on a holiday with his sister. As a small boy, he was remarkably charming. When he came to live with us, he was still charming. One day, while my husband was away on a short business trip, William told me he was falling in love with me. This is what he said. Of course I was in love with her. In a kid's kind of a way. Old Amory caught us one afternoon kissing in the parlor. He kicked me out. It was an awful row. I said I'd get even. Well, he's dead now, and I'm still alive. She said... I had nothing to do with it. It was his own idea to murder Peter Emery. And he said... Ask her about those letters, Detective Sergeant. I'm a detective. My job is to catch criminals, not... 
to make pronouncements about the state of their minds. <clears throat> Neither is it my job to pass judgment upon anyone. Ask her about the letters, Westlake said to Sergeant Fisher. We did ask her. Hmm? The letters? I thought he destroyed them. Westlake laughed when we told him what she had said. <laughs> them letters will hang her, Mr. Detective. Westlake had been charged with murder and duly warned. The judge's rules in England are almost unbelievably strict regarding what may be said to a prisoner once he had been officially charged. But the boastful ones often say more than they intend to. Neither Fisher nor I made any comment. You can't ever prove that I killed old Amory, gents. You know, nobody saw him get killed. Why, even them people that said they saw me couldn't possibly identify me. Could they? I'm sure I don't know, Wesley. Oh, I know. They can't. Nobody can. <laughs> and, and even if somebody could identify me, which they can't, they'll never hang me. You've been warned, Westlake. So I have, haven't I? Anything I might say might be used in evidence. But she thought I burned them letters or tore them up or something. <laughs> I didn't, gents. Now, what will you do for me if I show you where them letters are? Huh? Nothing. We can promise you nothing, Westlake. Don't you want to... Hang somebody? Come on, Fisher. Don't you want them? Don't you want them? Well, they'll hang her, I tell you. They'll hang her. Don't you want me to give you those letters? Come back. Come back, you. She, she put me up to it. I can prove she put me up to it, I tell you. She made me do it. She talked me into it. She's the guilty one. I just stabbed the man. The filthy... Filthy brute. And she thought he was in love with her. She knows better now. Come along. Where are we going? To find those letters. We found them in his locker on the Morea, wrapped in an old newspaper under a pile of dirty clothes. Fifty-six of them. And under them, a blood-stained sheath knife the one that you saw in the Black Museum. The letters were incredible. She admitted in court at the trial that she had written them. Would you like to hear what she had written? Here are typical excerpts from the record of the trial. You said it was enough for an elephant. Perhaps it was, but you don't allow for the taste, making only a small quantity to be taken. Now... Your letter tells me about the bitter taste again. Oh, darling, I do feel so down and unhappy. Wouldn't the stuff make small pills coated together with soap and dipped in licorice powder like beechens? I'll try again while you're away. And another. I tried the broken glass three times, but the third time he found a piece of it. So I've given it up. Till you come home. Stop. And... In court at the trial, she was asked why she had written such dangerous letters to Westlake at various points of call. I can still hear her reply. Nobody knows what kind of letters he was writing me. I destroyed them all. He did not destroy mine. And she was asked, oh, why did you incite this man to murder your husband? Her voice was very low when she replied. He was the first man that ever loved me. I was afraid he might meet another woman on one of his voyages. That he would love better than me. I could not lose him. I am no moralist. I'm a detective. But it is curious to know that among the effects left in their home at Ilford was a trashy novel by an English author published some ten years before the tragedy occurred. Before Westlake had ever come to live there, while he was still a small boy and she a schoolgirl. Some of the passages in her letters are almost exact duplicates of passages in that book. I don't know. Hilda 
Edgar Amory and William Westlake were found guilty of willful murder at Old Bailey in June 1923. I don't believe she even heard the verdict. Her mind was failing even then. Westlake went to the gallows bravely. She was carried to the execution shed completely unconscious by warders, and the trap was sprung without her ever regaining consciousness. The hangman is a sinister figure, but even he was sickened. It was the first time in English history that a hangman resigned his job. I don't know. You have heard another in the series Whitehall 1212, compiled from the official files of Scotland Yard. Research is prepared by Percy Hoskins of the London Daily Express. The stories for radio written and directed by Willis Cooper. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Today here on NBC. Today here on NBC. Today here on NBC. Today here. Whitehall, one, two, one, two. This is Scotland Yard. For the first time in history, Scotland Yard opens its official files to bring you the authentic, true stories of some of its most baffling crimes. These are the true stories, the unvarnished facts, just as they occurred, reenacted for you by an all-British cast. Only the names of the participants have for obvious reasons been changed. The stories are presented with the full cooperation of Scotland Yard. Research on Whitehall 1212 is prepared by Percy Hoskins, chief crime reporter of the London Daily Express. The stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper. This is the story of Scotland Yard file number 202124. Here is Chief Superintendent John Davidson to brief you. Uh, these two rooms constitute the famous Black Museum of Scotland Yard, in which are preserved many of the objects which were of importance in solving of crimes which have confronted us. The exhibits in here range from lethal weapons to the most innocent of hearing items. They're all classified and filed most carefully so that they'll be available for study. We find them quite useful. A blood stain that led Scotland Yard men to the discovery of a murderer in 1930 may be of great assistance in solving a similar crime in 1952. Here, I show you a plain mirror, tag 202124. A plain, gilt-trained mirror, its frame badly tarnished. Just such a mirror as you might find hanging in a hundred cheap flats in London's West End, but with one small difference. This smudged fingerprint here in the lower left-hand corner, here, just there above the frame, this mirror had looked on murder. This is the murderer's fingerprint. Oh, now here is Superintendent Charles Brereton of Scotland Yard. He's the man who solved this case, 202124. I had the assistance, though, John, of Marjorie Ashley, remember? Why wasn't Marjorie Ashley the woman who was murdered? Yes, that fingerprints in her blood. On a morning in February 1942... A scant two months after your Pearl Harbor, I had a telephone call from Inspector Francis Xavier Costello at West End Central Police Station. What is it, Frank, I asked? The woman was apparently murdered, sir. Strangled with a green scarf. Her name was Rachel Soskin, sir. Where'd they find her? Wyndham Place, Merriman, sir. I identified her from her purse. The murderer had thrown it away, but we found it. Nothing in it but her identity card. Well, what are you calling me for? Can't you handle a routine murder, Inspector? Excuse me, sir, but I don't think it's a routine murder. Why? Well, sir, the 
the woman, in addition to having been strangled, had been horribly beaten up. I'm sure that's regrettable, Costello, but after all, is it so unusual? It is, Nancy. The doctor here says the blows were inflicted after death. The report from the mortuary by Keith Yarrow, the Home Office pathologist, confirmed the report. The woman had been brutally beaten after she had died from strangulation. At first glance, it appeared that the murderer, in an attempt at robbery, had inadvertently committed murder. But with the discovery of the beating... Jack the Ripper. Jack the Ripper flourished in the years 1888 and 89, 53 years before. He would have been at least 75 years old. Criminal Records Office was consulted. The names of every possible suspect were dredged up and thoroughly investigated, but to no avail whatever. Investigation of the murdered woman, Mrs. Rachel Soskind, disclosed the fact that she had been a quiet, highly respectable person whose husband was absent in the African campaign. There was not a single clue of any sort. On the third day, I had another telephone call from the West End Central Police Station. Inspector Costello again. There's another, sir. Another what, Inspector? Another murdered woman, sir. Oh? Water Street in her own flat. Name? Marjorie Ashley, 26. Lived alone. Same type of woman? Uh, a dancer. Uh-huh. Found her this morning about 10 o'clock. Uh. The landlady looking to collect her rent. Had she been robbed? The room had been ransacked. Apparently only money had been taken, but... Only she'd been killed, sir. How? Butcher knife, sir. Her own. Yeah, it's rather dreadful. Anything new on the other case? No, sir. Uh, this could be the same chap, sir. Yes. Uh. Mm-hmm. Well, what are you doing? He left his calling card this time, sir. Mm-hmm. With his name? Uh, no name, sir. But it's him, all right. Who? Jack the Ripper, sir. It could have been Jack the Ripper's calling card, right enough. I visited the room myself with Inspector Costello. They've got the knife in the laboratory at the answer. No fingerprints on it, I expect. Uh, not on it, sir, I'm afraid. But they're looking. But here's his calling card, sir. Blood. Like a slaughterhouse, sir. But here... On the mirror. Yeah, he, he touched it, sir. The fingerprint man from the yard is sure it's not hers. Uh, mm-hmm. Smudged a little. He says they can classify it all right, sir. He's photographed it. They're working on it now. Well... Uh. You, uh, you say she was robbed. Took all her money, emptied her purse. Wanted to make it look like robbery. Must think we're fools. Yeah, she could have seen her. Thanks. Well, he's left his prints. We'll find him. I don't think we'll find his prints in the files, sir. Why not? They didn't have fingerprints in Jack the Ripper's day, did they? <laughs> Costello was right. They charted the fingerprint found on the mirror, the one you saw a moment ago, but it could not be found under any classification in our files. Forty-eight hours later, the police found the body of Margaret Newton in her flat in Gosfield Street near Tottenham Court Road. It's the same one, sir. Her purse empty and the place turned upside down and, and she... Well, slaughterhouse again, sir. Worse than the last one. Fingerprints? Yes, sir. A bottle of bath salts has been smashed. Or one of the pieces. Two sets of prints. Hers and his. Who was she? No particular occupations. Uh, uh, seen around various West End nightclubs a great deal. Mm-hmm. Must have met him in one of them. Who, sir? Jack the Ripper, old boy. <laughs> In the criminal records office at Scotland Yard, men worked long hours sifting files for the names of known or suspected sex offenders. Men with criminal records which included crimes of violence. Each was painstakingly investigated. Fingerprints of all were checked with those we had found at the scenes of the last two murders. The result? Nothing. The West End of London was terrified. Women stayed in their homes after dark behind locked doors. 
Hundreds of suspects were questioned. The result, nothing. Nightlife in the West End all but ceased to exist. Uh, two days later, Mrs. Doris Brooks, the wife of a hotel manager, was murdered in her flat not more than a mile away from the scene of the last crime. I'm ready for the loony bin, sir. Uh, we all are, Costello. No clues this time at all? None at all, sir. Treated her the same way as he did the others, but he didn't leave any clues, any fingerprints. Well, a fat lot of good the other fingerprints have done us anyway. Yes, sir. Well, cheer up. We'll get him eventually. He's crazy, obviously. He'll slip. Well, how many more poor women are left to be murdered before we do, sir? Well, have you any ideas, then? No more than you have, sir. What puzzles me is why he still keeps up the pretense that the motive's robbery. The man's got a diseased mind. Well, obviously. I, I mean, I think he's... He, he, he thinks he's fooling us, sir. He is? He couldn't have got more than 20 pounds from all his victims. It isn't money he wants. He's a maniac. He takes their money, then. That's how he thinks he's fooling us, Costello. He's done this before. Every assault case in the last 10 years has been examined. He's not any of them. Somebody knows him. We've checked the acquaintances of all four women, sir. If we could find one person that... More than one of them knew. Well? There's no such person, sir. Three days went by. Four. Five. A week. There were no more reports of violence, either attempted or consummated, on the persons of any more London women. Our people were still hard at work. The scene of each of the four crimes had been gone over again and again for clues. But none. None at all. Our voluminous files of crime yielded nothing. Women began to appear again on the streets of London, but was still almost as much as a man's life was worth for him to speak to an unescorted woman. The newspapers were still full of warnings. Women screamed for a policeman when a strange man lifted his hat to them. But some women are foolhardy. Such a one was Miss Paula Ingram. I heard about her from the station superintendent of C Division in Savile Row, Arthur Austin. I hurried to Savile Row to see Miss Ingram. A slight, rather pretty little woman with astonishing blonde hair. Of course, I don't know, sir. I know there's lots of soldiers walking the streets, sir, looking to pick up a bit of fluff, especially if they're <laughs> good-looking, you know. Go on, please, Miss Ingram. Well... It was last night as I was coming out of a place in German Street when this bloke stopped me. Hello, sweetness and light, he says. And <laughs> I didn't realize he was speaking to me. Oh. You didn't see his face, of course. Uh, no, sir. I, I didn't see his face. But I could tell he was in an RAS uniform. How? With a little cap, you know. I could see that. Uh. Air cadet he was. I could see the white on the cap. Mm-hmm. Well, going somewhere, he asks me, and I stopped off a moment to speak to him. I always try to be nice to the forces, and he sounded so nice and so polite. Go on, please. And so I, I stopped, and we started to talk. Mm -hmm. He kept getting closer to me, but I didn't give it much attention. Why? I thought perhaps he was going to try to kiss me. They often do, you know, especially the RAF lads, and... And all of a sudden, I, I felt his hands on my neck. What did you do? It came to me in a flash. This is Jack the Ripper, I thought. And, and I tried to push him away, but he, he just got his hand around my throat, and, and I just screamed, Help! Help! I said. And he let go my neck and said, Now, don't. And, and, and I <clears throat> screamed again, and he turned and ran. Uh-huh. And then I thought to myself... Yeah, yeah, you're making a bloody fool of yourself. And, and I called after him, but he was still running. And I thought, well, now, maybe I haven't. And I came over here to the police station and reported it. Did, did I make a bloody fool of myself, sir? You didn't see his face? No, sir. But, but, he, but he was most pleasant-spoken, though he was rather forward. Oh, dear. Now, now I wonder if I did the right thing. You're still alive, aren't you? Yes. But, oh, dear! What's the matter? So is he! 
We kept the news of Paula Ingram and her experience out of the papers. It might be trivial, but then... Then again, it might not be, I said to Costello. This girl Ingram, sir, what do you think of her? London's full of girls like that, unfortunately. Soldiers call them Piccadilly Commandos. Right. That was the kind of women Jack the Ripper specialised in, wasn't it? Oh, will you stop that Jack the Ripper stuff? Was, wasn't it? Wasn't it, sir? That's a pretty thin sort of clue, Inspector. What about the other four women that were killed? Weren't they the same kind? Well? Well, sir. Could be a clue, couldn't it? All the same class of women. Same way Jack the Ripper is. How are we going to find this Jack the Ripper? How do we know whether he's the right one? How do we... Excuse me. Superintendent Burrison here... Oh, yes, Superintendent Austin. Oh, is that so? Well, that's quite encouraging. He's on the way. Good. We'll wait. I expect... Oh, here he is now, I think. Uh, uh, open the door, will you, Mr. Costello? Yes, sir. Thank you. Yes, I... I think it is one of your men. Okay, I'll take it. Right. Costello's got it. Thank you. This is most awfully good of your men. Yes, that's it. Thank you. I I'll tell you what luck we have. Goodbye. What is it, a gas mask? Yes, sir. The superintendent Austin at Walter Street. Let's have it. It's uh, found in a doorway on German Street shortly after noon, Austin says. Let's see. Uh-huh. L.A.C. Frederick Gordon, R.A.F., number... Number seven zero oh, uh, seven, seven one one five two, six. Uh -huh. One two five six. Well, let's see what we shall see, eh, Costello? Uh -huh. German Street, not two doors away from where our Miss Ingram had her encounter with the amorous airman. Hand me the phone, will you, Costello? Yes, sir. Give me the air ministry, please. Here, you take this. Ask them where leading air craftsman Frederick Gordon is stationed, will you? While I'll start, take a look at this thing. Yes, sir. Think that's him, sir? We'll see. Huh, what's this? Hello? Inspector Costello, Scotland Yard here. I wonder, can you tell me where to find L.A.C. Gordon? Frederick Gordon. Number 7071256. Quiet. Uh, I'll wait. What have you found, sir? Look, in the gas mask bag. Yes? Regent's Park. Special cadet wing there. Thank you. She said he was a cadet, sir. I think you'd better go see him. Yes. Wanted to find another case, sir. Uh, does, uh, does a woman's comb and a lipstick marked DB look like part of an RAF cadet's kit? While Inspector Costello set out for Regent's Park, where the special RAF cadet wing was quartered, preparing for their commissions, I took the things I'd found in the gas mask case down to the property room. May I see the effects of these women, Mrs. Rachel Soskin, Miss Marjorie Ashley, Margaret Newton, Mrs. Doris uh, Brooks... Jack the Ripper murdered, If sir. you insist on calling them that. Yes, I got them right here. Right here, all together, Well, sir. let's see them. Yes, yes, sir. Well, here, here's the first one, sir. Rachel Soskin. Mm -hmm. no, nothing in it but her identity card, sir. Ah. Well, let's see another. Uh, Marjorie Ashley. That all? Just a handbag, sir. Aha. Mm. Uh -huh. What is it? This comb. Yeah. Same as the other things in it. Where did you get it, sir? The RAF had it. Matches, doesn't it? Yes, sir. Let's see the others. Uh, Margaret Newton. Mm. Empty. Next. Doris Brooks. Right. Uh, what is it, sir? Was there a lipstick in this? Uh, no, sir. Then this one was hers. Must be, sir. 
Yeah, initials on it. D.B. Doris Brooks. Yeah, just like the silver pencil. And the comb. And nail file. Sterling. All the same initials. D.B. Not bad, not bad. Oh, uh, excuse me, sir. Well, uh, that's all I wanted. Drop it to your room. You? Oh, oh yes, sir. Superintendent Brereton, uh, the call is for you, sir. Who is it? Who is it, please? Uh, Inspector Costello, sir. Oh, good. Thank you. Brereton here. Hello, Costello. I'm at Regent's Park, sir. Yes? He's gone, sir. Well? The warrant officer here tells me he's on pass. Well, where did he go? Does he know? Yes, sir. He heard Gordon say he was going to visit a lady friend of his. <laughs> Back in my office, I had just completed a telephone call when my door was flung open. Costello entered with, an, uh, with a man in Royal Air Force Blue. Come on in. Ah, you did find him, Costello. No, sir. This is Warrant Officer Gibbons. He's from Gordon's Cadet Wing at Regent's Park, sir. Sir, I believe you're wrong about Gordon. Why, Mr. Gibbons? Gordon's one of the most popular in our wing, sir. Well, what does that prove? Well, I don't believe Gordon's capable of the thing. What's he like, Mr. Gibbons? Well, he's a fine chap, sir. Well, I admit he does chuck his weight about a little, but... Most of the chaps call him the Count, because he's so, uh, um, well, he's a gentleman, sir. May I ask, Mr. Gibbons, what did you do in civilian life? I, um, I was sales representative for the uh, Peerless Bicycle Company of Ealing, sir. Ah, I see. Warrant Officer Gibbons has brought Gordon's fingerprints with him, Superintendent. Fingerprints? And we require fingerprints to be taken on all men posted to this wing, sir. A new regulation. Very uh, praiseworthy, I'm sure. May I see them? Uh, uh, by all means, sir. Uh, thank you. Uh, Costello, will you ask Ernest Whiting to bring up those fingerprints we have so he can compare them? I'll take these down, sir. If Mr. Gibbons doesn't mind. Oh, not at all, sir. Good. All right, then, Inspector. All right. Uh, you told Inspector Costello Gordon was going to see a lady friend, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Did he mention her name? Uh, no, sir. Uh, why is he so popular there at Regent Park? Well, sir, he's, uh, he's very pleasant. He has lots of money and he, he spends it quite freely. Ah, and the men, uh, they, they like him a great deal, sir. Right, I say. Uh, uh, would you, of course, recognize Gordon? Oh, yes, of course, sir. Uh, we may ask you to do so. All right, sir. Uh, is he here? I think he will be, eventually. All right, sir. Thank you. Yes, sir. But you may need to go with us to identify him. Do you know where he is, sir? I think I know where to find him. My, you Scotland Yard people, you're... <laughs> you're marvellous. Not always, Mr. Gibbons, I'm afraid. Excuse me. Yes, yes. Superintendent Brereton here. Uh, I'm calling for Superintendent Austin, sir. Good. Any news? Uh, yes, sir. The, the porter from the Silver Kitten... The... Where... The what? The nightclub, sir, where Paula Ingram worked. Oh, yes, yes. The place on German Street where she... That's it, sir. Mm -hmm. Well, he came in only a minute ago. He said there was a RAF man, you know, an airman, asking him where she lived. Miss Ingram? Uh, Paula Ingram, sir. Did he tell him? Unfortunately, yes, sir. How long ago was that? That he asked, oh, about ten minutes ago, sir. Then he got rather terrified. He knows the story, sir. And he ran right over here to tell us. You have men at the place where she lived? Yes, sir. But there are hundreds of men on the street in airman's uniforms, and we haven't any idea what he looks like. Well, I can remedy that. I have a man here who can identify him. Well, we're afraid we'll be too late, sir. Be there as soon as I can. Now, where the devil's Costello? Costello! Ernest Whiting says they're the same, sir. Eh? The fingerprints, sir. He says he'll swear that they're the same as the ones that we have. Oh, I still think there's some mistake, sir. There isn't. If Ernest Whiting says they're the same, they're the same. He knows more about finger... Come on, Mr. Gibbons. Where are we going, sir? After Jack the Ripper. Come on, quickly. But I say... Here's your cat, Mr. Gibbons. We need you. Traffic didn't hamper us very much. We were in one of the cars of the flying squad and nothing seems to bother them. Pedestrians scuttled for the pavement as we skidded around corners on our way to the house off German Street, which Paula Ingram had given us as her address. Now, of course, you followed me. I had ordered policemen to that address as soon as I'd heard that Gordon was on his way to see a lady friend. Somehow or other, he'd obtain her name. I was certain that eventually he'd find the address and I proposed to find him. If possible, before he'd attacked Paula Ingram. It was a long way there. Our car drew up at last a few doors away from the house. 
Have you seen him yet? There have been several RAF men along the street. Come sir. on, Costello. Come on, Mr. Gibbon. Oh, thanks. Come on. This house. Come on. Up the stairs. Hurry. Him, Gibbon. Of course I do. He's Cadet Frederick Gordon. You, you coppers knock you. Frederick Gordon, I charge you with the willful murder of Marjorie Ashley. Take your filthy hands. And I warn policeman. you that anything you say will be taken down in writing and may be used in evidence. Don't touch me. Are you all right, Miss Ingram? Oh, he said he's got to kill me. He said I'd have to die. He said I'd... Search him, Costello. Hold your arms up, Gordon. Get away from Hold me. Hold your arms up, please. What's this? I know what that is. It's the carving knife the cookhouse sergeant told me had been stolen by somebody. That's the king's property. I shouldn't worry about it, Mr. Gibbons. Cadet Gordon isn't going to use it. Bring him along, Inspector. At his trial, Gordon was asked why he committed these four savage murders. He smiled. He was an extraordinarily attractive young man, and he did have a winning smile. He was asked again, why? It's really quite simple. When I was posted to the special wing, I realized that these young men, my fellow cadets, were young men of the best families, used to much better things than I was. I wouldn't be patronized by them. I'm as good as they. But I need money. Realized, of course, that an officer of the Royal Air Force, which I was soon to be, wouldn't stoop to stealing from his comrades. <laughs> oh, I have stolen before, sir. But not since I became a cadet. I, I felt I must have money, however. Why? One must keep up one's standards, my dear man. But I decided to acquire money. There are many women with full purses. Women the world would never miss. And I hit upon this scheme. I would rid the world of a few quite undesirable people, and I'd have their money. Nobody'd ever suspect they were destroyed for their money if uh, Jack the Ripper killed them. You'd be too sure the murderer was Jack come back to Earth, and you'd never notice their money, too, was gone. <laughs> I think that was rather clever. <laughs> They'd be looking around for human fiends and never even glance at the handsome R.A.S. cadet. I've been told so many times that I'm quite attractive to women. <laughs> I did very well, thank you. My only regret is that I didn't kill you, Miss Ingram. She had a good bit of money. You'd still be looking for Jack the Ripper, wouldn't you, Superintendent? Despite the desperate representations by counsel that... Frederick Gordon was insane. A jury at Old Bailey found him guilty of the murder of Marjorie Ashley. He was hanged in June 1942. Still smiling in a most charming manner. You have heard another in the series Whitehall 1212, compiled from the official files of Scotland Yard. Research on Whitehall 1212 is prepared by Percy Hoskins of the London Daily Express. The stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper. Three 
chimes mean good times on NBC. For the first time in history, Scotland Yard opens its official files to bring you the authentic true stories of some of its most baffling cases. These are the true stories, the unvarnished facts, just as they occurred, reenacted for you by an all-British cast. Only the names of the participants have, for obvious reasons, been changed. The stories are presented with the full cooperation of Scotland Yard. Research on Whitehall 1212 is prepared by Percy Hoskins, chief crime reporter of the London Daily Express. The stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper. Here to brief you on Scotland Yard file number 1098002 -002 is Chief Superintendent John Davidson. Here in the Black Museum of Scotland Yard, we have only one memento of case number 1098002, but it is a notable one. This is a bottle, alas, only partly full now, of one of the finest unblended pot still Scotch whisky that mortal man has ever tasted. I say its name with a proper respect. Its label says Jew of Glenlivet. Only three or four drinks remain in it, but I expect that wee drop is quite safe. A, the bottle is sealed. And, B, I doubt that there exists any Englishman who would care to drink after the man who last owned it. No, it's not poisoned in the conventional sense. But this Jew of Glenlivet helped to poison a man's mind. It's a shame that such an excellent product should even once be put to such an end by such people as those who gave it to the man who last owned it. Don't you agree, Commander Leonard? I find myself speechless at such sacrilege, John. Uh, this is Commander Leonard, head of the famous special branch of the CID at Scotland Yard. I may say that the late owner of the bottle was a greater criminal than appears on his record. Well, how so, Commander? I thought... That... He diluted that noble whiskey with ginger ale, John. <laughs> The city of Ottawa, in Canada, is often thought of as an American city, which of course it is. But it is also the capital city of the Dominion of Canada, and as such, a very important part of the British Commonwealth of Nations. I take you back now to September of the year 1945 in Ottawa. In the Royal Canadian Mounted Police headquarters there, early in that month, Inspector John Miller of the RCMP was speaking on the telephone with a representative of the Canadian Ministry of Justice. Who's this speaking, please? Uh, this is Mr. Dufresne, sir. And may I ask to whom I'm speaking? Inspector Miller, RCMP. Uh, how do you do, Inspector? Well, that's not important. What I want to know is, do you know a man named Igor Kovenko? Uh, I do, sir. But may I ask why, please? Well, he's here in my office, mister. Oh. I must warn you about him, Inspector. He's a dangerous he says he was in to see you this afternoon. That is true, sir. He is a very dangerous... Dangerous man. my foot. I beg your pardon. I said dangerous my foot. He's sitting here scared to death. <laughs> scared, sir. I must say I can hardly believe that. Uh, he he is... says he walked out of the code room of the Russian embassy this afternoon where he's been employed with some highly secret documents. He said... He says he brought these documents to the Ministry of Justice and was told to go home and stop bothering you. Is that true? We hardly put it in those exact terms, my dear man, but... Um, Did you throw him out? We told him we could engage in no negotiations whatever with a representative of a foreign power with whom the British government are not at war, sir. You didn't look at any of the documents he smuggled out of the Soviet embassy code room? <laughs> Naturally not, sir. You didn't know he was fed up with communism? We did not believe him, sir. I say, look here... You didn't believe he wanted to aid the British government? Uh, look here, Inspector... He turned down information that might be of the utmost importance to Britain and Canada. We believed him to be an extraordinarily clumsy spy, sir. Well, he isn't. Well, 
what's he? I said he isn't. And may I ask how you know that, Inspector? You may, sir. Uh-huh. Mister, half hour ago, a squad of Russian thugs, led by the chief security officer of the Soviet embassy in person, broke into Kovinko's apartment, armed with pistols and Tommy guns and... Uh, are you joking, sir? I am not. This was an official search party. They were going to take Kovinko and his whole family away with them, or murder them if necessary. Fortunately, he was able to get through to the RCMP, and we took care of the matter, sir. What did you do, Inspector? I we hope... spanked a lot of Russian behinds. We brought Kovinko and his family, including the children here, to the station for protection. I think you'd better get over here in the morning real early before the Ruskies get here with a writ of habeas corpus. Because from what they said, uh, they have some very interesting plans for the Covenco family. I, I must report this to my chief inspector. Yeah, do that. And tell him to hire a Russian translator. If these papers he swiped are what he says they are. Uh, I'll telephone my chief at once, sir. And, and thank you very much for calling, sir. Good night. Bureaucrats. <laughs> Igor Kovinko, the code clerk, had not only taken copies of secret documents with him, he had also a copy of the Soviet Embassy's most confidential code book itself. The documents, accordingly broken into plain Russian and translated into English, were startling. This is a paraphrase of the contents of one of them. Facts given by Alec... Excuse me. I should explain that the name Alec proved to be the Russians' identification name for the man who had betrayed British secrets to them. Go on, please. Facts given by Alec include specific information about the atom bomb dropped on Hiroshima in August. He also states that the amount of uranium-233 at the Clinton Magnetic Separation Plant in Canada is 400 grams daily. Another. Alec handed over to us a platinum container with 162 micrograms of uranium-233 in oxide form. He will keep us advised of further developments in the production of the atom bomb. Another. I enclose data on the American proximity shell for anti-aircraft, supplied to us by Alec. There are several others, only one of which I can even now reveal to you. That I will give you presently. All these messages were addressed to the director and signed by Colonel Vladimir Rabukin, the Soviet military attaché in Ottawa. I was summoned to the Foreign Office a few days before the 1st of October, shown the translations, and told the whole story as it was cabled from Ottawa. The special branch, of which I was then the head, was to take over. Take over what, I asked? Isn't all this taking place in Canada? A very important gentleman in the then British government showed me another of the documents. I promised you I'd tell you about that one, if you please. To Colonel Rabuchin, Ottawa. Work out and send by courier all arrangements for the meeting. What meeting, I asked? And the password by which our representative will recognize Alec when he comes to London. Most necessary for him to come to London at once. Signed, Director. He's coming here, I said? To the Director. Alec will meet our representative in front of the British Museum during month of October. Time, 11 o'clock in the evening. Identification for Alec. A copy of a newspaper rolled up. That's all I said? He read me another one. To Colonel Rabuchen, Ottawa. Here are revised instructions for Alec. Meeting place in front of British Museum in London on Great Russell Street, opposite side of street about Museum Street from side of Tottenham Court Road. Alec to walk from Tottenham Court Road, our contact man from opposite side, Southampton Row. Time near 8 o'clock in the evening, if practicable. Identification signs. Alec to carry under left arm the newspaper Times. Our man to have in left hand the magazine picture post. Password. Contact man, quote. What is the shortest way to the Strand? Alec, quote. Come along, I'm going that way. At the beginning of business conversation, Alec to say, best regards from Mikhail. Report and transmission of details to Alec, also date of arrival in London. Most urgent, signed Director. Must be rather serious if he's coming over here. It is, Commander. 
can only say this, that he will be bringing with him secret information of the utmost importance. Information of such importance that it cannot be committed to paper. I think I may also say this to you. The future existence of the British Commonwealth cannot be guaranteed if this information falls in the Russian hands. Then our job is to arrest this man, Alec, before he can make his contact. It's imperative that you do so. Tell me, what's his real name and when is he coming? The message I've just read you is three months old, Commander. In that time, 14 persons concerned with atomic research in Canada have arrived in Britain from there. Yes, sir. Any one of those 14 may be Alec. We haven't the remotest suspicion of his identity, nor of the contact man. Neither have we any hint of the time the contact is to be made. But the very life of our nation is at stake, sir. We must depend on you. MI5, the counterintelligence branch of military intelligence, placed dozens of their own men at our disposal. Together with the operatives of Special Branch, we were able to place in the field a quite imposing force of men and women. And there was plenty of work for all, to find an unknown man on an unknown date in a place where thousands of innocent people were passing. And with the urgency of the Commonwealth's danger to spur us on, a task as near to impossibility as one would care to mention, I'm afraid. The obvious thing was first to screen the 14 men from the Atomic Research Project in Canada who'd returned to England in the three months since the message to the director was sent. We found them one by one. I spoke to the first on the list, Mr. Frederick Giles, an Englishman, in his laboratory. Yes, I rather liked Canada. Glad I didn't have to stay the winter there, though. It gets frightfully cold. Were you in Quebec? Marvellous city, I understand. Medieval sort of place, isn't it? No, I, I never got there. I have a friend in Ottawa, Winko, in the air ministry there. Chap named Norman Helfrich. Wonder if you ever met him? No, I was never there either. Lots of chaps were, but uh, not I. They kept me at Clinton all the time I was there. The magnetic separation plant, you know. I was supposed to be an expert on a rather secret sort of isotope, you see. Never got anywhere. Quite dull, really. We checked Giles. Records showed he'd never been away from Clinton, as he said. No opportunity for him to contact any foreigners. He's in the clear, subject to further checks. Next man, Herr Professor Dr. Hannes Fischbein, a former German scientist who'd also worked in Canada. Uh, so, uh, I in Canada was four days only. I am fly to Montreal. I make my report. I am fed. <laughs> A large dinner. Colossal. And in my hotel room, they lock me up and stand the policeman with a red coat outside the door. More dinners, I am fed. And then comes the man, and I am to back to England flight. <laughs> Better I should have here geblieben sein. Canada is to me a street outside the hotel window. But I did eat. Oh, oh wonderbar. Check off Hannes Fischbein. Word came to us from the Foreign Office. Three new arrivals from Canada Atomic Research Project. Alec may be one of these. Please report progress. Checking of the arrivals from Canada went on. Mathematics professor John M. Dodds, signed from Ottawa to King's College, Strand, London. Yes, I've heard that the Russians are very active in Canada. I knew a Russian girl, Vilma Senyonova. What happened to her, Professor Dodds? I married her. She's now a Canadian citizen. Where is she? Oh, she came back with me from Canada. She's here in London. Assign a woman detective to check on Vilma Semyonova Dodds. Lawrence Mackay. Lawrence Mackay travelled alone by a government airplane from Ottawa to London. Lawrence Mackay is the six-year-old son of a Scottish nuclear physicist who was killed with his wife in a Canadian motor accident. Check off Lawrence Mackay. Georg Hasselblad. Georg Hasselblad, native of Denmark in the employ of the Atomic Project at Montreal. Return Director Olberg, Denmark. In England, only three hours. Check. Check Hasselblad off. James Nicholas McGee, junior mathematician. Died at his home in Belfast two days after returning from Canada. Check off McGee. Professor Duncan M. Allen, a senior member of the Nuclear Project Division of Imperial Chemicals Industries and a university reader. In Canada since 1943... Just returned as a senior in the Nuclear Projects Division. Some hope at last. 
Here was a highly responsible man with long experience in Canada. His advice on who might be Alex should be helpful. Since he was next on the list, I called on him. He was not of much assistance. How should I know, my dear sir? I'm a scientist. You're a detective. I thought in view of your long residence in Canada, you might be able to give us some hints. I can't. I was much too busy to add spying to my duties. You knew all of these people, though? I probably did, but I'm sure I don't remember most of them. I worked with some of them. I remember this child, Leslie McKay's son. I was sorry about Leslie and his wife. How about some of the others? This German, Fishbein, he was a former enemy. Remember the name? Didn't know the man. Dr. Dodds. Mm, I heard he married a Russian girl. Didn't know him. Giles? Short, fat chap. That's all I know. You were in Ottawa. Yes, but I was busy. I'm sure you're aware, sir, that I shouldn't be asking you questions unless this were a most important matter. What's up? Someone ran off with some U-233? As a matter of fact, that's part of it. But not all, I'm sorry to say. Now, look here. Are you serious? If any U-233 had been missing, I should have known about it. You knew of none being missing? I did not. Nor do I know now, sir. That's odd, Dr. Allen. We have what we consider excellent information. Let me see. 162 micrograms of uranium-233 were missing. Your information is quite erroneous, I can assure you, sir. Part of my duties included keeping an extremely close check on the amounts of fissionable material on hand. In fact, I was responsible for it. And if I say that none is missing, then you may rest assured that none is. Our authority is unimpeachable. Your authority is a liar. Well, I expect you ought to know. Who gave you this cock and bull story? I'm sorry, that I cannot tell you. Well, send him to me and I'll set him and you straight at once, sir. I'm afraid we can't do that, sir. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Allen. <clears throat> if you should happen to remember anything, any name... Young man, I have mathematical formulae to remember that would shatter the brains of all Scotland Yard combined. I'm afraid I'm not going to be of any assistance to you, whatever. By the way, Doctor, do you happen to remember anyone out there named Alec? Yes, of course. May I ask who, sir? Sergeant Alec MacDonnell. The MacDonnells of Kepoch, not of Calgary. He was always at pains to inform me. He was the absurd Royal Canadian Mounted Policeman who was assigned as my bodyguard in that godforsaken place. And where is he now, sir? So far as I know, my dear sir, he's never left Canada. <laughs> but he has promised to visit me here in London on his next leave. If you'd like to meet him, then... <laughs> The Foreign Office was on us every minute, demanding results. Every known Russian national in London was being watched, but not a known Russian could be discovered anywhere in the vicinity of the British Museum, the rendezvous named in the dispatch the Ottawa Code Clerk had given us. I wondered briefly if we'd not been made the victims of a hoax. Dr. Allen, who certainly ought to know, I said to the Foreign Office, was certain that no uranium-233 was missing. It is quite possible the stuff was taken without the knowledge... My dear Commander, after all, we are not dealing with children, you know. Dr. Allen was quite positive, sir. I'll send a signal to Canada asking them if they can account for it. Their records will certainly show any discrepancy. Quite true, sir. But if they say none is missing... We'll discuss that when we know for certain, Commander. Yes, sir. You have no results to show, I take it? None whatever, sir. I'm sorry. We have expected more, sir, from the special branch. I left the Foreign Office in remarkably low spirits. The special branch have always prided themselves on taking difficult assignments in stride. But this one... The age of miracles is past, I reflected, as I walked into my own office at Scotland Yard. Put me through to Fred Ibbett, my chief clerk, please. Thank you. Now, Fred, Commander Leonard here. I want this done at once. Get to all the people who are checking on the various Canadian visitors and have them supply you with as many photographs as they can get of the various ones they've checked on. No, I should think these people, if they're the proper kind, should be glad to let us have them. Yes, quite. Then send them by airplane to headquarters of the RCMP in Ottawa with instructions to let the code clerk, the Russian who skipped out. What's his name? Eh? Kovinko, that's right. Let him see all these photographs and tell us if he recognizes any of them as people he may have seen round the Russian embassy. No, they all seem to be clear, but he might just remember seeing one sometime or another. What? 
Yes, it may help us find Alec, I hope. Thank you, Fred. Yes, at once, please. I left the office, still deep in thought. Bought a newspaper and started walking. And what can we do now, I thought. Begin checking everyone again. Does Alec really exist? I glanced up. Where had I got to in my daydreaming? <laughs> there was the British Museum. Excuse me. What's the shortest way to the stand? Hmm? Uh, oh, back that way to High Holborn. First turn to your left down Kingsway and... Wait! Oh, excuse me! You're not Alec! And before I could do more than goggle at her, the young woman carrying a copy of the picture post had turned and vanished into the crowd on Great Russell Street. I pulled my times from under my left arm and flung it away and was properly reprimanded by a constable. But the contact man was gone. Would you mind kicking me, constable, I said to the officer. Funny, wasn't it? One week and two days later, the bloated body of what had been a young woman was pulled from the Thames just below Wapping Old Stairs by men of T Division of the Metropolitan Police. She was thought to be a former employee of the Russian Embassy, but none of the Embassy staff could identify her. The morning after my contretemps in Great Russell Street, I called again on Dr. Allen, the senior scientist who had assured me that I was wrong about the missing uranium. I'm very sorry, Commander. I have a lecture to give at King's College in half an hour. I've no time to talk to you. I think you will find it of great importance, sir. And moreover, I have given you definitive answers to the rather idiotic questions you've already asked me. I must tell you, Doctor, that this matter seriously and urgently concerns our national security. I'm sorry, but as I told you, it... I'm sorry too, Doctor, but I'm afraid you'll have to answer my questions. Now, see here. I dislike to say this, Dr. Allen, but I must point out that I have sufficient authority to compel you to answer my questions. I hope I shall not be forced to use it. Are you impugning my integrity, sir? I'm merely pointing out that the matter is one of the utmost urgency, sir. Young man, I've exactly 15 minutes before I must leave for my lecture. I told him what we knew. I told him of the dispatches we'd gained possession of. Were any names mentioned in this message, Commander? Any that could be recognized? No, I told him. Only Alec. And I told him what had happened to me the day before. He chuckled heartily. I reminded him with some asperity of the seriousness of the situation... He sobered at once. I agree with your man at the Foreign Office, whom you so pointedly avoid identifying, that this Alec, whoever he is, is in possession of information which, if obtained by a hostile nation, might easily spell destruction for the British Commonwealth, Commander. I reminded him that Alec must obviously be someone who possessed a great knowledge of the progress of nuclear fission research. That's true. That's a very good deduction, Commander. He's obviously an important person. I asked him if he had the faintest suspicion of who he might be. That I'll have to think about. Here is a list of the arrivals from Canada. Is there any name on this list who could conceivably answer such a description, I asked. He scanned it rapidly. Mm. No one except myself? Perhaps he hasn't got here yet, I said. I think he has. Else why were you accosted with a password yesterday and even addressed as Alec? You're right, sir. He is here. Well, then, Commander, I see only one thing for you to do. What's that, sir? Find him if you can. Well, sir... I assure you, the most frighteningly immediate end of this nation of yours is inevitable if you do not find Alec before these secrets are turned over to Russia. I say it's inevitable, sir, because I do know what they are. I will talk with you again, but my present job is also of importance in the national security. Shall we say tomorrow, then? I returned to Scotland Yard, to my office. There was an urgent note on my desk. It read, Call RCMP headquarters in Ottawa, Canada, at once. Inspector Miller. Highest priority, immediate action. And several other words whose meaning was quite as clear. I put through the call. I want Inspector Mill... Yes, Ottawa, Canada. This is Commander Leonard at Scott... Hello, Miller here. Are you Commander Leonard? Yes, yes, this is Commander Leonard. Hello. Yes, this is Leonard Miller. This oh, is, is Leonard. Leonard? Yes. Oh, this is Inspector Miller in Ottawa. How's the weather there in London? What? It's all right. What did you want? Oh, yes. It's raining here. Cold. Probably turned to snow. What did you want of me? Oh, yes. Well, your pictures got here. Photographs of those people. Yes. Well, we showed them to the coat clerk fellow, this Coven Co. He recognized only one of them. He used to see about the Russian embassy several times, he said. Which one? 
say? I said which one. Oh. Well, you didn't put any names on them, just those numbers. You recognize the one marked number four? What? Four. One, two, three, four. Four? You got it? Number four? I don't know what the fellow's name is, but it's number four. All right, thank you. Who is he, you know? I haven't got the list here. I'll have to let you know. But thanks. Thanks, old boy. I think we've got Alec. What do you say? Goodbye. I identified him all right. It was mid-afternoon before I could reach Dr. Allen with the news, which I was impatient to check with him before reporting to the foreign office. I got him on the telephone and rushed to his flat at once. So you think you've got him, eh? Well, tell me about it. How did you discover? Are you sure? I'm reasonably sure, sir. He's the only one of the whole list who'd ever been seen around the Soviet embassy. Who is he? He's the only one who could possibly be Alex, sir. Well, before you tell me, let's have a drink, shall we? I seldom indulge, but I've got a very fine bottle of Dew of Glenlivet here. Here it is. I expect you'll have it neat, won't you? <laughs> Don't think I'm a barbarian, I know, but I always mix mine with ginger ale. Here, help yourself. No. What's that? I will not drink with you, sir. What's the matter? I have one more question to ask you, Dr. Allen. Go ahead. The number four man on the list whom I checked on is the one they identified... Do you know who he is? I'm afraid not, Commander. I'm afraid then I'll have to ask you one more question, sir. What is the shortest way to the Strand? Well, come along. I'm going that way. I think not, Alec. I arrest you on the charge of violating the Official Secrets Act. And I must warn you that anything you say will be taken down and may be used in evidence. <laughs> It was Dr. Allen himself whom the code clerk recognized as having been a frequent visitor to the Soviet embassy in Ottawa. Dr. Allen testified at the Old Bailey at his trial that he was opposed to any program that did not share the secrets of nuclear fission with all nations equally. It is not clear what his reasons were for sharing with the Russians not only what secret information he possessed about the atom bomb and its construction, but also the secret details of the proximity fuse and several other top-secret weapons of war. Here is one line of his testimony that will interest you. Yes. I received in exchange for this information a small amount of dollars. I don't remember exactly how many. Oh, yes, yes. And they also gave me a bottle of what I was told was very excellent whiskey. I'm afraid I still don't see, Commander Leonard, why you would not drink with me. For his treasonous exploits, Dr. Duncan M. Allen, the nuclear physics senior, received a sentence of ten years' penal servitude. It was never proved that Dr. Allen was ever a communist, but it is certain that he's a secure prisoner. <laughs> You have heard another in the series Whitehall 1212, compiled from the official files of Scotland Yard. Research on Whitehall 1212 is prepared by Percy Hoskins of the London Daily Express. The stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Whitehall, one, two, one, two. This is Scotland Yard.
first time in history, Scotland Yard opens its official files to bring you the authentic true stories of some of its most baffling cases. These are the true stories, the unvarnished facts, just as they occurred, reenacted for you by an all British car. Only the names of the participants have for obvious reasons been changed. The stories are presented with the full cooperation of Scotland Yard. Research on Whitehall 1212 is from Percy Hoskins, chief crime reporter of the London Daily Express. The stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper. Now, here is Chief Superintendent John Davidson of Scotland Yard, the curator of the famous Black Museum, to brief you on case number 330220. If you're planning murder, which I sincerely hope you're not, a visit to the Black Museum here will most certainly, I believe, serve as a deterrent. Here we have a large collection of murder weapons, from the simplest to the most ingenious, and most of them have been used effectually. Now here's a knife, still stained with a murdered man's dried blood. Yeah, the user of that knife was hanged. And here is a revolver bullet from a man's brain. Yeah, the man who fired that shot was hanged. And the one-time possessor of this tiny file, which at the time contained poison, thought to murder her husband. Now, the hangman ended her career, too. And this carpenter's mallet here. The wielder of that one drew a trip to the execution shed for the unorthodox use of it. You know, most murderers are caught, and they die more ignominiously than their victims. And here in the Black Museum lie the instruments that encompass two deaths the victims and the murderer's own. This innocent tool once fell into evil hands. It's all that remains. Now, Chief Inspector Nigel Loring knows a great deal about this case, number 330220. The old heathens used to believe that their gods were the ones who inspired mortals to murder. This god has the bloodiest murder record of them all. Who was that, Nigel? Mars, the god of war? No, no, John. His name is Cupid. He was the god of love. When Thomas a. Beckett Appleby married Alma Virginia Farnestock in Canada, he was 70 years old. Alma Virginia was 39. They had both been married before. Her first husband was dead, and Thomas Appleby had divorced his first wife to marry the attractive middle-aged widow. The affair had been a nine-day scandal in their Canadian home, and they had shortly removed to Bournemouth near Southampton to take up what might be called life anew. When I was first assigned to the case, I asked Uncle Tom Cobley, the village ancient of Bournemouth, to describe the Applebys to me. Appleby? Why, he be a bitter old man. Though he's a good score of years younger than I be. Never pays no attention to nobody except in his money and his bottle. Forgot everything but that... <laughs> that that wife of his even, mister. And uh, Mrs. Alma Appleby? Eh? Mrs. Alma Appleby. Oh, she's pretty, even if she be no chicken. He don't pay her no mind. Even if half of the men in Bournemouth be in love with her, mister, including me. <laughs> and so, when Thomas a. Beckett Appleby died at the age of 75 from the result of a broken skull, there was scant sympathy to be expected for him and much indeed for Alma Virginia, his wife, until Alma Virginia opened her mouth and spoke to a sergeant of the Bournemouth police station who had been summoned by Dr. Owen Trelawney, the attending physician. I did it. I tell you I did it. Tell the coroner I did it. That's all I have to say. Madam, do you know what you're saying in the presence of witnesses? Certainly I know what I'm saying. I killed him. I hit him on the head with mallet. Right down. Madam, you don't know what you're saying. You're drunk. <laughs> <laughs> I was assigned to the case the following day. You know as much about the case now as I did then. Thomas a. Beckett Appleby lay dead in a nursing home with his skull fractured in three places. The new-made widow, it was now near ten the following morning, was awake after having slept nearly twelve hours after her confession to the Bournemouth sergeant. The maid, Marjorie Bates, brought her downstairs. 
There was nothing very attractive about Alma Virginia Appleby as she slumped into a chair in the disordered sitting room. I need some more tea, Marjorie. Scotland Yard, eh? Uh, yes, Mrs. Appleby. Well? I was hoping you'd care to amplify the statement you made last night, Mrs. Appleby. Statement? About your husband's death, Mrs. Appleby. Marjorie! Oh. How are you ever going to bring that tea? I, uh, was hoping you'd care to amplify that statement, Mrs. Appleby. How? We are wondering how your husband was murdered. I don't know. I... All I know is I heard a noise. I came downstairs and turned on the light. He was sitting in his easy chair, all bloody. Uh, Here's the tea. You better pour Mr. The Detective some too, Marjorie. Oh, good. Oh, that's good. Thank you. Then I'm to understand, Mrs. Appleby, that you say he had already been struck when you saw him first. Oh, bloody dreadful. Poor Tom. I might point out that that statement hardly accords with the statement you made last night, Mrs. Appleby. Did I make a statement last night? You did, madam. To whom? To Sergeant Milton of the Bournemouth Police. I don't remember it. Oh. I wonder. I was so shocked and shocked by the sight of poor old Tom. He'd been drinking as usual, and I picked up the bottle and just swilled down a great drink myself. I I drank a great deal, honestly. I don't remember. Perhaps I said something when I... When I... When you were drunk, madam? What did I say? You said that you had murdered your husband. I, I said I murdered him. It's in the Sergeant Milton's report. Well, that, I said I killed my husband. You did? Why? Then, oh, I did. You come to take me to the jail? Well, I... I'm quite ready. Marjorie, fetch my cloak. Marjorie, bring my cloak, I said. I'm going to jail. But uh, look here, Mrs. Appleby. What's going on here? I say, what's going on here? Quite all right, George. It is not all right. Who is this man? Who are you, fellow? I think I might ask the same question of you, young man. Now, don't come that on me. Is he annoying you, Aunt Alma? I'm Chief Inspector. This is Chief Inspector. I'm afraid I've forgotten your name. Loring, Scotland Yard. Oh, you are, are you? And what are you doing here? We've had enough police. May I ask who this young man is, Mrs. Appleby? This is George Emmons, Chief Inspector. George has been our chauffeur. George is... Your nephew, I gather? I am not. George has been almost one of the family. And it's my duty to protect you. Well, where's he taking you? Were you here last night, young George? When old Tom was killed by that burglar. Is that the way it was? Mm, He was drunk, as usual. Answering your question, I was out in the garage working on the car, mister. George didn't know anything about it. He heard me scream when I found Tom sitting there all bloody. Dead. I didn't know he was dead when you found him, Mrs. Appleby. He was... I thought you said you killed him. What? Oh, that's right. I did kill him. I'd forgotten. You did not. I did. I did not, Alma. She couldn't. She says she did, young man. Well, she did. I did. I did, George. I swear. You did not, Alma. I am sorry, Mrs. Appleby. I detain you on suspicion Mm. of having been involved in the murder of Thomas the Beckett. No, I tell you. And I must warn you that anything you say will be taken down in writing and may be used in evidence. Very well, sir. Alma. Be quiet. Then I say that I alone am responsible for the death of my husband. I and I alone murdered him. That is not be, George. I did it. Now, if you're ready, Chief Inspector. Aren't you going to kiss me goodbye, George? The boy, George Percy Emmons, insisted upon accompanying Alma Appleby and me, but there was nothing for it. He had to stay behind. Mrs. Appleby wept copiously as they parted, and it was with some difficulty that the maid, Marjorie, and I were able to separate them. I glanced at young George as I closed the car door. I was a little surprised to discover that he too was whimpering like a puppy left behind and his eyes were overflowing with childish tears. I was faintly revolted at the sight of this great hulking moon calf's behavior and I'm afraid I spoke my mind. Bawling like a blasted baby, I said. 
Poor Georgie is a baby. Poor Land's only 18, after all. Only 18, I thought. If I'd bawled like that when I was 18, I'd have had my trousers well booted. It would help this great larrikin, too, I thought. Poor George. He's so sweet. I glanced at her curiously, I suppose. I've seen a look like that on a woman's face before. <laughs> Motive. The back of my mind said to me, Motive. Inattentive, grumpy, 75-year-old husband, I thought. Handsome, attentive, 18-year-old boy. And then I remember that unmanly blubbering, that squalling like a spanked baby, and I was ashamed of myself. And when she spoke again... My baby died when he was two. I keep thinking of George as my baby boy. But the love in her eyes when she turned to me, I thought uneasily, wasn't exactly the kind of love, uh, love one has for a son... According to the judge's rules, one may not ask questions of a person who has been charged except to clarify any statements made. There was no need to ask Alma Appleby any questions. Yes, I killed him. Yes, I had a reason. Reasons, rather. Tom was old and ill. He was always in poor spirits. He worried about money. He worked hard all his life. And now his savings, he thought, were being spent. He knew he could never get me more money. He was an old man. He was afraid of dying, but he constantly talked suicide. He always sat alone in the sitting room and drank every night. Half a bottle every night. Very simple. I couldn't stand it any longer. I'm not a young woman, but I'm not unattractive either, am I? I had a hard life, too. Deserve another chance, don't I? Tied to an old man. A sick old man. A drunken old man. A worried old man who constantly threatened to kill himself. He'd be better off. And I thought I'd be better off. He didn't know it. He didn't know anything. He was sitting there in his chair, drunk like he was every night. So he wanted to die, I'd grant his wish. I'd be free. People would think a burglar or a tramp did it. So I picked up his bottle. I had to steal myself, didn't I? Yes, I drank. I drank quite a lot. He was sitting there staring at nothing at all as I drank out of his bottle. So I went out and got the man. George wasn't there. He didn't know anything about it. He was in the garage working. And I took the man in. And I hit Tom on the head. Just once I hit him. He didn't move or cry out or anything. I just smashed him once and he died. Then? I, then I'm afraid I drank the rest of Tom's whiskey. That's all I remember. No, I don't remember telling anyone I'd murdered him. But I expect I must have, because I did kill him, you know. I'd been thinking about it a long time, you know, and... And I made up my mind to it. I would do it, and I did do it. He died very easily. Just one smash with the mallet, and it was all over. He didn't even know it. And I feel he died happy. I'm sorry for him. I did rather like him, but... Well, that's the whole story. All of it. I thought I was doing him a favor... And everything would be all right. I could blame it on the burglar or whoever. I should have known I couldn't get away with it. Oh, yes. And be sure to put down that it was all my idea. Nobody at all had anything to do with it but me. Put it all down in writing. Just the way I told you and I'll sign it. I murdered him. Oh, help me. Alma Virginia Appleby. That was the gist of what she told the examining magistrate of Bournemouth, who accordingly remanded her for trial at the Southampton Assizes later in the month. I wasn't satisfied. John Davidson, the Black Museum man, he was plain superintendent then, was in Bournemouth visiting his great aunt who was afflicted with sciatica. John, having escaped the ailing aunt for a morning, had attended the examination. Afterwards, he and I repaired to the nearest pub. John was not happy. 
None of my business, Loring, but... That woman's lying. Uh, she lied about the number of times old Tom Appleby was tapped on the head with a mallet. The doctor said three times. She insisted it was only once. Well, she was pretty drunk. Granted. So let's have some more pigs here, shall we? Right. Miss, two of the same, please. Right, sir. <clears throat> Granted that she has made a mistake there. Granted that she was undoubtedly a little script, as I should probably be if I have much more of this beer. <laughs> well, thank you, miss. But what murderer ever forgets how many times he strikes his victim? Cheers. Cheers. Ah. <clears throat> More than meets the eye, say I. Oh, well, that's the way I feel, too. Call me down here from Scotland Yard. First thing that happens, the woman confesses. Confessed the Bournemouth policeman before, didn't she? While she was drunk. She a drinking woman? Apparently not. A Dr. Trelawney told me old Appleby did all the drinking in the family. So at the risk of sounding like a fool, I say that circumstances all the cases. Well, murdering one's husband can be said to be something of a circumstance, huh? Well, covering up a murder of a husband by somebody else could also be said to be circumstance knowing. Ah. Uh, isn't it? Who's she covering up, then? I don't know. Wasn't anybody who hated the old man, apparently. No. Don't you know? Well, after all, I've been here a very short time, sir, and the case is closed. Well, it's the hangman who closes murder cases, Long. I know that. <clears throat> See, I noticed another thing. What's that, sir? She seemed very anxious to impress on everyone the fact that this murder was her own idea. Yes. See, I know quotation. Uh, yes, sir? Shakespeare. Hamlet. Oh, 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 what is it, sir? The lady doth protest too much, methinks. Mm. <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> I seem to be full of wise souls and modern instances to tell along. Yes, yeah. yes, sir. You know, French have a saying, uh, la femme, if uh, my pronunciation is right. <laughs> well, we've got the woman, sir. We don't have to look for her. Excuse me, I got my genders mixed up. In that case... Look for the man, old boy. The man's dead, sir. Hmm. Is he the only one? The good grey superintendent drank up his beer and left at the bedside of his great aunt. I paid the score and set out for Canary Villa, the place where the tragedy had occurred, thinking to make certain discreet inquiries of the maid, Marjorie. The doors were open. Marjorie was absent. I wandered through the silent, dreary house, looking in every room. The place was deserted. And I heard a noise. The garage, I decided. I followed my ears. I watched young George for quite a while before he discovered me. What do you want? like to ask you a few questions, George, if you don't mind. Oh, you're the policeman. Chief Inspector Loring, that's right. I've got nothing to say to you. You're trying to hang my Aunt Alma. No, I'm not, George. I don't think... She didn't do it. I told you she didn't do it. I know. You got any suspicions, George? Well, of course. Some thief, some tramp or something done it. Really think so? Yes. I don't think a tramp did it. Well... Well, she didn't do it. I'm sure of that. Can you prove that, mister? Frankly, no. Look, George, I have an idea it was someone that didn't like Mr. Appleby. Who? I thought perhaps you could tell me if he had any enemies. I don't know any. Go on with your work, George. We can talk. I'm almost done. Well, I'll help you. I'm a pretty good motor mechanic. Well, um... Uh, I was just straightening this thing. Well, I'll give you a hand. I suppose I should feel sorry for old Tom. You don't? No. I didn't like him. He didn't like me either. You'd know, I suppose, if anybody ever indicated that he hated Mr. Appleby. Of course. I knew them both pretty well. Worked here six months. No, no, seven. She didn't hate him. Alma? Uh, Aunt Alma, you mean? No, she certainly didn't. Put up with an awful lot from him, though. It was frightful. Always grousing at her when I drove around the countryside in the car. Always drunk. She drink too? 
No. Only that night, when she found him with those three holes in his head. Was he struck three times? Three jolly great smashes. <coughs> and you don't have any idea who did it? This burglar. <coughs> burglar? Well, whoever it was. Where did the mallet come from that he was killed with? Well, it was ours. Cops took it away. Well, I hope they find whoever it was. Well, if you cops are any good... We're trying. That's why I'm talking to you, George. Huh? Why? Hope you might be able to help her. Listen, mister. I'd give my life for her. Well... I love her. She's been very nice to you, I understand. I love her. She's the sweetest, the most adorable, the most... Well... Huh? She's going to hang. No! She's not. She didn't do she it. Confess, she... George. <laughs> <laughs> they won't let me see her. Now, George. I've got to see her, I tell you. I've got to see her. Why is it so important? <laughs> Why, George? Because they'll hang her. They'll hang Alma. She didn't do it. She didn't murder Tom, and they're going to hang her for something she didn't do. But what what good will it do for you to see her? I'll tell you what good it'll do. I know who did it. I know, I tell you. Do you hear me? I know who killed Tom Appleby. Who? I know who murdered him, and so does she. I've got to talk to her, or they'll hang her. <laughs> Alma Virginia Appleby's life was in desperate jeopardy. She had been remanded for trial, and no power on earth is sufficient to alter the slow, regular course of British justice before that trial takes place. Not even a confession by another person can change her status, that of a prisoner awaiting trial before a jury of her peers. I explained that to George Percy Emmons. You're coming to the rescue a trifle late, young George, I said. It might be that you're too late. I've, I've got to save her. I love her. And she loves me. This is George Percy Emmons' statement. I have worked as chauffeur and general handyman for about seven months for Alma and Tom Appleby. Alma, Mrs. Appleby, has been very good to me. She said I'm like what her dead son might have grown up to be. He did not like me. He didn't like anybody. He was always drunk. And he mistreated our ma Mrs. Appleby. She tried to keep away from him. She always asked me to drive her to various places so she could be away from him. And his... his tyranny. I love her very much. Three months ago, I asked her to marry me. First, well, she laughed at me. And then she cried. She said that she was old enough to be my mother. I said that I was old enough to become her husband. But she said she already had a husband. And I said he was a bad husband, and old, and ill-mannered. And she agreed. But she said he was her husband, and she'd sworn to be his wife. I told her I loved her, but she said, no, that is evil. I asked her... If she didn't have Tom for a husband, would she marry me? She cried and said, you must not say that to me. I asked her many more times to marry me when Tom died. Six times. Tom was old and he was no good and he mistreated her. And finally, the seventh time, I asked her if she would marry me if Tom was dead. She cried some more and I begged her to answer me. And at last she said yes. And she kissed me and said again she would marry me if I still wanted her to after Tom was dead. And I thought about it a long time. On the night Tom was... Tom was killed. On that night, I'd brought her back from a trip in the country and we were very happy. She kissed me when we came home and she said she loved me. And my heart was breaking. And then when Tom got drunk that night, he hit her. When she told him he shouldn't drink so much because it was affecting his health. And then I decided. I waited till she and Marjorie, the maid, went upstairs to bed. And then I got the mallet from the garage. 
and I stole into the house, and Tom was sitting in his chair, and he was in a stupor, and he didn't hear me. And I crept up behind him, and I hit him three times on his bald head, very hard, so I heard the bone crack. And he slid down in the chair, and he was dead, I thought. And I thought, now we can be married, Alma and me. But I, when I went to the staircase to go up and tell her, I looked up, and she was standing there, and she had seen it all. And everything I did, killing him, had come to naught. And I am a murderer, and Alma must not hang, although I surely shall. This is my confession. Write it down, and I will sign it. So help me, George Percy Emmons. George Percy Emmons was remanded for trial by the same magistrate who had examined uh, Alma Virginia Appleby. They were tried together at the Southampton Assizes a little more than a month after Thomas Appleby had died. Both defendants pleaded guilty. Both seemed, as one crime reporter complained, to outdo the other in protestations, not of innocence, but of guilt. Unlike almost every case where a man and a woman had been accused of murder... They did not attempt to fix the guilt on one another, but each seemed determined to save the other's life at the cost of his own. This was the verdict of the jury. Members of the jury, are you agreed upon your verdict? Yes, sir. Do you find the prisoner, Alma Virginia Appleby, guilty or not guilty of murder? Not guilty. Do you find the prisoner, George Percy Emmons, guilty or not guilty of murder? Guilty. We should like to add a rider to that. We recommend him to mercy. George Percy Emmons, you stand convicted of murder. Have you to say anything why the court should not give you judgment of death according to law? I wish to... Let the prisoner, Alma Virginia Appleby, be discharged. George! George, take me! Take me! And so they hanged 18-year-old George Emmons. And on the day he was hanged, Alma, the woman who was old enough to be his mother, but young enough to have wanted to be his wife, sat down and wrote a letter. She sealed it, addressed it to the people of England. And standing in the room where Thomas a. Beckett Appleby had died by her lover's hand, she stabbed herself through the heart. Justice was done. <laughs> You have heard another in the series Whitehall 1212, compiled from the official files of Scotland Yard. Research on Whitehall 1212 is by Percy Hoskins of the London Daily Express. The stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Whitehall, one, two, one, two. This is Scotland Yard. For the first time in history, Scotland Yard opens its official files to bring you the authentic, true stories of some of its most baffling cases. These are the true stories... The plain, unvarnished facts, just as they occurred, reenacted for you by an all-British cast. Only the names of the participants have, for obvious reasons, been changed. The stories are presented with the full cooperation of Scotland Yard.
Research on Whitehall 1212 comes from Percy Hoskins, chief crime reporter of the London Daily Express. The stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper. Chief Superintendent John Davidson will brief you on this case, number 381-397. Good afternoon. This Gladstone bag is one of my exhibits in the Black Museum back there. A perfectly ordinary black Gladstone bag, vintage, I should say, 1920. Now, it doesn't unlock any longer. The lock has been forced. But it can be opened. Now, you can guess for yourself what those stains are. You see, they're both on the lining of the bag and on this tennis racket cover, which has been in the bag since Easter weekend of 1924. And now, if you please, here is Inspector Rape Sylvester, who I think will tell you how this bag came into our possession here at Scotland Yard's Black Museum. I could supply the answer quite simply and quickly, sir. Yeah, I know that one, old boy. The owner had no further use for it. The owner had no further use for anything, sir, except the services of Pierpoint the hangman. Robert Emmett Dignam worked very hard at being a hail fellow well met. He was a dapper man, a, a persuasive talker, and thus an excellent salesman, despite the fact that he was only five feet two inches tall. Dignam's wife, Olivia, who worked as a contometer uh, operator at a salary of three pounds a week, entertained certain suspicions of her husband, due largely to his undeniable attraction for other women, particularly tall women. She herself was an inch shorter than her husband, a scant five foot one in height. One day when Robert Emmett Dignam had returned home to Kew from a weekend trip to Manchester, he'd said, on business, Olivia Dignam came across a cloakroom ticket from Waterloo Station in the pocket of the suit he had worn. She asked an old friend of hers, Herbert Chin, for advice. Chin, who had been a detective sergeant of the Metropolitan Police, took the ticket and went to the Waterloo Station cloakroom to see what was what. He was not a particular friend of Robert Emmett Dignam, and then he came to see me at Scotland Yard. Oh, I turned in the ticket and the man handed me a bag, a black Gladstone bag. It was locked? Locked, yes. But I was able to pull the sides apart a bit. So you could see what was in it? Yes. What was? It was empty. Mm -hmm. Except for some pieces of silk, what looked like a tennis racket case and a large knife. Well, that's an odd combination, I agree, but... Well, I'll take my oath. They were all stained with blood. <laughs> Chin gave me the ticket which he had got back when he returned the bag to the cloakroom shelves. I took it and went to see for myself. I, I took one of the pieces of silk and sent it to the laboratory to be tested. Back came the report. Human blood. I put two detectives on a 24 hours a day watch of the cloakroom. At nine o'clock the next morning, they brought him in and left him in my office. I asked him his name. Robert Emmett Dignam, Inspector. <laughs> named after the great Irish patriot, you know. Uh, this your bag, Mr. Dignam? Well, I paid for it. Is it yours? <laughs> uh, yes, sir. I left it in... Uh, uh, you know what's in it? What I'd love to know is how it came to be here. You left the ticket for it in a pocket of your green suit. Oh. My beloved wife goes through my pockets. She does, sir. At least she did in this instance. She wants a thrashing, doesn't she? I shouldn't let a constable catch you at it. I shan't, thank you. I asked you if you know what's in your bag, sir. Nothing very important. Shall we look? Um, will you unlock it? These things yours? Well, that's my tennis racket case. Your name is Dignam, you said? Yes. Initials on it are I-J-M. Eh? Not yours, are they? I bought it from a friend several years ago. Hmm... These pieces of silk and this knife. Cook's knife, big one. I must have picked it up at the bungalow. Are these stains, Mr. Dignam, can you explain them too? Oh. Why, I'm very fond of dogs. Dogs? Uh, yes, I was carrying some dog meat in the bag. Oh, odd place to carry it, I know. <laughs> I had it all wrapped up in these bits of silk. And that's where the stains came from, old boy. What sort of meat was it? Oh, whatever kind of meat, uh, you know, dog... 
beef or horse meat, perhaps. Oh, yeah, probably horse meat, I fancy. That blood is from the meat? Of mm. course, I, I said. It was human blood that caused those stains, Mr. Dignam. I should be glad to hear your explanation of that, sir. Well, all I can say is that it was dog's meat. What kind of dogs do you have, sir? Oh, I haven't got any... I mean... <laughs> what do you find so amusing, sir? <laughs> well, all this is making me sound quite like a murderer, isn't it? Mr. Dignam, I must detain you on suspicion of murder. Look here. And I warn you that anything you say will be taken down in writing and may be used in evidence. If you have anything to say now, I'll be glad to hear it. Well, well, I'll have to think about that. Mr. Dignam thought. He thought for a long time. Sitting in my office, staring out of the window at the rain. Ten minutes went by. I looked at him. <clears throat> I've got to get some things straight in my mind. Take your time, Mr. Dignam, I said. He sighed, asked for a drink of water, drank it thirstily, and returned to his staring out the window. Another 15 minutes went by. <clears throat> Speaking to me, Mr. Dignam, I asked. I suppose you know all about this, don't you? I've no intention of telling you what we know, Mr. Dignam. It's for you to tell us if you want to. You've been warned. What? That anything you say may be used in evidence. Yes. Well, it, it isn't murder. What are you writing down? What you've just said. Oh. Well, it isn't murder. I've been very foolish, perhaps. Write that down, too. Uh, I'll make a statement now. I've got it all straight, what to say. When you are ready, Mr. Dignam. I do not know who this fellow was, this man. I'd gone for a weekend's rest to the bungalow. I've been very exhausted. I worked very hard, you understand, and I felt the need for a rest. Alone, all by myself to recuperate, to regain my strength. I didn't tell my wife or anyone where I was going. I wanted no interruptions, you understand, either uh, business or domestic. Are you getting all that? Yes. I had come across this place in my travels. A capital place to be alone, I thought at once. To rest, to refresh myself, I thought at once. A genuine deserted cottage on the deserted seashore. I told no one about my plans. I, I took only just a few articles of clothing. Uh, oh, yeah, and, of course, the tennis racket. The tennis racket you refer to is the one that was in the case marked with the initials IJM. Eh? Uh, that's the one. Uh, the one I bought from someone several years ago. I went to this place alone and settled down for the evening. About midnight, I was awakened from a sound sleep uh, by a sound. Uh, shall I go slower? Thank you, I'm getting it all right. A man, a tramp by his appearance, I have no clue whatever to his identity, burst into my room. He told me he wanted my money. I leaped out of bed, and seeing he was much larger than I, started to retreat. He seized an axe... An axe? Uh, it was used for chopping up firewood, and he threw it at me. He attacked me first. Got that? Yes. The axe rebounded from the wall and the handle was broken. Then, despite the difference in our sizes, I grappled with him. He slipped and fell, his head striking the edge of a large coal scuttle alongside the fireplace. He did not get up. To my horror, I discovered he was dead. Have you got that? Yes. I'm afraid I lost my head. I carried the body into the other room. Then I think I fainted. When I recovered consciousness, I was horrified to find the body still on the couch where I had placed it. Then I made my greatest mistake. I was panicky. I thought I might be accused of murder. <coughs> my first thought was to dispose of the body. Do you know what I did? No. I first tried to burn the body in the fireplace. The clothes caught on fire, but I grew more frightened. I 
put on my coat and I walked to Eastbourne where I bought the large knife, uh, the one in the bag. I came back and then when I got I back into the I will spare car, you I the rest the of floor. Robert Emmett Dignam's gruesome story, except for the curious commentary Herbert Chin, the friend of Mrs. Dignam's no maid on the case. The man was Dignam was concluding his statement with a telephone rang. I'm a fool. Excuse me. Inspector Sylvester him. Herbert Chin here. Oh, oh, how do you do? I take it you got him. Mm hmm. Well, I, I saw his wife. I told her it was his raincoat Dignam had left at the Waterloo cloakroom, but, but she won't be satisfied. Oh? Well, she's sure it's something to do with some woman he's been chasing. Has it turned out that way? I mean, is it permissible to ask you that? Turns out quite different, it seems, Tell her. Well, she'll be glad to hear that. <laughs> uh, she keeps insisting this Manning girl is involved in it somehow. Oh, she'll be very glad. Uh, what, uh, what was that name? Manning. Irene Josephine Manning, that's a full name, I believe. I looked over at the initials on the tennis racket case in the black Gladstone bag. I-J-M. Irene Josephine Manning. So that was the name of the former owner. Was it also the name of... Go on, Mr. Dignam, I said. I didn't mention the name of Irene Josephine Manning to Dignam at this time. Rather, I sat and squirmed with impatience while he told me more details of the place where the alleged tramp had been accidentally killed. It was at a place called the Crumbles, a long stretch of shingle on Pevensey Bay near Eastbourne in East Sussex. Shingle, as you Americans perhaps do not know, is a... Well, it's a kind of pebbly, rocky beach, very unpleasant underfoot. The Crumbles is as desolate a spot as could be found on the southeast coast. Windy and dreary, deserted by nearly all human life. The cottage where the tragedy had occurred, Digdom told me, bore the quaint name of um, the officer's house, part of a former Coast Guard station. And Dignam had rented it from a Mr. Saul Brainerd. When Dignam had finished his statement, he was tucked into a cell at Cannon Row Police Station, and I motored to Eastbourne to interview Mr. Brainerd. I'm Brainerd, Inspector. What have I done now? You've rented a house, Mr. Brainerd. Well, I suppose it was a crime to charge three and a half guineas a week for that place. Oh, I'll go along peacefully. Uh, you did rent it to Mr. Dignam, then? Dignam? I told him his name was Plunkett. Old Irish family, he said. Related to Lord Dunsany. Little bit of a chap. Mm. Recognize him again, would you? Oh, he's unmistakable. Cocky little beggar. Paid up, of course. Oh, for two more weeks. Well, that's why I haven't been around there. Said he liked privacy. And I'm no trespasser, though I am a landlord. I wonder when you saw him last. Well, I saw him and his wife come in. I was cycling by. He, he didn't see you? Well, I don't think so. He was up there on the road. His wife? Oh, great tour girl. Sure it wasn't another man you saw? Oh, great mop of blonde hair blowing in the wind. We've no long-haired men around here. Leave that for London. Hmm. Besides, he did mention his wife to me when he rented the place, seems to me. Well, when was that? Oh, Saturday evening. Late afternoon, rather. Why, what's up? Haven't seen him since? Well, or her? Haven't been around. Said he was looking for privacy, as I said. Yes, yes I expect he was. A good place for it. Yes. Would you come to London and see if you recognize him? Isn't he here? No. I sell, chap. What's up? Things. Uh, would you? Well, the affair to London... Oh, the home office will pay him. <laughs> In that case, the answer's yes. Well, won't mind if I go round to my tailor's whilst I'm there, will you? Not at all, if you'll come. <laughs> Say no more. I'm your man for a free trip to London. Ooh, what else can I do for you? A spot of whiskey? A cup of tea? Thanks. Uh, just let me use your keys to get in the place. I, I shall let you in. I doubt she's there. Oh, I don't know if I should let you in, old boy. After all. I've got a search warrant. Oh, something is out there. Uh, what are you looking for? Proceeds of a bank robbery? <laughs> well, hardly, hardly a robbery. Oh, you won't talk, eh? Well, look, the big one here is for the front door. This one? Oh, well, all the others are for various rooms. Mm -hmm. They're labeled, see? Sure you won't need any help, then? No, no, thanks. I'd like to go back to London with me today? We'll catch the up train at 4.30, shall we? Oh, righty-ho. Righty-ho. 
Well, thanks, old chap. I'll see you later. I walked over to the dismal little walled house. It had a dank look. I glanced over my shoulder. Brainerd was still watching me. I walked through the gate in the wall, and I couldn't see him any longer. Up to the house. The sound of the sea. The smell of the sea. And then another smell. I remembered the time the Sergeant Cook at Naughty Ash Rest Camp in Southampton had let a pork roast catch on fire and we went without dinner. I felt like... Well, never mind. I unlocked the door and opened it. I walked in. There was the fireplace choked with ashes. There was the coal scuttle. He said the tramp cracked his head on fatally. Tin. Crumpled tin. There was the axe. The axe, he said, had been thrown at him. The handle was broken. Exactly the way he said it was. Blood stains, I thought they were on the floor. What's that? White thread. Looks like a long blonde hair. Huh. Let's keep that. What's in the other room? What's that? Leather heel. High heel. Of a woman's dark blue shoe. What's that? Bloodstain. In here, too. And the tramp died when he struck his head on the coal scuttle out there. Mm-hmm. Let's review it all again, I thought to myself. The broken axe handle. Check. The crumpled coal scuttle. Might be. I doubt it. The woman's high heel. Maybe. The woman, the wife that Brainerd saw... The knife, he said he bought it in Eastbourne. Who's that? Brainerd. <laughs> Did I interrupt you, Inspector? Come on, the London train's due in 20 minutes and we've just got time. I don't want to miss the free trip to the city, old man. <laughs> Just caught it, as a matter of fact, because I had to stop at all the ironmonger shops in Eastbourne to inquire about a cook's knife. I deposited Brainerd at the West End Hotel and went home for a night's sleep. Seven o'clock the next morning. I called Alfred Ormerod, the home office pathologist at home. He was annoyed. It's better be important, Sylvester. I've got lather all over my face. Well, take my word for it, Alfred. But take your word for what, man? It's important. Well, well, well go ahead. My face itches. Can you tell the difference between a man's body and a woman's? Are you daft? When they've been destroyed by fire? I repeat my question. Have you taken leave of your senses, Sylvester? What's the answer? No. Now, look, my face feels... Will my... you come to the office at the yard at once, please? I'll be there at half past nine. Not a second earlier. But look... I suggest that you go shave yourself, Inspector. I'll see you at 9.30. Good morning. Well, that's that. Oh... Inspector Sylvester, him. Oh, uh, Jim. Herbert Jim here, Sylvester. I've been trying to get you, but your telephone's been busy. Where are you at? Well, look here, about, about this chap Dignam. What about him? Oh, you, you remember I mentioned that girl, that Irene Manning, to you yesterday? The girl he was chasing after? Yes. Yeah. Well, look here, she's disappeared. How do you know? Well, her sister. Her sister, Julie Manning, she's at Mrs. Dignam's home right now, screaming for Dignam's blood. Oh? She says her sister's been missing since Saturday afternoon, and she's certain she's gone away with Dignam. Dignam's in Cannon Row Police Station. Oh, but where's Irene Manning? 
Is this sister with Mrs. Dingham now? Yes. Can you bring her to my office at Scotland Yard at once? Well, I'll try. I'll be there in less than half an hour. Goodbye. Uh, but... Now, where are my trousers? Oh. Yes? Inspector Sylvester here. Cannon Road Police Station here, sir. Sorry to bother you with this hour, sir, but... What's the matter? This prisoner of yours, uh, Dignam. What's wrong with him? Oh, he's been raising all kinds of canes. Uh, says he wants to see you at once. Says it's extremely important. Well, sir. send him over to my office at the yard with a couple of men. I'll see him. Is he dangerous, sir? He is. How soon do you want him, sir? I'll be there in 20 minutes. I hope. Thank you, sir. I'll be glad to get rid of him. Goodbye. Now, if that thing rings just once more... But he didn't. I got to my office at New Scotland Yard, still adjusting my braces. I glanced at the clock. It was five minutes before eight. In the waiting room, Herbert Chin sat beside a tall, blonde girl. I'll see you in a moment, I muttered, and went on into my office. There was Robert Emmett Dignam, flanked by two large constables. He jumped up when he saw me. There you are at last. Well? Look here, I didn't murder anyone. So you said, Mr. Dignam. I, I mean, this tramp who attacked me with the axe fell and smashed his own head. That's all that happened. And uh, you disposed of the body, you said? Well, I was uh, confused. I was frightened. I didn't know what I was doing. I'm sorry. Well, you can't keep me in jail for that, you know. I'm afraid I can't do anything for you, Mr. Dignam. That's a matter for the magistrate. I'll get a writ of habeas corpus. Do you have anything to add to your statement of yesterday, Mr. Dignam? I told you everything. I have nothing to add. Well, when you have, I'll be glad to take it down in writing. Until then, I'm sorry. Listen to me, you. Now, listen, I'll I tell take you... the little I'll... man away, Constable. I won't go to jail. You're not going to hang me. You're not going to hang me. Let me. Herbert Chin came in with the tall blonde girl whom he introduced. This is uh, Miss Julie Manning, Inspector. <laughs> Sit down, Miss Manning. My sister's gone. Do you have any idea where she is, Miss Manning? Yes. That man Dignam murdered her. What makes you think that? Well, I, I really lent him money and I know what he did with it. She thought he was speculating with it to make some more money for both of them. And he lost it on the races. How do you know that, Miss Manning? I really was the one that found it out. I know all about it. He promised to desert his wife and marry her. And he told her they'd go to South America when she accused him of spending every penny she'd saved. And... Well, that doesn't argue that he murdered her, Miss Manning. Then where is she? Tell me where she is if he didn't kill her. Now, Julie, please. You keep quiet. I know where she went with him last Saturday. He told her to come to Eastbourne with Eastbourne? Her... Yes. He told her he'd give her the money there at his cottage. And... Well, she told me about it. I told her she was a fool, but... She won't go and <laughs> he's murdered her. I tell you, he's robbed her of every penny she owned. And when she wasn't any more use to him, he took her away and, and murdered her. <laughs> he murdered her. She told him she'd have him arrested and put in prison for the rest of his life for stealing her money and he, he killed her. <laughs> oh... Poor, poor Irene. <laughs> he said he walked to the village and bought a knife after the tramp had died. The ironmonger in Eastbourne said a little man who was with a tall blonde woman had bought the heavy knife when they got off the train in Eastbourne. They laughed together about it, he said. He bought the knife before they went to the cottage. And they laughed together about it. Alfred Ormerod, the pathologist you remember, came in at half past nine. He left on the 10-3 for Eastbourne with his murder kit promising to telephone me. At 10-15, the landlord Brainerd came in. Uh, I'm sorry I'm late, but I've just been to the bank. Bank? That that thief Plunkett. Plunkett? Oh, oh, Dignam. Oh, well, whatever his name is. I just got a check back from the bank stamp R.D. My wife sent it to me from Eastbourne. No funds, the bank says. Uh, I had him hanged. I walked over to Cannon Row with Brainerd. He recognized Dignam at once as Plunkett, and the dapper little man was charged again, this time with obtaining money by false pretenses. He again pleaded with me. Even if the man died, 
Even if I did dispose of the body, Inspector, they can't do anything to me for murder. Even if I killed him, it's manslaughter, isn't it? Justifiable homicide. It, it's self I'm sorry, Dignam. Perhaps Robert Emmett Dignam already felt the clammy touch of the hangman's hands on his neck. At four o'clock that afternoon, Alfred Ormerod telephoned me from Eastbourne. Hello, Sylvester. I've been working all day here at the cottage. I've never seen such a diabolical thing. All those ashes in the fireplace are human ashes. Yes, I can prove it. Although the ashes of the bones have apparently been crushed to powder. It's almost perfect destruction of a body. Yes, I found the heel of a woman's slipper. That can be identified, I'm sure. I also found several other things. Traces of ashes have been carried out of the house. Two small pins. Hair clips, I think you call them, near the door. He was going to throw the ashes into the sea. Yes, I found it, too. It was snagged under a rock at the water's edge. Yes. Two or three blonde hairs still adhere to it. I'm sure you can identify it by the teeth. A young woman, yes. And the marks on the back of them. On the back, just above the point where the neck joins it. Yes. It was crushed. No, it couldn't have been caused by a fall against the uh, coal scuttle. The scuttle's too flimsy. Besides... The wounds don't fit any part of the coal scuttle. They do fit the blade of the axe, though. Right. I'm afraid you're hanged. He did hang. When it was demonstrated in court that he had bought the knife before he enticed the girl to the cottage, they laughed over it together, the ironmonger said. When they fitted the axe into the wounds on what Alfred Ormerod proved was a young, blonde-haired girl's skull, when the whole sorry tale was told about his relations with Irene Manning and his fleecing of her money, then the jury said, Guilty. And dapper little Robert Emmett Dignam was hanged. You have just heard another in the series Whitehall 1212 compiled from the official files of Scotland Yard. The research is from Percy Hoskins of the London Daily Express. The stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. NBC.